Chapter Thirty One of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter Thirty One. On our arrival in Denmark, we found the king and queen of that country elevated in two armchairs on a kitchen table, holding a court. The whole of the Danish nobility were in attendance, consisting of a noble boy in the wash-leather boots of a gigantic ancestor, a venerable peer with a dirty face, who seemed to have risen from the people late in life, and the Danish chivalry with a comb in its hair and a pair of white silk legs and presenting on the whole a feminine appearance. My gifted townsman stood gloomily apart, with folded arms, and I could have wished that his curls and forehead had been more probable. Several curious little circumstances transpired as the action proceeded. The late king of the country not only appeared to have been troubled with a cough at the time of his decease, but to have taken it with him to the tomb, and to have brought it back. The royal phantom also carried a ghostly manuscript round its truncheon, to which it had the appearance of occasionally referring, and that, too, with an air of anxiety and a tendency to lose the place of reference which were suggestive of a state of mortality. It was this, I conceive, which led to the shades being advised by the gallery to turn over, a recommendation which it took extremely ill. It was likewise to be noted of this majestic spirit, that whereas it always appeared with an air of having been out a long time and walked an immense distance, it perceptibly came from a closely contiguous wall. This occasioned its terrors to be received derisively. The Queen of Denmark, a very buxom lady, though no doubt historically brazen, was considered by the public to have too much brass about her her chin being attached to her diadem by a broad band of that metal, as if she had a gorgeous toothache, her waist being encircled by another, and each of her arms by another, so that she was openly mentioned as the kettle-drum. The noble boy in the ancestral boots was inconsistent, representing himself, as it were in one breath, as an able seaman, a strolling actor, a grave-digger, a clergyman, and a person of the utmost importance at a court fencing-match, on the authority of whose practice eye and nice discrimination the finest strokes were judged. This gradually led to a want of toleration for him, and even, on his being detected in holy orders and declining to perform the funeral service, to the general indignation taking the form of nuts. Lastly, Ophelia was a prey to such slow musical madness that when, in course of time, she had taken off her white muslin scarf, folded it up, and buried it, a sulky man who had been long cooling his impatient nose against an iron bar in the front row of the gallery, growled, "'Now the baby's put to bed, let's have supper!' Which, to say the least of it, was out of keeping. Upon my unfortunate townsman all these incidents accumulated with playful effect. Whenever that undecided prince had to ask a question or state a doubt, the public helped him out with it. As, for example, on the question whether it was nobler in the mind to suffer, some roared yes, and some no, and some inclining to both opinions said, toss up for it, and quite a debating society arose. When he asked what should such fellows as he do, crawling between earth and heaven, he was encouraged with loud cries of, Hear, hear! When he appeared with his stocking disordered, its disorder expressed, according to usage, by one very neat fold in the top, which I suppose to be always got up with a flat iron, a conversation took place in the gallery respecting the paleness of his leg, and whether it was occasioned by the turn the ghost had given him. On his taking the recorders, very like a little black flute that had just been played in the orchestra and handed out at the door, he was called upon unanimously for Rule Britannia. When he recommended the player not to saw the air thus, the sulky man said, "'And don't you do it neither. You're a deal worse than him.' 
and I grieve to add that peals of laughter greeted Mr. Wopsle on every one of these occasions. But his greatest trials were in the churchyard, which had the appearance of a primeval forest, with a kind of small ecclesiastical wash-house on one side, and a turnpike gate on the other. Mr. Wopsle, in a comprehensive black cloak, being descried entering at the turnpike, the gravedigger was admonished in a friendly way, "'Look out! Here's the undertaker a-coming to see how you're a-getting on with your work.' I believe it is well known in a constitutional country that Mr. Wopsle could not possibly have returned the skull, after moralizing over it, without dusting his fingers on a white napkin taken from his breast. But even that innocent and indispensable action did not pass without the comment, "'Waiter!' The arrival at the body for interment, in an empty black box with a lid tumbling open, was the signal for a general joy which was much enhanced by the discovery, among the bearers, of an individual obnoxious to identification. The joy attended Mr. Wopsle through his struggles with Laertes on the brink of the orchestra and the grave, and slackened no more until he had tumbled the king off the kitchen table, and had died by inches from the ankles upward. We had made some pale efforts in the beginning to applaud Mr. Wopsle, but they were too hopeless to be persisted in. Therefore we had sat feeling keenly for him, but laughing nevertheless from ear to ear. I laughed in spite of myself all the time. The whole thing was so droll, and yet I had a latent impression that there was something decidedly fine in Mr. Wopsle's elocution, not for old association's sake, I am afraid, but because it was very slow, very dreary, very uphill and downhill, and very unlike any way in which any man, in any natural circumstances of life or death, ever expressed himself about anything. When the tragedy was over, and he had been called for and hooted, I said to Herbert, "'Let us go at once, or perhaps we shall meet him.' <laughs> we made all the haste we could downstairs, but we were not quick enough either. Standing at the door was a Jewish man with an unnatural heavy smear of eyebrow, who caught my eyes as we advanced, and said, when we came up with him, "'Mr. Pip and friend?' Identity of Mr. Pip and friend confessed. "'Mr. Waldengarver,' said the man, "'would be glad to have the honour. "'Waldengarver?' I repeated, when Herbert murmured in my ear, "'probably Wopsle.' "'Oh!' said I. "'Yes. Shall we follow you?' A few steps, please. When we were in a side alley, he turned and asked, How did you think he looked? I dressed him. I don't know what he had looked like, except a funeral, with the addition of a large Danish sun or star hanging round his neck by a blue ribbon that had given him the appearance of being insured in some extraordinary fire office. But I said he had looked very nice. When he come to the grave said our conductor. He showed his cloak beautiful, but judging from the wing, it looked to me that when he see the ghost in the Queen's apartment he might have made more of his stockings. I modestly assented, and we all fell through a little dirty swing door into a sort of hot packing case immediately behind it. Here Mr. Wopsle was divesting himself of his Danish garments, and here there was just room for us to look at him over one another's shoulders by keeping the packing-case door, or lid, wide open. "'Gentlemen,' said Mr. Wopsle, "'I am proud to see you. I hope, Mr. Pip, you will excuse my sending round. I had the happiness to know you in former times, and the drama has ever had a claim which has ever been acknowledged on the noble and the affluent.' Meanwhile, Mr. Waldengarver, in a frightful perspiration, was trying to get himself out of his princely sables. "'Skin the stockings off, Mr. Waldengarver,' said the owner of that property, "'or you'll bust em. Bust em, and you'll bust five and thirty shillings. Shakespeare never was complimented with a finer pair. Keep quiet on your chair now, and leave em to me.' With that he went upon his knees and began to flay his victim, who, on the first stocking coming off, 
would certainly have fallen over backward with his chair, but for there being no room to fall anyhow. I had been afraid until then to say a word about the play, but then Mr. Waldengarver looked up at us complacently and said, "'Gentlemen, how did it seem to you to go in front?' Herbert said from behind, at the same time poking me, "'Capitally!' So I said, "'Capitally!' "'How did you like my reading of the character, gentlemen?' said Mr. Waldengarver, almost, if not quite, with patronage. Herbert said from behind, again poking me, "'Massive and concrete!' So I said boldly, as if I had originated it, and must beg to insist upon it, "'Massive and concrete!' "'I am glad to have your approbation, gentlemen,' said Mr. Waldengarver, with an air of dignity, in spite of his being ground against the wall at the time, and holding on by the seat of the chair. "'But I'll tell you one thing, Mr. Waldengarver,' said the man who was on his knees, "'in which you're out in your reading. Now mind, I don't care who says contrary, I tell you so. You're out in your reading of Hamlet when you get your legs in profile. The last Hamlet, as I dressed, made the same mistakes in his reading at rehearsal, till I got him to put a large red wafer on each of his shins, and then at that rehearsal, which was the last, I went in front, sir, to the back of the pit, and whenever his reading brought him into profile, I called out, I don't see no wafers, and at night his reading was lovely. Mr. Waldengarber smiled at me, as much as to say, a faithful dependent, I overlook his folly, and then said aloud, My view is a little classic and thoughtful for them here, but they will improve, they will improve. Herbert and I said together, Oh, no doubt they would improve. Did you observe, gentlemen, said Mr. Waldengarver, that there was a man in the gallery who endeavoured to cast derision on the service? I mean the representation? We basely replied that we rather thought we had noticed such a man. I added, He was drunk, no doubt. Oh, dear no, sir, said Mr. Wopsle. Not drunk. His employer would see to that, sir. His employer would not allow him to be drunk. You know his employer? said I. Mr. Wopsle shut his eyes and opened them again, performing both ceremonies very slowly. "'You must have observed, gentlemen,' said he, "'an ignorant and a blatant ass, with a rasping throat and a countenance expressive of low malignity, who went through, I will not say sustained, the role, if I may use a French expression, of Claudius, King of Denmark. That is his employer, gentlemen. Such is the profession.' Without distinctly knowing whether I should have been more sorry for Mr. Wopsle if he had been in despair, I was so sorry for him as it was, that I took the opportunity of his turning round to have his braces put on, which jostled us out at the doorway, to ask Herbert what he thought of having him home to supper. Herbert said he thought it would be kind to do so, therefore I invited him, and he went to Barnard's with us, wrapped up to the eyes, and we did our best for him and he sat until two o'clock in the morning, reviewing his success and developing his plans. I forget in detail what they were, but I have a general recollection that he was to begin with reviving the drama, and to end with crushing it, inasmuch as his decease would leave it utterly bereft and without a chance or hope. Miserably I went to bed after all, and miserably thought of Estella, and miserably dreamed that my expectations were all cancelled, and that I had to give my hand in marriage to Herbert's Clara, or play Hamlet to Miss Havisham's ghost, before twenty thousand people, without knowing twenty words of it. End of chapter Chapter 32 of Great Expectations this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith, of Simpsonville, South Carolina. 
Great Expectations by Charles Dickens Chapter 32 One day when I was busy with my books and Mr. Pocket, I received a note by the post, the mere outside of which threw me into a great flutter, for, though I had never seen the handwriting in which it was addressed, I divined whose hand it was. It had no set beginning, as Dear Mr. Pip, or Dear Pip, or Dear Sir, or Dear Anything, but ran thus. I am to come to London the day after to-morrow by the midday coach. I believe it was settled you should meet me. At all events Miss Havisham has that impression, and I write in obedience to it. She sends you her regard. Yours, Estella. If there had been time, I should probably have ordered several suits of clothes for this occasion, but as there was not, I was fain to be content with those I had. My appetite vanished instantly, and I knew no peace or rest until the day arrived. Not that its arrival brought me either, for then I was worse than ever, and began haunting the coach office in Wood Street, Cheapside, before the coach had left the Blue Boar in our town. For all that I knew this perfectly well, I still felt as if it were not safe to let the coach office be out of my sight longer than five minutes at a time, and in this condition of unreason I had performed the first half-hour of a watch of four or five hours, when Wemmick ran against me. "'Hello, Mr. Pip,' said he. "'How do you do? I should hardly have thought this was your beat.' I explained that I was waiting to meet somebody who was coming up by coach, and I inquired after the castle and the aged. "'Both flourishing, thank ye,' said Wemmick and particularly the aged. He's in wonderful feather. He'll be eighty-two next birthday. I have a notion of firing eighty-two times, if the neighbourhood shouldn't complain, and that Canada mine should prove equal to the pressure. However, this is not London talk. Where do you think I am going to? To the office, said I, for he was tending in that direction. Next thing to it, returned Wemmick, I am going to Newgate. We are in a banker's parcel case just at present, and I have been down the road taking a squint at the scene of action, and therefore must have a word or two with our client. "'Did your client commit the robbery?' I asked. "'Bless your soul and body, no!' answered Wemmick very dryly. "'But he is accused of it. So might you or I be. Either of us might be accused of it, you know.' "'Only neither of us is,' I remarked. "'Yah!' said Wemmick, touching me on the breast with his forefinger. "'You're a deep one, Mr. Pip. <laughs> Would you like to have a look at Newgate?' "'Have you time to spare?' I had so much time to spare that the proposal came as a relief, notwithstanding its irreconcilability with my latent desire to keep my eye on the coach-office. Muttering that I would make the inquiry whether I had time to walk with him, I went into the office, and ascertained from the clerk with the nicest precision, and much to the trying of his temper, the earliest moment at which the coach could be expected, which I knew beforehand quite as well as he. I then rejoined Mr. Wemmick, and affecting to consult my watch, and to be surprised by the information I had received, accepted his offer. We were at Newgate in a few minutes, and we passed through the lodge where some fetters were hanging up on the bare walls among the prison rules, into the interior of the jail. At that time jails were much neglected, and the period of exaggerated reaction consequent on all public wrongdoing, and which is always its heaviest and longest punishment, was still far off. So felons were not lodged and fed better than soldiers, to say nothing of paupers, and seldom set fire to their prisons with the excusable object of improving the flavour of their soup. It was visiting time when Wemmick took me in, and a potman was going his rounds with beer, and the prisoners, behind bars in yards, were buying beer, and talking to friends, and a frowsy, ugly, disorderly, depressing scene it was. It struck me that Wemmick walked among the prisoners much as a gardener might walk among his plants. This was first put into my head by his seeing a shoot that had come up in the night, and saying, "'What, Captain Tom? Are you there? Ah, indeed!' And also, 
"'Is that black bill behind the cistern? "'Why I didn't look for you these two months, "'how do you find yourself?' Equally in his stopping at the bars and attending to anxious whisperers, always singly, Wemmick, with his post-office in an immovable state, looked at them while in conference, as if he were taking particular notice of the advance they had made, since last observed, towards coming out in full blow at their trial. He was highly popular, and I found that he took the familiar department of Mr. Jaggers's business, though something of the state of Mr. Jaggers hung about him too forbidding approach beyond certain limits. His personal recognition of each successive client was comprised in a nod, and in his settling his hat a little easier on his head with both hands, and then tightening the post-office, and putting his hands in his pockets. In one or two instances there was a difficulty respecting the raising of fees, and then Mr. Wemmick, backing as far as possible from the insufficient money produced, said, "'It's no use, my boy.' I'm only a subordinate. I can't take it. Don't go on in that way with a subordinate. If you are unable to make up your quantum, my boy, you had better address yourself to a principal. There are plenty of principals in the profession, you know, and what is not worth the while of one may be worth the while of another. That's my recommendation to you, speaking as a subordinate. Don't try on useless measures. Why should you? Now, who's next? Thus we walked through Wemmick's greenhouse, until he turned to me and said, "'Notice the man I shall shake hands with.' I should have done so without the preparation, as he had shaken hands with no one yet. Almost as soon as he had spoken, a portly upright man, whom I can see now as I write, in a well-worn, olive-coloured frock-coat, with a peculiar pallor overspreading the red in his complexion, and eyes that went wandering about when he tried to fix them came up to a corner of the bars, and put his hand to his hat, which had a greasy and fatty surface like cold broth, with a half-serious and half-jocose military salute. "'Colonel, to you,' said Wemmick. "'How are you, Colonel?' "'All right, Mr. Wemmick.' "'Everything was done that could be done, but the evidence was too strong for us, Colonel.' "'Yes, it was too strong, sir.' "'But I don't care.' "'No, no,' said Wemmick, coolly. "'You don't care.' Then turning to me, "'Served his majesty, this man. Was a soldier in the line, and bought his discharge.' I said, "'Indeed?' And the man's eyes looked at me, and then looked over my head, and then looked all around me, and then he drew his hand across his lips and laughed. "'I think I shall be out of this on Monday, sir.' he said to Wemmick. "'Perhaps,' returned my friend. "'But there's no knowing. "'I am glad to have the chance of bidding you good-bye, Mr. Wemmick,' said the man, stretching out his hand between two bars. "'Thank ye,' said Wemmick, shaking hands with him. "'Same to you, Colonel.' "'If what I had upon me when taken had been real, Mr. Wemmick,' said the man, unwilling to let his hand go, I should have asked the favour of your wearing another ring, in acknowledgment of your attentions. "'I'll accept the will for the deed,' said Wemmick. "'By the by, you are quite a pigeon-fancier.' The man looked up at the sky. "'I am told you had a remarkable breed of tumblers. Could you commission any friend of yours to bring me a pair, of you've no further use for em? "'It shall be done, sir.' "'All right.' said Wemmick. They shall be taken care of. Good afternoon, Colonel. Good-bye. They shook hands again, and as we walked away, Wemmick said to me, A coiner, a very good workman. The recorder's report is made to-day, and he is sure to be executed on Monday. Still, you see, as far as it goes, a pair of pigeons are portable property, all the same. With that he looked back and nodded at this dead plant, and then cast his eyes about him in walking out of the yard, as if he were considering what other pot would go best in its place. As we came out of the prison through the lodge, I found that the great importance of my guardian was appreciated by the turnkeys, no less than by those whom they held in charge. "'Well, Mr. Wemmick,' said the turnkey, who kept us between the two studded and spiked lodge gates, 
and who carefully locked one before he unlocked the other. "'What's Mr. Jaggers going to do with that waterside murder? Is he going to make it manslaughter, or what's he going to make of it?' "'Why don't you ask him?' returned Wemmick. "'Oh, yes, I dare say,' said the turnkey. "'Now that's the way with them up here, Mr. Pip,' remarked Wemmick, turning to me with his post-office elongated. "'They don't mind what they ask of me, the subordinate, but you'll never catch em asking any questions of my principal.' "'Is this young gentleman one of the prentices or articled ones of your office?' asked the turnkey, with a grin at Mr. Wemmick's humour. "'There he goes again, you see,' said Wemmick. "'I told you so. Ask another question of the subordinate before his first is dry. Well, supposing Mr. Pip is one of them?' "'Why, then,' said the turnkey, grinning again, "'he knows what Mr. Jaggers is.' "'Yah!' cried Wemmick, suddenly hitting out at the turnkey in a facetious way. "'You're dumb as one of your own keys when you have to do with my principal. You know you are. Let us out, you old fox, or I'll get him to bring an action against you for false imprisonment.' The turnkey laughed and gave us good day, and stood laughing at us over the spikes of the wicket when we descended the steps into the street. "'Mind you, Mr. Pip,' said Wemmick, gravely in my ear, as he took my arm to be more confidential. I don't know that Mr. Jaggers does a better thing than the way in which he keeps himself so high. He's always so high. His constant height is of a piece with his immense abilities. That colonel durst no more take leave of him than that turnkey durst ask him his intentions respecting a case. Then, between his height and them, he slips in his subordinate, don't you see? And so he has them, soul and body." I was very much impressed, and not for the first time, by my guardian's subtlety. To confess the truth, I very heartily wished, and not for the first time, that I had had some other guardian of mitre abilities. Mr. Wemmick and I parted at the office in Little Britain, where suppliants for Mr. Jagger's notice were lingering about as usual, and I returned to my watch in the street of the coach office, with some three hours on hand. I consumed the whole time in thinking how strange it was that I should be encompassed by all this taint of prison and crime, that, in my childhood out on our lonely marshes on a winter evening, I should have first encountered it, that it should have reappeared on two occasions, starting out like a stain that was faded but not gone, that it should in this new way pervade my fortune and advancement. While my mind was thus engaged, I thought of the beautiful young Estella, proud and refined, coming towards me, and I thought with absolute abhorrence of the contrast between the jail and her. I wished that Wemmick had not met me, or that I had not yielded to him and gone with him, so that, of all days in the year on this day, I might not have had Newgate in my breath and on my clothes." I beat the prison dust off my feet as I sauntered to and fro, and I shook it out of my dress, and I exhaled its air from my lungs. So contaminated did I feel, remembering who was coming, that the coach came quickly after all, and I was not yet free from the soiling consciousness of Mr. Wemmick's conservatory, when I saw her face at the coach window and her hand waving to me. What was the nameless shadow which again in that one instant had passed? End of chapter Chapter 33 of Great Expectations This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens Chapter 33 In her furred travelling dress, Estella seemed more delicately beautiful than she had ever seemed yet, even in my eyes. Her manner was more winning than she had cared to let it be to me before, and I thought I saw Miss Havisham's influence in the change. 
we stood in the inn-yard while she pointed out her luggage to me, and when it was all collected I remembered, having forgotten everything but herself in the meanwhile, that I knew nothing of her destination. "'I am going to Richmond,' she told me. "'Our lesson is that there are two Richmonds, one in Surrey and one in Yorkshire, and that mine is the Surrey Richmond. The distance is ten miles. I am to have a carriage, and you are to take me. This is my purse, and you are to pay my charges out of it. Oh, you must take the purse. We have no choice, you and I, but to obey our instructions. We are not free to follow our own devices, you and I. As she looked at me and giving me the purse, I hoped there was an inner meaning in her words. She said them slightingly, but not with displeasure. "'A carriage will have to be sent for, Estella. Will you rest here a little?' "'Yes. I am to rest here a little, and I am to drink some tea, and you are to take care of me the while.' She drew her arm through mine, as if it must be done, and I requested a waiter who had been staring at the coach like a man who had never seen such a thing in his life, to show us a private sitting-room. Upon that he pulled out a napkin, as if it were a magic clue without which he couldn't find the way upstairs, and led us to the black hole of the establishment, fitted up with a diminishing mirror, quite a superfluous article considering the hole's proportions, an anchovy sauce cruet, and somebody's patents. On my objecting to this retreat, he took us into another room with a dinner-table for thirty, and in the grate a scorched leaf of a copy-book under a bushel of coal-dust. Having looked at this extinct conflagration and shaken his head, he took my order, which, proving to be merely, "'Some tea for the lady,' sent him out of the room in a very low state of mind. I was, and I am, sensible that the air of this chamber— in its strong combination of stable with soup-stock, might have led one to infer that the coaching department was not doing well, and that the enterprising proprietor was boiling down the horses for the refreshment department. Yet the room was all in all to me, Estella being in it. I thought that with her I could have been happy there for life. I was not at all happy there at the time, observe, and I knew it well. "'Where are you going to, at Richmond?' I asked Estella. "'I am going to live,' said she, "'at a great expense, with a lady there, who has the power, or says she has, "'of taking me about, and introducing me, and showing people to me, and showing me to people. "'I suppose you will be glad of variety and admiration?' "'Yes, I suppose so.' She answered so carelessly that I said, "'You speak of yourself as if you were someone else.' "'Where did you learn how I speak of others? "'Come, come,' said Estella, smiling delightfully. "'You must not expect me to go to school with you. "'I must talk in my own way. "'How do you thrive with Mr. Pocket?' "'I live quite pleasantly there, at least.' "'It appeared to me that I was losing a chance.' "'At least,' repeated Estella. "'As pleasantly as I could anywhere, away from you.' "'You silly boy,' said Estella, quite composedly. "'How can you talk such nonsense? "'Your friend Mr. Matthew, I believe, is superior to the rest of his family.' "'Very superior indeed. He is nobody's enemy.' "'Don't add but his own.' interposed Estella, for I hate that class of man, but he really is disinterested and above small jealousy and spite, I have heard. I am sure I have every reason to say so. You have not every reason to say so of the rest of his people, said Estella, nodding at me with an expression of face that was at once grave and rallying, for they beset Miss Havisham with reports and insinuations to your disadvantage. They watch you, misrepresent you, write letters about you, anonymous sometimes, and you are the torment and the occupation of their lives. You can scarcely realize to yourself the hatred those people feel for you. 
They do me no harm, I hope. Instead of answering, Estella burst out laughing. This was very singular to me, and I looked at her in considerable perplexity. When she left off, and she had not laughed languidly, but with real enjoyment, I said, in my diffident way with her, I hope I may suppose that you would not be amused if they did me any harm. No, you may be sure of that, said Estella. You may be certain that I laugh because they fail. Oh, those people with Miss Havisham, and the tortures they undergo! She laughed again, and even now, when she had told me why, her laughter was very singular to me, for I could not doubt its being genuine, and yet it seemed too much for the occasion. I thought there must really be something more here than I knew. She saw the thought in my mind, and answered it. "'It is not easy for even you,' said Estella, "'to know what satisfaction it gives me to see these people thwarted, or what an enjoyable sense of the ridiculous I have when they are made ridiculous. For you were not brought up in that strange house from a mere baby. I was. You have not your little wits sharpened by their intriguing against you, suppressed and defenceless, under the mask of sympathy and pity and what not that is soft and soothing. I had. You did not gradually open your round childish eyes wider and wider to the discovery of that impostor of a woman who calculates her stores of peace of mind for when she wakes up in the night. I did. It was no laughing matter with Estella now, nor was she summoning these remembrances from any shallow place. I would not have been the cause of that look of hers for all my expectations in a heap. Two things I can tell you, said Estella. First, notwithstanding the proverb that constant dropping will wear away a stone, you may set your mind at rest that these people never will, never would, in a hundred years, impair your ground with Miss Havisham, in any particular, great or small. Second, I am beholden to you as the cause of their being so busy and so mean in vain, and there is my hand upon it. As she gave it to me playfully, for her darker mood had been but momentary, I held it and put it to my lips. "'You ridiculous boy!' said Estella. "'Will you never take warning? Or do you kiss my hand in the same spirit in which I once let you kiss my cheek?' "'What spirit was that?' said I. "'I must think a moment. A spirit of contempt for the fawners and plotters.' If I say yes, may I kiss the cheek again? You should have asked before you touched the hand. But yes, if you like. I leaned down, and her calm face was like a statue's. Now, said Estella, gliding away the instant I touched her cheek, you are to take care that I have some tea, and you are to take me to Richmond. Her reverting to this tone, as if our association were forced upon us, and we were mere puppets, gave me pain. But everything in our intercourse did give me pain. Whatever her tone with me happened to be, I could put no trust in it, and build no hope on it, and yet I went on against trust and against hope. Why repeat it a thousand times? So it always was. I rang for the tea and the waiter, reappearing with his magic clue, brought in by degrees some fifty adjuncts to that refreshment, but of tea not a glimpse. A tea-board, cups and saucers, plates, knives and forks, including carvers, spoons, various, salt cellars, a meek little muffin confined with the utmost precaution under a strong iron cover, Moses in the bulrushes typified by a soft bit of butter in a quantity of parsley, a pale loaf with a powdered head, two proof impressions of the bars of the kitchen fireplace on triangular bits of bread, and ultimately a fat family urn, which the waiter staggered in with, expressing in his countenance burden and suffering. After a prolonged absence at this stage of the entertainment, he at length came back with a casket of precious appearance containing twigs. These I steeped in hot water, 
and so from the whole of these appliances extracted one cup of I don't know what for Estella. The bill paid, and the waiter remembered, and the ostler not forgotten, and the chambermaid taken into consideration. In a word, the whole house bribed into a state of contempt and animosity, and Estella's purse much lightened. We got into our post-coach and drove away. Turning into Cheapside and rattling up Newgate Street, we were soon under the walls of which I was so ashamed. "'What place is that?' Estella asked me. I made a foolish pretense of not at first recognizing it, and then told her. As she looked at it and drew in her head again, murmuring, "'Wretches! I would not have confessed to my visit for any consideration.' "'Mr. Jaggers,' said I, by way of putting it neatly on somebody else, has the reputation of being more in the secrets of that dismal place than any man in London. "'He is more in the secrets of every place, I think,' said Estella, in a low voice. "'You have been accustomed to see him often, I suppose?' "'I have been accustomed to see him at uncertain intervals ever since I can remember. But I know him no better now than I did before I could speak plainly.' What is your own experience of him? Do you advance with him? Once habituated to his distrustful manner, said I, I have done very well. Are you intimate? I have dined with him at his private house. I fancy, said Estella, shrinking, that must be a curious place. It is a curious place. I should have been chary of discussing my guardian too freely even with her, but I should have gone on with the subject so far as to describe the dinner in Gerard Street, if we had not then come into a sudden glare of gas. It seemed, while it lasted, to be all alight and alive with that inexplicable feeling I had had before. And when we were out of it, I was as much dazed for a few moments as if I had been enlightening. So we fell into other talk, and it was principally about the way by which we were travelling, and about what parts of London lay on this side of it, and what on that. The great city was almost new to her, she told me, for she had never left Miss Havisham's neighbourhood until she had gone to France, and she had merely passed through London then in going and returning. I asked her if my guardian had any charge of her while she remained here. To that she emphatically said, God forbid, and no more. It was impossible for me to avoid seeing that she cared to attract me, that she made herself winning, and would have won me even if the task had needed pains. Yet this made me none the happier, for even if she had not taken that tone of our being disposed of by others, I should have felt that she held my heart in her hand because she willfully chose to do it, and not because it would have wrung any tenderness in her to crush it and throw it away. When we passed through Hammersmith, I showed her where Mr. Matthew Pocket lived, and said it was no great way from Richmond, and that I hoped I should see her sometimes. "'Oh, yes! You are to see me. You are to come when you think proper. You are to be mentioned to the family. Indeed, you are already mentioned.' I inquired, was it a large household she was going to be a member of? "'No. There are only two, mother and daughter. The mother is a lady of some station, though not averse to increasing her income. I wonder Miss Havisham could part with you again so soon. It is a part of Miss Havisham's plans for me, Pip, said Estella, with a sigh, as if she were tired. I am to write to her constantly, and see her regularly, and report how I go on, I and the jewels, for they are nearly all mine now. It was the first time she had ever called me by my name. Of course she did so purposely, and I knew that I should treasure it up. We came to Richmond all too soon, and our destination there was a house by the green, a staid old house, where hoops and powder and patches, embroidered coats, rolled stockings, ruffles and swords, had had their court days many a time. 
Some ancient trees before the house were still cut into fashions as formal and unnatural as the hoops and wigs and stiff skirts, but their own allotted places in the great procession of the dead were not far off, and they would soon drop into them and go the silent way of the rest. A bell with an old voice, which I dare say in its time had often said to the house, Here is the green farthingale, here is the diamond-hilted sword, here are the shoes with red heels and the blue solitaire, sounded gravely in the moonlight, and two cherry-coloured maids came fluttering out to receive Estella. The doorway soon absorbed her boxes, and she gave me her hand and a smile, and said good-night, and was absorbed likewise. And still I stood looking at the house, thinking how happy I should be if I lived there with her, and knowing that I never was happy with her, but always miserable. I got into the carriage to be taken back to Hammersmith, and I got in with a bad heartache, and I got out with a worse heartache. At her own door I found little Jane Pocket coming home from a little party escorted by her little lover, and I envied her little lover, in spite of his being subject to Flopson. Mr. Pocket was out lecturing for he was a most delightful lecturer on domestic economy, and his treatises on the management of children and servants were considered the very best textbooks on those themes. But Mrs. Pocket was at home, and was in a little difficulty, on account of the baby's having been accommodated with a needle-case, to keep him quiet during the unaccountable absence, with a relative in the foot-guards, of Miller's and more needles were missing than it could be regarded as quite wholesome for a patient of such tender years either to apply externally or to take as a tonic. Mr. Pocket being justly celebrated for giving most excellent practical advice, and for having a clear and sound perception of things, and a highly judicious mind, I had some notion in my heartache of begging him to accept my confidence but happening to look up at Mrs. Pocket as she sat reading her book of dignities, after prescribing bed as a sovereign remedy for baby, I thought, well, no, I wouldn't. End of chapter Chapter 34 of Great Expectations This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens Chapter 34 As I had grown accustomed to my expectations, I had insensibly begun to notice their effect upon myself and those around me. Their influence on my own character I disguised from my recognition as much as possible, but I knew very well that it was not all good. I lived in a state of chronic uneasiness respecting my behaviour to Joe. My conscience was not by any means comfortable about Biddy. When I woke up in the night, like Camilla, I used to think, with a weariness on my spirits, that I should have been happier and better if I had never seen Miss Havisham's face and had risen to manhood content to be partners with Joe in the honest old forge. Many a time of an evening, when I sat alone looking at the fire, I thought, after all, there was no fire like the forge fire and the kitchen fire at home. Yet Estella was so inseparable from all my restlessness and disquiet of mind that I really fell into confusion as to the limits of my own part in its production. That is to say, Supposing I had had no expectations, and yet had had Estella to think of, I could not make out to my satisfaction that I should have done much better. Now, concerning the influence of my position on others, I was in no such difficulty, and so I perceived, though dimly enough perhaps, that it was not beneficial to anybody, and above all that it was not beneficial to Herbert. My lavish habits led his easy nature into expenses that he could not afford, corrupted the simplicity of his life, and disturbed his peace with anxieties and regrets. I was not at all remorseful for having unwittingly set those other branches of the Pocket family to the poor arts they practised, 
because such littlenesses were their natural bent, and would have been evoked by anybody else, if I had left them slumbering. But Herbert's was a very different case, and it often caused me a twinge to think that I had done him evil service in crowding his sparsely furnished chambers with incongruous upholstery work, and placing the canary-breasted avenger at his disposal. So now, as an infallible way of making little ease great ease, I began to contract a quantity of debt. I could hardly begin, but Herbert must begin too, so he soon followed. At Startop's suggestion we put ourselves down for election into a club called the Finches of the Grove, the object of which institution I have never divined, if it were not that the members should dine expensively once a fortnight, to quarrel among themselves as much as possible after dinner, and to cause six waiters to get drunk on the stairs. I know that these gratifying social ends were so invariably accomplished that Herbert and I understood nothing else to be referred to in the first standing toast of the society, which ran, "'Gentlemen, may the present promotion of good feeling ever reign predominant among the finches of the grove.' The finches spent their money foolishly. The hotel we dined at was in Covent Garden, and the first finch I saw when I had the honour of joining the grove was Bentley Drummle, at that time floundering about town in a cab of his own, and doing a great deal of damage to the posts at the street corners. Occasionally he shot himself out of his equipage head foremost over the apron, and I saw him on one occasion deliver himself at the door of the grove in this unintentional way, like coals. But here I anticipate a little, for I was not a finch, and could not be, according to the sacred laws of the society, until I came of age. In my confidence in my own resources, I would willingly have taken Herbert's expenses on myself, but Herbert was proud, and I could make no such proposal to him. So he got into difficulties in every direction, and continued to look about him. When we gradually fell into keeping late hours and late company, I noticed that he looked about him with a desponding eye at breakfast-time, that he began to look about him more hopefully about midday, that he drooped when he came into dinner, that he seemed to descry capital in the distance, rather clearly after dinner, that he all but realized capital towards midnight, and that at about two o'clock in the morning he became so deeply despondent again as to talk of buying a rifle and going to America, with the general purpose of compelling buffaloes to make his fortune. I was usually at Hammersmith about half the week, and when I was at Hammersmith I haunted Richmond, we were of separately by and by. Herbert would often come to Hammersmith when I was there, and I think at those seasons his father would occasionally have some passing perception that the opening he was looking for had not appeared yet. But in the general tumbling up of the family, his tumbling out in life somewhere, was a thing to transact itself somehow. In the meantime Mr. Pocket grew greyer, and tried oftener to lift himself out of his perplexities by the hair. While Mrs. Pocket tripped up the family with her footstool, read her book of dignities, lost her pocket-handkerchief, told us about her grandpapa, and taught the young idea how to shoot, by shooting it into bed whenever it attracted her notice. As I am now generalizing a period of my life, with the object of clearing my way before me, I can scarcely do so better than by at once completing the description of our usual manners and customs at Barnard's Inn. We spent as much money as we could, and got as little for it as people could make up their minds to give us. We were always more or less miserable, and most of our acquaintance were in the same condition. There was a gay fiction among us that we were constantly enjoying ourselves, and a skeleton truth that we never did. To the best of my belief, our case was in the last aspect a rather common one. Every morning, with an air ever new, Herbert went into the city to look about him. I often paid him a visit in the dark back room in which he consorted with an ink-jar, a hat-peg, a coal-box, a string-box, an almanac, a desk and stool, and a ruler. 
and I do not remember that I ever saw him do anything else but look about him. If we all did what we undertake to do, as faithfully as Herbert did, we might live in a republic of the virtues. He had nothing else to do, poor fellow, except at a certain hour of every afternoon to go to Lloyd's, in observance of a ceremony of seeing his principal, I think. He never did anything else in connection with Lloyd's that I could find out, except come back again. When he felt his case unusually serious, and that he positively must find an opening, he would go on change at a busy time, and walk in and out, in a kind of gloomy country dance figure, among the assembled magnates. For, said Herbert to me, coming home to dinner on one of those special occasions, I find the truth to be, Handel, that an opening won't come to one, but one must go to it. So I have been. If we had been less attached to one another, I think we must have hated one another regularly every morning. I detested the chambers beyond expression at that period of repentance, and could not endure the sight of the avenger's livery, which had a more expensive and a less remunerative appearance then than at any other time in the four-and-twenty hours. As we got more and more into debt, breakfast became a hollower and hollower form, and, being on one occasion at breakfast-time threatened, by letter, with legal proceedings, not unholy unconnected, as my local paper might put it, with jewellery, I went so far as to seize the avenger by his blue collar and shake him off his feet, so that he was actually in the air like a booted cupid, for presuming to suppose that we wanted a roll. At certain times, meaning at uncertain times, for they depended on our humour, I would say to Herbert, as if it were a remarkable discovery, "'My dear Herbert, we are getting on badly.' "'My dear Handel,' Herbert would say to me in all sincerity, "'if you will believe me, those very words were on my lips by a strange coincidence.' "'Then, Herbert,' I would respond, "'let us look into our affairs.' We always derive profound satisfaction from making an appointment for this purpose. I always thought this was business. This was the way to confront the thing. This was the way to take the foe by the throat. And I know Herbert thought so, too. We ordered something rather special for dinner, with a bottle of something similarly out of the common way, in order that our minds might be fortified for the occasion, and we might come well up to the mark. Dinner over, we produced a bundle of pens, a copious supply of ink, and a goodly show of writing and blotting paper, for there was something very comfortable in having plenty of stationery. I would then take a sheet of paper, and write across the top of it, in a neat hand, the heading, Memorandum of Pip's Debts, with Barnard's Inns and the date very carefully added. Herbert would also take a sheet of paper, and write across it with similar formalities, Memorandum of Herbert's Debts. Each of us would then refer to a confused heap of papers at his side, which had been thrown into drawers, worn into holes in pockets, half burnt in lighting candles, stuck for weeks into the looking-glass, and otherwise damaged. The sound of our pens going refreshed us exceedingly, insomuch that I sometimes found it difficult to distinguish between this edifying business proceeding and actually paying the money. In point of meritorious character, the two things seemed about equal. When we had written a little while, I would ask Herbert how we got on. Herbert probably would have been scratching his head in a most rueful manner at the sight of his accumulating figures. "'They are mounting up, Handel,' Herbert would say. "'Upon my life they are mounting up.' "'Be firm, Herbert,' I would retort, plying my own pen with great assiduity. Look the thing in the face. Look into your affairs. Stare them out of countenance. So I would handle, only they are staring me out of countenance. However, my determined manner would have its effect, and Herbert would fall to work again. After a time he would give up once more, on the plea that he had not got Cobb's bill, or Lobb's, or Nobb's, as the case might be. Then Herbert estimate. Estimate it in round numbers, and put it down. 
"'What a fellow of resource you are!' my friend would reply with admiration. "'Really, your business powers are very remarkable.' I thought so, too. I established with myself on these occasions the reputation of a first-rate man of business, prompt, decisive, energetic, clear, cool-headed. When I had got all my responsibilities down upon my list, I compared each with the bill and ticked it off. My self-approval when I ticked an entry was quite a luxurious sensation. When I had no more ticks to make, I folded all my bills up uniformly, docketed each on the back, and tied the whole into a symmetrical bundle. Then I did the same for Herbert, who modestly said he had not my administrative genius, and felt that I had brought his affairs into a focus for him. My business habits had one other bright feature, which I called leaving a margin. For example, supposing Herbert's debts to be one hundred and sixty-four pounds, four and tuppence, I would say, leave a margin and put them down at two hundred. Or supposing my own to be four times as much, I would leave a margin and put them down at seven hundred. I had the highest opinion of the wisdom of this same margin, but I am bound to acknowledge that on looking back, I deem it to have been an expensive device for we always ran into new debt immediately, to the full extent of the margin, and sometimes, in the sense of freedom and solvency it imparted, got pretty far on into another margin. But there was a calm, a rest, a virtuous hush, consequent on these examinations of our affairs that gave me, for the time, an admirable opinion of myself. Soothed by my exertions, my method, and Herbert's compliments, I would sit with his symmetrical bundle and my own on the table before me among the stationery, and feel like a bank of some sort, rather than a private individual. We shut our outer door on these solemn occasions, in order that we might not be interrupted. I had fallen into my serene state one evening, when we heard a letter drop through the slit in the said door, and fall on the ground. "'It's for you, Handel,' said Herbert, going out and coming back with it. "'And I hope there's nothing the matter.' This was an allusion to its heavy black seal and border. The letter was signed Trab and Company, and its contents were simply that I was an honoured sir, and that they begged to inform me that Mrs. J. Gargery had departed this life on Monday last, at twenty minutes past six in the evening and that my attendance was requested at the interment on Monday next, at three o'clock in the afternoon. End of Sister, End of Chapter Chapter 35 of Great Expectations This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens, Chapter 35 It was the first time that a grave had opened in my road of life, and the gap it made in the smooth ground was wonderful. The figure of my sister in her chair by the kitchen fire haunted me night and day. That the place could possibly be without her was something my mind seemed unable to compass, and whereas she had seldom or never been in my thoughts of late, I had now the strangest ideas that she was coming towards me in the street, or that she would presently knock at the door. In my rooms, too, with which she had never been at all associated, there was at once the blankness of death, and a perpetual suggestion of the sound of her voice, or the turn of her face or figure, as if she were still alive and I had been often there. Whatever my fortunes might have been, I could scarcely have recalled my sister with much tenderness, but I suppose there is a shock of regret which may exist without much tenderness. Under its influence, and perhaps to make up for the want of the softer feeling, I was seized with a violent indignation against the assailant from whom she had suffered so much, and I felt that on sufficient proof I could have revengefully pursued Orlick or any one else, to the last extremity. Having written to Joe, to offer him consolation, 
and to assure him that I would come to the funeral, I passed the intermediate days in the curious state of mind I have glanced at. I went down early in the morning, and alighted at the Blue Boar in good time to walk over to the forge. It was fine summer weather again, and, as I walked along, the times when I was a little helpless creature, and my sister did not spare me, vividly returned. But they returned with a gentle tone upon them that softened even the edge of Tickler. For now the very breath of the beans and clover whispered to my heart that the day must come when it would be well for my memory that others walking in the sunshine should be softened as they thought of me. At last I came within sight of the house, and saw that Trabb and company had put in a funereal execution and taken possession. Two dismally absurd persons, each ostentatiously exhibiting a crutch done up in a black bandage, as if that instrument could possibly communicate any comfort to anybody, were posted at the front door, and in one of them I recognized a postboy discharged from the boar for turning a young couple into a saw-pit on their bridal morning, in consequence of intoxication rendering it necessary for him to ride his horse clasped round the neck with both arms. All the children of the village, and most of the women, were admiring these sable warders, and the closed windows of the house and forge, and as I came up, one of the two warders, the postboy, knocked at the door, implying that I was far too much exhausted by grief to have strength remaining to knock for myself. Another sable warder, a carpenter, who had once eaten two geese for a wager, opened the door, and showed me into the best parlour. Here Mr. Trabb had taken unto himself the best table, and had got all the leaves up, and was holding a kind of black bazaar, with the aid of a quantity of black pins. At the moment of my arrival he had just finished putting somebody's hat into black long clothes, like an African baby, so he held out his hand for mine. But I, misled by the action, and confused by the occasion, shook hands with him with every testimony of warm affection. Poor dear Joe, entangled in a little black cloak tied in a large bow under his chin, was seated apart at the upper end of the room, where, as chief mourner, he had evidently been stationed by Trab. When I bent down and said to him, "'Dear Joe, how are you?' he said, "'Pip, old chap, you knowed her when she was a fine figure of a—' and clasped my hand and said no more. Biddy, looking very neat and modest in her black dress, went quietly here and there, and was very helpful. When I had spoken to Biddy, as I thought it not a time for talking, I went and sat down near Joe, and there began to wonder in what part of the house it—she, my sister—was. The air of the parlour being faint with the smell of sweet cake, I looked about for the table of refreshment. It was scarcely visible until one had got accustomed to the gloom, but there was a cut-up plum-cake upon it, and there were cut-up oranges, and sandwiches, and biscuits, and two decanters that I knew very well as ornaments, but had never been used in all my life, one full of port and one of sherry. Standing at this table, I became conscious of the servile pumblechook in a black cloak and several yards of hat-band, who was alternately stuffing himself and making obsequious movements to catch my attention. The moment he succeeded he came over to me, breathing sherry and crumbs, and said in a subdued voice, "'May I, dear sir?' and did. I then described Mr. and Mrs. Hubble, the last named in a decent speechless paroxysm in a corner. We were all going to follow, and were all in course of being tied up separately, by Trab, into ridiculous bundles. "'Which I mean to say, Pip,' Joe whispered me, as we were being what Mr. Trab called formed in the parlour, two and two, and it was dreadfully like a preparation for some grim kind of dance. "'Which I mean to say, sir, as I would in preference have carried her to the church myself.' along with three or four friendly ones what come to it with swillin hearts and arms. But it were considered what the neighbours would look down on such, and would be of opinions, as it were, wanting in respect. 
"'Pocket-handkerchiefs out, all!' cried Mr. Trav at this point, in a depressed business-like voice. "'Pocket-handkerchiefs out! We are ready!' So we all put our pocket-handkerchiefs to our faces, as if our noses were bleeding, and filed out two and two. Joe and I, Biddy and Pumblechook, Mr. and Mrs. Hubble. The remains of my poor sister had been brought round by the kitchen door, and, it being a point of undertaking ceremony that the six bearers must be stifled and blinded under a horrible black velvet housing with a white border, the whole looked like a blind monster with twelve human legs, shuffling and blundering along, under the guidance of two keepers, the postboy and his comrade. The neighbourhood, however, highly approved of these arrangements, and we were much admired as we went through the village, the more youthful and vigorous part of the community making dashes now and then to cut us off, and lying in wait to intercept us at points of vantage. At such times the more exuberant among them called out in an excited manner on our emergence round some corner of expectancy, "'Here they come! Here they are!' and we were all but cheered." In this progress I was much annoyed by the abject Pumblechook, who, being behind me, persisted all the way as a delicate attention in arranging my streaming hat-band and smoothing my cloak. My thoughts were further distracted by the excessive pride of Mr. and Mrs. Hubble, who were surpassingly conceited and vainglorious in being members of so distinguished a procession. And now the range of marshes lay clear before us, with the sails of the ships on the river growing out of it, and we went into the churchyard, close to the graves of my unknown parents, Philip Pirrup, late of this parish, and also Georgiana, wife of the above. And there my sister was laid quietly in the earth, while the lark sang high above it, and the light wind strewed it with beautiful shadows of clouds and trees. Of the conduct of the worldly-minded Pumblechook while this was doing, I desire to say no more than it was all addressed to me, and that even when those noble passages were read which remind humanity how it brought nothing into the world, and can take nothing out, and how it fleeth like a shadow, and never continueth long in one stay, I heard him cough a reservation of the case of a young gentleman who came unexpectedly into large property. When we got back, he had the hardihood to tell me that he wished my sister could have known I had done her so much honour, and to hint that she would have considered it reasonably purchased at the price of her death. After that, he drank all the rest of the sherry, and Mr. Hubble drank the port, and the two talked, which I have since observed to be customary in such cases, as if they were of quite another race from the deceased, and were notoriously immortal. Finally, he went away with Mr. and Mrs. Hubble, to make an evening of it, I felt sure, and to tell the jolly bargeman that he was the founder of my fortunes, and my earliest benefactor. When they were all gone, and when Trab and his men, but not his boy, I looked for him, had crammed their mummery into bags, and were gone too, the house felt wholesomer. Soon afterwards, Biddy, Joe, and I, had a cold dinner together, but we dined in the best parlour, not in the old kitchen, and Joe was so exceedingly particular what he did with his knife and fork and the salt cellar and what not, that there was great restraint upon us. But after dinner, when I made him take his pipe, and when I had loitered with him about the forge, and when we sat down together on the great block of stone outside it, we got on better. I noticed that after the funeral Joe changed his clothes so far as to make a compromise between his Sunday dress and working dress, in which the dear fellow looked natural, and like the man he was. He was very much pleased by my asking if I might sleep in my own little room, and I was pleased too, for I felt that I had done rather a great thing in making the request. When the shadows of evening were closing in, I took an opportunity of getting into the garden with Biddy for a little talk. Biddy, said I, I think you might have written to me about these sad matters. Do you, Mr. Pip? said Biddy. I should have written if I had thought that. 
don't suppose that I mean to be unkind, Biddy, when I say I consider that you ought to have thought that. Do you, Mr. Pip? She was so quiet, and had such an orderly, good, and pretty way with her, that I did not like the thought of making her cry again. After looking a little at her downcast eyes as she walked beside me, I gave up that point. I suppose it will be difficult for you to remain here now, Biddy dear. Oh, I can't do so, Mr. Pip, said Biddy, in a tone of regret but still of quiet conviction. I have been speaking to Mrs. Hubble, and I am going to her to-morrow. I hope we shall be able to take some care of Mr. Gargery together until he settles down. How are you going to live, Biddy? If you want any mo How am I going to live? repeated Biddy, striking in with a momentary flush upon her face. I'll tell you, Mr. Pip, I am going to try to get the place of mistress in the new school nearly finished here. I can be well recommended by all the neighbours, and I hope I can be industrious and patient, and teach myself while I teach others. You know, Mr. Pip, pursued Biddy with a smile, as she raised her eyes to my face. The new schools are not like the old, but I learnt a good deal from you after that time, and have had time since then to improve. I think you would always improve, Biddy, under any circumstances. Ah, except in my bad side of human nature, murmured Biddy. It was not so much a reproach as an irresistible thinking aloud. Well, I thought I would give up that point, too. So I walked a little further with Biddy, looking silently at her downcast eyes. I have not heard the particulars of my sister's death, Biddy. They are very slight, poor thing. She had been in one of her bad states, though they had got better of late rather than worse, for four days, when she came out of it in the evening, just at tea-time and said quite plainly, Joe. As she had never said any word for a long while, I ran and fetched in Mr. Gargery from the forge. She made signs to me that she wanted him to sit down close to her, and wanted me to put her arms round his neck. So I put them round his neck, and she laid her head down on his shoulder, quite content and satisfied. And so she presently said, Joe, again, and once pardon, and once pip. And so she never lifted her head up any more, and it was just an hour later when we laid it down on her own bed, because we found she was gone. Biddy cried. The darkening garden, and the lane and the stars that were coming out, were blurred in my own sight. Nothing was ever discovered, Biddy? Nothing. Do you know what has become of Orlick? I should think from the colour of his clothes that he is working in the quarries. Of course you have seen him, then? Why are you looking at that dark tree in the lane? I saw him there on the night she died. That was not the last time, either, Biddy? No. I have seen him there since we have been walking here. It is of no use, said Biddy, laying her hand upon my arm, as I was for running out. You know I would not deceive you. He was not there a minute, and he is gone. It revived my utmost indignation to find she was still pursued by this fellow, and I felt inveterate against him. I told her so, and told her that I would spend any money or take any pains to drive him out of that country. By degrees she led me into more temperate talk, and she told me how Joe loved me, and how Joe never complained of anything. She didn't say, of me, she had no need, I knew what she meant, but ever did his duty and his way of life, with a strong hand, a quiet tongue, and a gentle heart. Indeed, it would be hard to say too much for him, said I, and Biddy, we must often speak of these things, for of course I shall be often down here now. I am not going to leave poor Joe alone. 
Biddy said never a single word. Biddy, didn't you hear me? Yes, Mr. Pip. Not to mention your calling me Mr. Pip, which appears to me to be in bad taste, Biddy. What do you mean? What do I mean? asked Biddy timidly. Biddy, said I in a virtuously self-asserting manner, I must request to know what you mean by this. By this? said Biddy. Now don't echo, I retorted. You used not to echo, Biddy. Used not, said Biddy. Oh, Mr. Pip, used. Well, I rather thought I would give up that point, too. After another silent turn in the garden, I fell back on the main position. Biddy, said I, I made a remark respecting my coming down here often to see Joe, which you received with a marked silence. Have the goodness, Biddy, to tell me why. Are you quite sure, then, that you will come to see him often? asked Biddy, stopping in the narrow garden walk, and looking at me under the stars with a clear and honest eye. Oh, dear me! said I, as if I found myself compelled to give up Biddy in despair. This really is a very bad side of human nature. Don't say any more, if you please, Biddy. This shocks me very much. For which cogent reason I kept Biddy at a distance during supper, and when I went up to my own old little room, took as stately a leave of her as I could, in my murmuring soul, deemed reconcilable with the churchyard, and the event of the day. As often as I was restless in the night, and that was every quarter of an hour, I reflected what an unkindness, what an injury, what an injustice Biddy had done me. Early in the morning I was to go. Early in the morning I was out, and looking in, unseen, at one of the wooden windows of the forge. There I stood, for minutes, looking at Joe, already at work with a glow of health and strength upon his face, that made it show as if the bright sun of the life in store for him were shining on it. "'Good-bye, dear Joe. No, don't wipe it off. For God's sake, give me your blackened hand. I shall be down soon and often.' "'Never too soon, sir,' said Joe. "'And never too often, Pip.' Biddy was waiting for me at the kitchen door with a mug of new milk and a crust of bread. Biddy, said I, when I gave her my hand at parting, I am not angry, but I am hurt. No, don't be hurt, she pleaded quite pathetically. Let only me be hurt if I have been ungenerous. Once more the mists were rising as I walked away. If they disclosed to me, as I suspect they did, that I should not come back, and that Biddy was quite right, all I can say is, they were quite right, too. End of chapter Chapter 36 of Great Expectations This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens Chapter 36 Herbert and I went on from bad to worse, in the way of increasing our debts, looking into our affairs, leaving margins, and the like exemplary transactions, and time went on, whether or no, as he has a way of doing, and I came of age, in fulfilment of Herbert's prediction that I should do so before I knew where I was. Herbert himself had come of age eight months before me. As he had nothing else than his majority to come into, the event did not make a profound sensation in Barnard's Inn, but we had looked forward to my one-and-twentieth birthday, with a crowd of speculations and anticipations, for we had both considered that my guardian could hardly help saying something definite on that occasion. I had taken care to have it well understood in Little Britain when my birthday was. 
On the day before it, I received an official note from Wemmick, informing me that Mr. Jaggers would be glad if I would call upon him at five in the afternoon of the auspicious day. This convinced us that something great was to happen, and threw me into an unusual flutter when I repaired to my guardian's office, a model of punctuality. In the outer office Wemmick offered me his congratulations, and incidentally rubbed the side of his nose with a folding piece of tissue paper that I liked the look of. But he said nothing respecting it, and motioned me with a nod into my guardian's room. It was November, and my guardian was standing before his fire, leaning his back against the chimney-piece, with his hands under his coat-tails. "'Well, Pip,' said he, "'I must call you Mr. Pip to-day. Congratulations, Mr. Pip.' We shook hands. He was always a remarkably short shaker, and I thanked him. "'Take a chair, Mr. Pip,' said my guardian. As I sat down, and he preserved his attitude and bent his brows at his boots, I felt at a disadvantage, which reminded me of that old time when I had been put upon a tombstone. The two ghastly casts on the shelf were not far from him, and their expression was as if they were making a stupid, apoplectic attempt to attend to the conversation. "'Now, my young friend,' my guardian began, as if I were a witness in the box, "'I am going to have a word or two with you.' "'If you please, sir.' "'What do you suppose?' said Mr. Jaggers, bending forward to look at the ground, and then throwing his head back to look at the ceiling. "'What do you suppose you are living at the rate of?' "'At the rate of, sir?' "'At,' repeated Mr. Jaggers, still looking at the ceiling, "'the rate of,' and then looked all round the room, and paused with his pocket-handkerchief in his hand, halfway to his nose." I had looked into my affairs so often that I had thoroughly destroyed any slight notion I might ever have had of their bearings. Reluctantly, I confessed myself quite unable to answer the question. This reply seemed agreeable to Mr. Jaggers, who said, "'I thought so,' and blew his nose with an air of satisfaction. "'Now I have asked you a question, my friend,' said Mr. Jaggers. "'Have you anything to ask me?' "'Of course it would be a great relief to me to ask you several questions, sir. But I remember your prohibition.' "'Ask one,' said Mr. Jaggers. "'Is my benefactor to be made known to me to-day?' "'No. Ask another.' "'Is that competence to be imparted to me soon?' "'Wave that a moment,' said Mr. Jaggers, "'and ask another.' I looked about me, but there appeared to be now no possible escape from the inquiry. "'Have I anything to receive, sir?' On that Mr. Jagger said triumphantly, "'I thought we should come to it,' and called to Wemmick to give him that piece of paper. Wemmick appeared, handed it in, and disappeared. "'Now, Mr. Pip,' said Mr. Jaggers, "'attend, if you please. You have been drawing pretty freely here.' Your name occurs pretty often in Wemmick's cash-book. But you are in debt, of course. I am afraid I must say yes, sir. You know you must say yes, don't you? said Mr. Jaggers. Yes, sir. I don't ask you what you owe, because you don't know. And if you did know, you wouldn't tell me. You would say less. Yes, yes, my friend cried Mr. Jaggers, waving his forefinger to stop me as I made a show of protesting. "'It's likely enough that you think you wouldn't, but you would. You'll excuse me, but I know better than you. Now, take this piece of paper in your hand. You have got it? Very good. Now, unfold it and tell me what it is.' "'This is a banknote,' said I. "'For five hundred pounds.' "'That is a banknote.' repeated Mr. Jaggers, for five hundred pounds. And a very handsome sum of money, too, I think. You consider it so? How could I do otherwise? Ah, but answer the question, said Mr. Jaggers. Undoubtedly. You consider it undoubtedly a handsome sum of money. Now, 
That handsome sum of money, Pip, is your own. It is a present to you on this day, in earnest of your expectations. And at the rate of that handsome sum of money per annum, and at no higher rate, you are to live until the donor of the whole appears. That is to say, you will now take your money affairs entirely into your own hands, and you will draw from Wemmick one hundred and twenty-five pounds per quarter, until you are in communication with the fountainhead, and no longer with the mere agent. As I have told you before, I am the mere agent. I execute my instructions, and I am paid for doing so. I think them injudicious, but I am not paid for giving any opinion on their merits. I was beginning to express my gratitude to my benefactor for the great liberality with which I was treated, when Mr. Jagger stopped me. "'I am not paid, Pip,' said he, coolly, "'to carry your words to any one.' And then gathered up his coat-tails, as he had gathered up the subject, and stood frowning at his boots, as if he suspected them of designs against him. After a pause I hinted. "'There was a question just now, Mr. Jaggers, which you desired me to waive for a moment. I hope I am doing nothing wrong in asking it again.' "'What is it?' said he. I might have known that he would never help me out, but it took me aback to have to shape the question afresh, as if it were quite new. "'Is it likely,' I said, after hesitating, "'that my patron, the fountainhead you have spoken of, Mr. Jaggers, will soon—' There I delicately stopped. "'Will soon what?' asked Mr. Jaggers. That's no question as it stands, you know. We'll soon come to London, said I, after casting about for a precise form of words, or summon me anywhere else. Now here, replied Mr. Jaggers, fixing me for the first time with his dark, deep-set eyes, we must revert to the evening when we first encountered one another in your village. What did I tell you then, Pip? You told me, Mr. Jaggers, that it might be years hence when that person appeared. Just so, said Mr. Jaggers. That's my answer. As we looked full at one another, I felt my breath come quicker in my strong desire to get something out of him. And as I felt that it came quicker, and as I felt that he saw that it came quicker, I felt that I had less chance than ever of getting anything out of him. Do you suppose it will still be years hence, Mr. Jaggers? Mr. Jaggers shook his head, not in negativing the question, but in altogether negativing the motion that he could anyhow be got to answer it. And the two horrible casts of the twitch faces looked, when my eyes strayed up to them, as if they had come to a crisis in their suspended attention, and were going to sneeze. Come! said Mr. Jaggers, warming the backs of his legs with the backs of his warmed hands. I'll be plain with you, my friend Pip. That's a question I must not be asked. You'll understand that better when I tell you it's a question that might compromise me. Come, I'll go a little further with you. I'll say something more. He bent down so low to frown at his boots that he was able to rub the calves of his legs in the paws he made. "'When that person discloses,' said Mr. Jaggers, straightening himself, "'you and that person will settle your own affairs. "'When that person discloses, my part in this business will cease and determine. "'When that person discloses, it will not be necessary for me to know anything about it. "'And that's all I have got to say.' "'We looked at one another until I withdrew my eyes and looked thoughtfully at the floor.' From this last speech I derived the notion that Miss Havisham, for some reason or no reason, had not taken him into her confidence as to her designing me for Estella, that he resented this, and felt a jealousy about it, or that he really did object to that scheme and would have nothing to do with it. When I raised my eyes again, I found that he had been shrewdly looking at me all the time, and was doing so still. "'If that is all you have to say, sir,' I remarked, "'there can be nothing left for me to say.' 
He nodded assent, and pulled out his thief-dreaded watch, and asked me where I was going to dine. I replied, at my own chambers, with Herbert. As a necessary sequence, I asked him if he would favour us with his company, and he promptly accepted the invitation. But he insisted on walking home with me, in order that I might make no extra preparation for him. And first he had a letter or two to write, and, of course, had his hands to wash. So I said I would go into the outer office and talk to Wemmick. The fact was, that when the five hundred pounds had come into my pocket, a thought had come into my head which had been often there before, and it appeared to me that Wemmick was a good person to advise with concerning such thought. He had already locked up his safe, and made preparations for going home. He had left his desk, brought out his two greasy office candlesticks, and stood them in line with the snuffers on a slab near the door, ready to be extinguished. He had raked his fire low, put his hat and great coat ready, and was beating himself all over the chest with his safe-key as an athletic exercise after business. "'Mr. Wemmick,' said I, "'I want to ask your opinion. I am very desirous to serve a friend.' Wemmick tightened his post-office and shook his head, as if his opinion were dead against any fatal weakness of that sort. "'This friend,' I pursued, "'is trying to get on in commercial life.' but has no money, and finds it difficult and disheartening to make a beginning. Now I want somehow to help him to a beginning. "'With money down?' said Wemmick, in a tone drier than any sawdust. "'With some money down,' I replied, for an uneasy remembrance shot across me of that symmetrical bundle of papers at home. "'With some money down, and perhaps some anticipation of my expectations.' "'Mr. Pip,' said Wemmick, "'I should like just to run over with you on my fingers, if you please, the name of the various bridges up as high as Chelsea Reach. Let's see. There's London, one, Southwark, two, Blackfriars, three, Waterloo, four, Westminster, five, Vauxhall, six. He had checked off each bridge in its turn with the handle of his safe-key on the palm of his hand. "'There's as many as six, you see, to choose from.' "'I don't understand you,' said I. "'Choose your bridge, Mr. Pip,' returned Wemmick, "'and take a walk upon your bridge, and pitch your money into the Thames over the centre arch of your bridge, and you know the end of it.' Serve a friend with it, and you may know the end of it, too. But it's a less pleasant and profitable end. I could have posted a newspaper in his mouth. He made it so wide after saying this. This is very discouraging, said I. Meant to be so, said Wemmick. Then it is your opinion, I inquired with some little indignation, that a man should never— "'Invest portable property in a friend?' said Wemmick. "'Certainly he should not, unless he wants to get rid of the friend, and then it becomes a question how much portable property it may be worth to get rid of him.' "'And that,' said I, "'is your deliberate opinion, Mr. Wemmick?' "'That,' he returned, "'is my deliberate opinion in this office.' "'Ah!' said I, pressing him, for I thought I saw him near a loophole here. But how would that be your opinion at Walworth? Mr. Pip, he replied, with gravity, Walworth is one place, and this office is another. Much as the agent is one person, and Mr. Jaggers is another. They must not be confounded together. My Walworth sentiments must be taken at Walworth. None but my official sentiments can be taken in this office. Very well, said I, much relieved. Then I shall look you up at Walworth. You may depend upon it. Mr. Pip, he returned, you will be welcome there, in a private and personal capacity. We had held this conversation in a low voice, well knowing my guardian's ears to be the sharpest of the sharp. As he now appeared in his doorway, toweling his hands, 
Wemmick got on his great coat and stood by to snuff out the candles. We all three went into the street together, and from the doorstep Wemmick turned his way, and Mr. Jaggers and I turned ours. I could not help wishing more than once that evening that Mr. Jaggers had an aged in Gerard Street, or a stinger, or a something, or a somebody, to unbend his brows a little. It was an uncomfortable consideration on a twenty-first birthday that coming of age at all seemed hardly worth while in such a guarded and suspicious world as he made of it. He was a thousand times better informed and cleverer than Wemmick, and yet I would a thousand times rather have had Wemmick to dinner. And Mr. Jaggers made not me alone intensely melancholy, because, after he was gone, Herbert said of himself, with his eyes fixed on the fire, that he thought he must have committed a felony and forgotten the details of it. He felt so dejected and guilty. End of chapter Chapter 37 of Great Expectations This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens, Chapter 37 Deeming Sunday the best day for taking Mr. Wemmick's Walworth sentiments, I devoted the next ensuing Sunday afternoon to a pilgrimage to the castle. On arriving before the battlements, I found the Union Jack flying and the drawbridge up, but undeterred by this show of defiance and resistance, I rang at the gate, and was admitted in a most specific manner by the agent. "'My son, sir,' said the old man, after securing the drawbridge, "'rather had it in his mind that you might happen to drop in. "'He left word that he would soon be home from his afternoon's walk. "'He is very regular in his walks, is my son. "'Very regular in everything, is my son.' "'I nodded at the old gentleman as Wemmick himself might have nodded, "'and we went in and sat down by the fireside.' "'You made acquaintance with my son, sir,' said the old man, in his chirping way, while he warmed his hands at the blaze. "'At his office, I expect?' I nodded. "'Ha! I have heard that my son is a wonderful hand at his business, sir?' I nodded hard. "'Yes, so they tell me. His business is the law?' I nodded harder. "'Which makes it more surprising in my son,' said the old man, "'for he was not brought up to the law, but to the wine-coopering.' Curious to know how the old gentleman stood informed concerning the reputation of Mr. Jaggers, I roared that name at him. He threw me into the greatest confusion by laughing heartily, and replying in a very sprightly manner, "'No, to be sure, you're right.' and to this hour I have not the faintest notion what he meant, or what joke he thought I had made. As I could not sit there nodding at him perpetually, without making some other attempt to interest him, I shouted an inquiry whether his own calling in life had been the wine-coopering. By dint of straining that term out of myself several times, and tapping the old gentleman on the chest to associate it with him, I at last succeeded in making my meaning understood. No, said the old gentleman, the warehousing, the warehousing. First, over yonder. He appeared to mean up the chimney, but I believe he intended to refer me to Liverpool. And then in the city of London here. However, having an infirmity, for I am hard of hearing, sir, I expressed in pantomime the greatest astonishment. "'Yes, hard of hearing. Having that infirmity coming upon me, my son, he went into the law, and he took charge of me, and he by little and little made out this elegant and beautiful property.' 
"'But returning to what you said, you know,' pursued the old man, again laughing heartily, <laughs> "'What I say is, no, to be sure, you're right.' I was modestly wondering whether my utmost ingenuity would have enabled me to say anything that would have amused him half as much as this imaginary pleasantry, when I was startled by a sudden click in the wall on one side of the chimney, and the ghostly tumbling open of a little wooden flap with John upon it. The old man, following my eyes, cried with great triumph, "'My son's come home!' and we both went out to the drawbridge." It was worth any money to see Wemmick waving a salute to me from the other side of the moat, when we might have shaken hands across it with the greatest ease. The aged was so delighted to work the drawbridge, that I made no offer to assist him, but stood quiet until Wemmick had come across, and had presented me to Miss Skiffins, a lady by whom he was acquainted. Miss Skiffins was of a wooden appearance, and was, like her escort, in the post-office branch of the service. She might have been some two or three years younger than Wemmick, and I judged her to stand possessed of portable property. The cut of her dress from the waist upward, both before and behind, made her figure very like a boy's kite, and I might have pronounced her gown a little too decidedly orange, and her gloves a little too intensely green. But she seemed to be a good sort of fellow, and showed a high regard for the aged, I was not long in discovering that she was a frequent visitor at the castle, for, on our going in, and my complimenting Wemmick on his ingenious contrivance for announcing himself to the aged, he begged me to give my attention for a moment to the other side of the chimney, and disappeared. Presently another click came, and another little door tumbled open with Miss Skiffins on it. Then Miss Skiffins shut up, and John tumbled open. Then Miss Skiffins and John both tumbled open together, and finally shut up together. On Wemmick's return from working these mechanical appliances, I expressed the great admiration with which I regarded them, and he said, "'Well, you know, they're both pleasant and useful to the aged. And by George, sir, it's a thing worth mentioning, that of all the people who come to this gate, the secret of those pools is only known to the aged, "'Miss Skiffins and me.' "'And Mr. Wemmick made them,' added Miss Skiffins, "'with his own hands, out of his own head.' While Miss Skiffins was taking off her bonnet, she retained her green gloves during the evening as an outward invisible sign that there was company, Wemmick invited me to take a walk with him round the property, and see how the island looked in winter-time. Thinking that he did this to give me an opportunity of taking his Walworth sentiments, I seized the opportunity as soon as we were out of the castle. Having thought of the matter with care, I approached my subject as if I had never hinted at it before. I informed Wemmick that I was anxious in behalf of Herbert Pocket, and I told him how we had first met, and how we had fought. I glanced at Herbert's home, and at his character, and at his having no means but such as he was dependent on his father for, those uncertain and unpunctual. I alluded to the advantages I had derived in my first rawness and ignorance from his society, and I confess that I feared I had but ill repaid them, and that he might have done better without me and my expectations. Keeping Miss Havisham in the background at a great distance, I still hinted at the possibility of my having competed with him in his prospects, and at the certainty of his possessing a generous soul, and being far above any mean distrusts, retaliations, or designs. For all these reasons, I told Wemmick, and because he was my young companion and friend, and I had a great affection for him, I wished my own good fortune to reflect some rays upon him and therefore I sought advice from Wemmick's experience and knowledge of men and affairs, how I could best try with my resources to help Herbert to some present income, say of a hundred a year, to keep him in good hope and heart, and gradually to buy him on to some small partnership. I begged Wemmick, in conclusion, to understand that my help must always be rendered without Herbert's knowledge or suspicion, and that there was no one else in the world with whom I could advise. 
I wound up by laying my hand upon his shoulder and saying, I can't help confiding in you, though I know it must be troublesome to you, but that is your fault in having ever brought me here. Wemmick was silent for a little while, and then said with a kind of start, Well, you know, Mr. Pip, I must tell you one thing. This is devilish good of you. Say you'll help me to be good, then, said I. He cod, replied Wemmick, shaking his head. That's not my trade. Nor is this your trading place, said I. You are right, he returned. You hit the nail on the head. Mr. Pip, I'll put on my considering cap, and I think all you want to do may be done by degrees. Skiffins, that's her brother, he is an accountant and agent. I'll look him up and go to work for you. I thank you ten thousand times. On the contrary, said he, I thank you, for though we are strictly in our private and personal capacity, still it may be mentioned that there are Newgate cobwebs about, and it brushes them away. After a little further conversation to the same effect, we returned into the castle where we found Miss Skiffins preparing tea. The responsible duty of making the toast was delegated to the aged, and that excellent old gentleman was so intent upon it that he seemed to me in some danger of melting his eyes. It was no nominal meal that we were going to make, but a vigorous reality. The aged prepared such a haystack of buttered toast that I could scarcely see him over it, as it simmered on an iron stand hooked on to the top bar, while Miss Skiffins brewed such a jorum of tea that the pig in the back premises became strongly excited, and repeatedly expressed his desires to participate in the entertainment. The flag had been struck, and the gun had been fired, at the right moment of time, and I felt as snugly cut off from the rest of Walworth as if the moat were thirty feet wide by as many deep. Nothing disturbed the tranquillity of the castle, but the occasional tumbling open of John and Miss Skiffins, which little doors were a prey to some spasmodic infirmity that made me sympathetically uncomfortable until I got used to it. I inferred from the methodical nature of Miss Skiffin's arrangements that she made tea there every Sunday night, and I rather suspected that a classic brooch she wore, representing the profile of an undesirable female with a very straight nose and a very new moon, was a piece of portable property that had been given her by Wemmick. We ate the whole of the toast, and drank tea in proportion, and it was delightful to see how warm and greasy we all got after it. The aged especially might have passed for some clean old chief of a savage tribe, just oiled. After a short pause of repose, Miss Skiffins, in the absence of the little servant who, it seemed, retired to the bosom of her family on Sunday afternoons, washed up the tea-things, in a trifling ladylike amateur manner that compromised none of us. Then she put on her gloves again, and we drew round the fire, and Wemmick said, "'Now, aged parrot, tip us the paper.' Wemmick explained to me, while the aged got his spectacles out, that this was according to custom, and that it gave the old gentleman infinite satisfaction to read the news aloud. "'I won't offer an apology.' said Wemmick, for he isn't capable of many pleasures. Are you aged, P? All right, John, all right, returned the old man, seeing himself spoken to. Only tip him a nod every now and then when he looks off his paper, said Wemmick, and he'll be as happy as a king. We are all attention, aged one. All right, John, all right returned the cheerful old man, so busy and so pleased, that it really was quite charming. The aged's reading reminded me of the classes at Mr. Wopsle's great aunt's, with a pleasanter peculiarity that it seemed to come through a keyhole. As he wanted the candles close to him, and as he was always on the verge of putting either his head or the newspaper into them, he required as much watching as a powder-mill but Wemmick was equally untiring and gentle in his vigilance, and the aged read on, quite unconscious of his many rescues. Whenever he looked at us, we all expressed the greatest interest and amazement, 
and nodded until he resumed again. As Wemmick and Miss Skiffin sat side by side, and as I sat in a shadowy corner, I observed a slow and gradual elongation of Mr. Wemmick's mouth, powerfully suggestive of his slowly and gradually stealing his arm round Miss Skiffin's waist. In course of time I saw his hand appear on the other side of Miss Skiffin's, but at that moment Miss Skiffins neatly stopped him with the green glove, unwound his arm again as if it were an article of dress, and with the greatest deliberation laid it on the table before her. Miss Skiffins' composure, while she did this, was one of the most remarkable sights I have ever seen, and if I could have thought the act consistent with abstraction of mind, I should have deemed that Miss Skiffins performed it mechanically. By and by I noticed Wemmick's arm beginning to disappear again, and gradually fading out of view. Shortly afterwards his mouth began to widen again. After an interval of suspense on my part, that was quite enthralling and almost painful, I saw his hand appear on the other side of Miss Skiffin's. Instantly Miss Skiffin stopped it with the neatness of a placid boxer, took off that girdle or cestus as before, and laid it on the table. Taking the table to represent the path of virtue, I am justified in stating that during the whole time of the aged's reading, Wemmick's arm was straying from the path of virtue and being recalled to it by Miss Skiffins. At last the aged read himself into a light slumber. This was the time for Wemmick to produce a little kettle, a tray of glasses, and a black bottle with a porcelain-topped cork representing some clerical dignitary of a rubicund and social aspect. With the aid of these appliances we all had something warm to drink, including the aged, who was soon awake again. Miss Skiffins mixed, and I observed that she and Wemmick drank out of one glass. Of course I knew better than to offer to see Miss Skiffins home, and, under the circumstances, I thought I had best go first, which I did, taking a cordial leave of the aged, and having passed a pleasant evening. Before a week was out, I received a note from Wemmick, dated Walworth, stating that he hoped he had made some advance in that matter appertaining to our private and personal capacities, and that he would be glad if I could come and see him again upon it. So I went out to Walworth again, and yet again, and yet again, and I saw him by appointment in the city several times, but never held any communication with him on the subject in or near Little Britain. The upshot was that we found a worthy young merchant or shipping broker, not long established in business, who wanted intelligent help, and who wanted capital, and who in due course of time and receipt would want a partner. Between him and me secret articles were signed of which Herbert was the subject, and I paid him half of my five hundred pounds down, and engage for sundry other payments, some to fall due at certain dates out of my income, some contingent on my coming into my property. Miss Skiffin's brother conducted the negotiation. Wemmick pervaded it throughout, but never appeared in it. The whole business was so cleverly managed that Herbert had not the least suspicion of my hand being in it. I shall never forget the radiant face with which he came home one afternoon, and told me, as a mighty piece of news, of his having fallen in with one Clericker, the young merchant's name, and of Clericker's having shown an extraordinary inclination towards him, and of his belief that the opening had come at last. Day by day, as his hopes grew stronger and his face brighter, he must have thought me a more and more affectionate friend, for I had the greatest difficulty in restraining my tears of triumph when I saw him so happy. At length, the thing being done, and he having that day entered Clericker's house, and he having talked to me for a whole evening in a flush of pleasure and success, I did really cry in good earnest when I went to bed, to think that my expectations had done some good to somebody. A great event in my life, the turning point of my life, now opens on my view. But, before I proceed to narrate it, and before I pass on to all the changes it involved, I must give one chapter to Estella. It is not much to give to the theme that so long filled my heart. End of chapter
Chapter Thirty Eight of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter Thirty Eight. If that staid old house near the green at Richmond should ever come to be haunted when I am dead, it will be haunted surely by my ghost. Oh, the many, many nights and days through which the unquiet spirit within me haunted that house when Estella lived there. Let my body be where it would, my spirit was always wandering, wandering, wandering about that house. The lady with whom Estella was placed, Mrs. Branley by name, was a widow, with one daughter several years older than Estella. The mother looked young, and the daughter looked old. The mother's complexion was pink, and the daughter's was yellow. The mother set up for frivolity, the daughter for theology. They were in what is called a good position, and visited, and were visited by, numbers of people. Little, if any, community of feeling subsisted between them and Estella, but the understanding was established that they were necessary to her, and that she was necessary to them. Mrs. Branley had been a friend of Miss Havisham's before the time of her seclusion. In Mrs. Branley's house, and out of Mrs. Branley's house, I suffered every kind and degree of torture that Estella could cause me. The nature of my relations with her, which placed me on terms of familiarity, without placing me on terms of favour, conduced to my distraction. She made use of me to tease other admirers, and she turned the very familiarity between herself and me to the account of putting a constant slight on my devotion to her. If I had been her secretary, steward, half-brother, poor relation, if I had been a younger brother of her appointed husband, I could not have seen to myself further from my hopes when I was nearest to her. The privilege of calling her by her name, and hearing her call me by mine, became, under the circumstances, an aggravation of my trials, and while I think it likely that it almost maddened her other lovers, I know too certainly that it almost maddened me. She had admirers without end. No doubt my jealousy made an admirer of every one who went near her, for there were more than enough of them without that. I saw her often at Richmond. I heard of her often in town, and I used often to take her and the Branleys on the water. There were picnics, fete days, plays, operas, concerts, parties, all sorts of pleasures, through which I pursued her, and they were all miseries to me. I never had one hour's happiness in her society, and yet my mind all round the four and twenty hours was harping on the happiness of having her with me unto death. Throughout this part of our intercourse, and it lasted, as will presently be seen, for what I then thought a long time, she habitually reverted to that tone which expressed that our association was forced upon us. There were other times when she would come to a sudden check in this tone, and in all her many tones, and would seem to pity me. "'Pip, Pip,' she said one evening, coming to such a check, when we sat apart at a darkening window of the house in Richmond. "'Will you never take warning?' "'Of what?' "'Of me.' "'Warning not to be attracted by you, do you mean, Estella?' "'Do I mean? If you don't know what I mean, you are blind.' I should have replied that love was commonly reputed blind, but for the reason that I always was restrained, and this was not the least of my miseries, by a feeling that it was ungenerous to press myself upon her, when she knew that she could not choose but obey Miss Havisham. My dread always was that this knowledge on her part laid me under a heavy disadvantage with her pride, and may be the subject of a rebellious struggle in her bosom. "'At any rate,' said I, I have no warning given me just now, for you wrote to me to come to you this time. "'That's true,' said Estella, with a cold, careless smile that always chilled me. After looking at the twilight without, for a little while, 
she went on to say, "'The time has come round when Miss Havisham wishes to have me for a day at Satis. You are to take me there, and bring me back, if you will. She would rather I did not travel alone, and objects to receiving my maid, for she has a sensitive horror of being talked of by such people. Can you take me?' "'Can I take you, Estella?' "'You can, then?' the day after to-morrow, if you please. You are to pay all charges out of my purse. You hear the condition of your going?" "'And must obey,' said I. This was all the preparation I received for that visit, or for others like it. Miss Havisham never wrote to me, nor had I ever so much as seen her handwriting. She went down on the next day but one, and we found her in the room where I had first beheld her and it is needless to add that there was no change in Satis house. She was even more dreadfully fond of Estella than she had been when I last saw them together. I repeat the word advisedly, for there was something positively dreadful in the energy of her looks and embraces. She hung upon Estella's beauty, hung upon her words, hung upon her gestures, and sat mumbling her own trembling fingers while she looked at her as though she were devouring the beautiful creature she had reared. From Estella she looked at me, with a searching glance that seemed to pry into my heart and probe its wounds. "'How does she use you, Pip? How does she use you?' she asked me again, with her witch-like eagerness, even in Estella's hearing. But when we sat by her flickering fire at night she was most weird, for then, keeping Estella's hand drawn through her arm and clutched in her own hand, she extorted from her, by dint of referring back to what Estella had told her in her regular letters, the names and conditions of the men whom she had fascinated, and as Miss Havisham dwelt upon this role, with the intensity of a mind mortally hurt and diseased, she sat with her other hand on her crutch-stick, and her chin on that, and her wan, bright eyes glaring at me, a very spectre. I saw in this, wretched though it made me, and bitter the sense of dependence and even of degradation that it awakened, I saw in this that Estella was set to wreak Miss Havisham's revenge on men, and that she was not to be given to me until she had gratified it for a term. I saw in this a reason for her being beforehand assigned to me, Sending her out to attract and torment and do mischief, Miss Havisham sent her with the malicious assurance that she was beyond the reach of all admirers, and that all who stalked upon that cast were secured to lose. I saw in this that I, too, was tormented by a perversion of ingenuity, even while the prize was reserved for me. I saw in this the reason for my being staved off so long and the reason for my late guardian's declining to commit himself to the formal knowledge of such a scheme. In a word, I saw in this Miss Havisham as I had her then and there before my eyes, and always had her before my eyes, and I saw in this the distinct shadow of the darkened and unhealthy house in which her life was hidden from the sun. The candles that lighted that room of hers were placed in sconces on the wall. They were high from the ground, and they burnt with the steady dullness of artificial light in air that is seldom renewed. As I looked round at them, and at the pale gloom they made, and at the stopped clock, and at the withered articles of bridal dress upon the table and the ground, and at her own awful figure with its ghostly reflection thrown large by the fire upon the ceiling and the wall, I saw in everything the construction that my mind did come to, repeated and thrown back to me. My thoughts passed into the great room across the landing where this table was spread, and I saw it there, as it were, in the falls of the cobwebs from the centerpiece, in the crawlings of the spiders on the cloth, in the tracks of the mice as they betook their little quickened hearts behind the panels, and in the gropings and pausings of the beetles on the floor. It happened on the occasion of this visit that some sharp words arose between Estella and Miss Havisham. It was the first time I had ever seen them opposed. We were seated by the fire, as just now described, 
and Miss Havisham still had Estella's arm drawn through her own, and still clutched Estella's hand in hers, when Estella gradually began to detach herself. She had shown a proud impatience more than once before, and had rather endured that fierce affection than accepted or returned it. "'What?' said Miss Havisham, flashing her eyes upon her. "'Are you tired of me?' "'Only a little tired of myself,' replied Estella, disengaging her arm, and moving to the great chimney-piece where she stood looking down at the fire. "'Speak the truth, you ingrate!' cried Miss Havisham, passionately striking her stick upon the floor. "'You are tired of me!' Estella looked at her with perfect composure and again looked down at the fire. Her graceful figure and her beautiful face expressed a self-possessed indifference to the wild heat of the other that was almost cruel. "'You stock and stone!' exclaimed Miss Havisham. "'You cold, cold heart!' "'What?' said Estella, preserving her attitude of indifference, as she leaned against the great chimney-piece and only moving her eyes. Do you reproach me for being cold? You? Are you not? was the fierce retort. You should know, said Estella. I am what you have made me. Take all the praise, take all the blame, take all the success, take all the failure. In short, take me. Oh, look at her, look at her, cried Miss Havisham bitterly. Look at her so hard and thankless, on the hearth where she was reared, where I took her into this wretched breast when it was first bleeding from its stabs, and where I have lavished years of tenderness upon her. At least I was no party to the compact, said Estella, for if I could walk and speak when it was made, it was as much as I could do. But what would you have? You have been very good to me and I owe everything to you. What would you have? Love, replied the other. You have it. I have not, said Miss Havisham. Mother by adoption, retorted Estella, never departing from the easy grace of her attitude, never raising her voice as the other did, never yielding either to anger or tenderness. Mother by adoption, I have said that I owe everything to you. All I possess is freely yours. All that you have given me is at your command to have again. Beyond that I have nothing. And if you ask me to give you what you never gave me, my gratitude and duty cannot do impossibilities. Did I never give her love? cried Miss Havisham, turning wildly to me. Did I never give her a burning love, inseparable from jealousy at all times, and from sharp pain, while she speaks thus to me? Let her call me mad! Let her call me mad! Why should I call you mad? returned Estella. I, of all people. Does any one live, who knows what set purposes you have, half as well as I do? Does any one live, who knows what a steady memory you have, half as well as I do. I, who have sat on this same hearth, on the little stool that is even now beside you there, learning your lessons, and looking up into your face, when your face was strange and frightened me. Soon forgotten, moaned Miss Havisham. Time soon forgotten. No, not forgotten, retorted Estella. Not forgotten, but treasured up in my memory. When have you found me false to your teaching? When have you found me unmindful of your lessons? When have you found me giving admission here? She touched her bosom with her hand. To anything that you excluded. Be just to me. So proud, so proud, moaned Miss Havisham, pushing away her grey hair with both her hands. "'Who taught me to be proud?' returned Estella. "'Who praised me when I learnt my lesson?' "'So hard, so hard!' moaned Miss Havisham with her former action. 
"'Who taught me to be hard?' returned Estella. "'Who praised me when I learnt my lesson?' "'But to be proud and hard to me!' Miss Havisham quite shrieked, as she stretched out her arms. "'Estella! Estella! Estella! To be proud and hard to me!' Estella looked at her for a moment with a kind of calm wonder, but was not otherwise disturbed. When the moment was past, she looked down at the fire again. "'I cannot think,' said Estella, raising her eyes after a silence, "'why you should be so unreasonable when I come to see you after a separation. I have never forgotten your wrongs and their causes. I have never been unfaithful to you or your schooling. I have never shown any weakness that I could charge myself with.' "'Would it be weakness to return my love?' exclaimed Miss Havisham. "'But yes, 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 she would call it so.' "'I begin to think,' said Estella, in a musing way, after another moment of calm wonder, "'that I almost understand how this comes about. "'If you had brought up your adopted daughter wholly in the dark confinement of these rooms,' and had never let her know that there was such a thing as the daylight by which she had never once seen your face. If you had done that, and then, for a purpose, had wanted her to understand the daylight and know all about it, you would have been disappointed and angry? Miss Havisham, with her head in her hands, sat making a low moaning and swaying herself on her chair, but gave no answer. Or said Estella, which is a nearer case, if you had taught her from the dawn of her intelligence, with your utmost energy and might, that there was such a thing as daylight, but that it was made to be her enemy and destroyer, and she must always turn against it, for it had blighted you and would else blight her. If you had done this, and then, for a purpose, had wanted to take her naturally to the daylight, and she could not do it, you would have been disappointed and angry? Miss Havisham sat listening, or it seemed so, for I could not see her face, but still made no answer. So, said Estella, I must be taken as I have been made. The success is not mine, the failure is not mine, but the two together make me. Miss Havisham had settled down, I hardly knew how, upon the floor, among the faded bridal relics with which it was strewn. I took advantage of the moment, I had sought one from the first, to leave the room, after beseeching Estella's attention to her, with a movement of my hand. When I left, Estella was yet standing by the great chimney-piece, just as she had stood throughout. Miss Havisham's grey hair was all adrift upon the ground, among the other bridal wrecks, and was a miserable sight to see. It was with a depressed heart that I walked in the starlight for an hour and more, about the courtyard, and about the brewery, and about the ruined garden. When I at last took courage to return to the room, I found Estella sitting at Miss Havisham's knee, taking up some stitches in one of those old articles of dress that were dropping to pieces, and of which I have often been reminded since by the faded tatters of old banners that I have seen hanging up in cathedrals. Afterwards, Estella and I played at cards as of yore, only we were skilful now, and played French games, and so the evening wore away, and I went to bed. I lay in that separate building across the courtyard, it was the first time I had ever lain down to rest in Satis House, and sleep refused to come near me. A thousand Miss Havishams haunted me. She was on this side of my pillow, on that, at the head of the bed, at the foot, behind the half-open door of the dressing-room, in the dressing-room, in the room overhead, in the room beneath, everywhere. At last, when the night was slow to creep on towards two o'clock, I felt that I absolutely could no longer bear the place as a place to lie down in, and that I must get up. I therefore got up and put on my clothes, and went out across the yard into the long stone passage, 
designing to gain the outer courtyard and walk there for the relief of my mind. But I was no sooner in the passage than I extinguished my candle, for I saw Miss Havisham going along it in a ghostly manner, making a low cry. I followed her at a distance, and saw her go up the staircase. She carried a bare candle in her hand, which she had probably taken from one of the sconces in her own room, and was a most unearthly object by its light. Standing at the bottom of the staircase, I felt the mildewed air of the feast-chamber, without seeing her open the door, and I heard her walking there, and so across into her own room, and so across again into that, never ceasing the low cry. After a time, I tried in the dark both to get out and to go back, but I could do neither until some streaks of day strayed in and showed me where to lay my hands. During the whole interval, whenever I went to the bottom of the staircase, I heard her footstep, saw her light pass above, and heard her ceaseless low cry. Before we left next day there was no revival of the difference between her and Estella, nor was it ever revived on any similar occasion, and there were four similar occasions, to the best of my remembrance. Nor did Miss Havisham's manner towards Estella in any wise change, except that I believed it to have something like fear infused among its former characteristics. It is impossible to turn this leaf of my life without putting Bentley Drummle's name upon it, or I would very gladly. On a certain occasion when the Finches were assembled in force, and when good feeling was being promoted in the usual manner, by nobody's agreeing with anybody else, the presiding Finch called the Grove to order, for as much as Mr. Drummle had not yet toasted a lady, which, according to the solemn constitution of the society, it was the brute's turn to do that day, I thought I saw him leer in an ugly way at me while the decanters were going round, but as there was no love lost between us, that might easily be. What was my indignant surprise when he called upon the company to pledge him to Estella? Estella who? said I. Never you mind, retorted Drummle. Estella of where? said I. You are bound to say of where? Which he was, as a finch. Of Richmond, gentlemen, said Drummle, putting me out of the question, and a peerless beauty. Much he knew about peerless beauties, a mean, miserable idiot, I whispered Herbert. I know that lady, said Herbert across the table, when the toast had been honoured. Do you? said Drummle. And so do I, I added, with a scarlet face. Do you? said Drummle. Oh, Lord! This was the only retort, except glass or crockery, that the heavy creature was capable of making, but I became as highly incensed by it as if it had been barbed with wit, and I immediately rose in my place, and said that I could not but regard it as being like the Honourable Finch's impudence to come down to that grove, we always talked about coming down to that grove, as a neat parliamentary turn of expression, down to that grove, proposing a lady of whom he knew nothing. Mr. Drummle, upon this, starting up, demanded what I meant by that, whereupon I made him the extreme reply that I believed he knew where I was to be found. Whether it was possible in a Christian country to get on without blood, after this, was a question on which the Finches were divided. The debate upon it grew so lively, indeed, that at least six more honourable members told six more, during the discussion, that they believed they knew where they were to be found. However, it was decided at last, the grove being a court of honour, that if Mr. Drummle would bring never so slight a certificate from the lady, importing that he had the honour of her acquaintance, Mr. Pip must express his regret, as a gentleman, and a finch, for having been betrayed into a warmth which. Next day was appointed for the production, lest our honour should take cold from delay, and next day Drummle appeared with a polite little avowal in Estella's hand that she had had the honour of dancing with him several times. This left me no course but to regret that I had been 
betrayed into a warmth which, and on the whole to repudiate, as untenable, the idea that I was to be found anywhere. Drummle and I then sat snorting at one another for an hour, while the grove engaged in indiscriminate contradiction, and finally the promotion of good feeling was declared to have gone ahead at an amazing rate. I tell this lightly, but it was no light thing to me, for I cannot adequately express what pain it gave me to think that Estella should show any favour to a contemptible, clumsy, sulky booby, so very far below the average. To the present moment I believe it to have been referable to some pure fire of generosity and disinterestedness in my love for her, that I could not endure the thought of her stooping to that hound. No doubt I should have been miserable whomsoever she had favoured, but a worthier object would have caused me a different kind and degree of distress. It was easy for me to find out, and I did soon find out, that Drummle had begun to follow her closely, and that she allowed him to do it. A little while, and he was always in pursuit of her, and he and I crossed one another every day. He held on, in a dull, persistent way, and Estella held him on, now with encouragement, now with discouragement, now almost flattering him, now openly despising him, now knowing him very well, now scarcely remembering who he was. The spider, as Mr. Jaggers had called him, was used to lying in wait, however, and had the patience of his tribe. Added to that, he had a blockhead confidence in his money and in his family greatness, which sometimes did him good service, almost taking the place of concentration and determined purpose. So the spider, doggedly watching Estella, outwatched many brighter insects, and would often uncoil himself and drop at the right nick of time. At a certain assembly ball at Richmond, there used to be assembly balls at most places then, where Estella had outshone all other beauties, this blundering drummle so hung about her, and with so much toleration on her part, that I resolved to speak to her concerning him. I took the next opportunity, which was when she was waiting for Mrs. Blandley to take her home, and was sitting apart among some flowers, ready to go. I was with her, for I almost always accompanied them to and from such places. "'Are you tired, Estella?' "'Rather, Pip.' "'You should be.' "'Say rather, I should not be, for I have my letter to Saddis House to write, before I go to sleep.' "'Recounting to-night's triumph,' said I, "'surely a very poor one, Estella.' "'What do you mean?' I didn't know there had been any. Estella, said I, do look at that fellow in the corner yonder who is looking over here at us. Why should I look at him? returned Estella, with her eyes on me instead. What is there in that fellow in the corner yonder, to use your words, that I need look at? Indeed, that is the very question I want to ask you, said I for he has been hovering about you all night. "'Moths and all sorts of ugly creatures,' replied Estella, with a glance towards him, "'hover about a lighted candle. Can the candle help it?' "'No,' I returned. "'But cannot the Estella help it?' "'Well,' said she, laughing after a moment, "'perhaps. Yes, anything you like.' But, Estella, do hear me speak. It makes me wretched that you should encourage a man so generally despised as Drummle. You know he is despised. Well, said she, you know he is as ungainly within as without, a deficient, ill-tempered, lowering, stupid fellow. Well, said she, you know he has nothing to recommend him but money and a ridiculous roll of addle-headed predecessors, now, don't you? Well, said she again, and each time she said it she opened her lovely eyes the wider. To overcome the difficulty of getting past that monosyllable, I took it from her, and said, repeating it with emphasis, Well, then, that is why it makes me wretched. 
Now, if I could have believed that she favoured Drummle with any idea of making me, me, wretched, I would have been in better heart about it. But in that habitual way of hers, she put me so entirely out of the question that I could believe nothing of the kind. Pip, said Estella, casting her glance over the room, don't be foolish about its effect on you. It may have its effect on others, and may be meant to have. It's not worth discussing. Yes, it is, said I, because I cannot bear that people should say she throws away her graces and attractions on a mere boor, the lowest in the crowd. I can bear it, said Estella. Oh, don't be so proud, Estella, and so inflexible. Calls me proud and inflexible in this breath, said Estella, opening her hands and in his last breath reproach me for stooping to a boor. "'There is no doubt you do,' said I, something hurriedly, "'for I have seen you give him looks and smiles this very night, such as you never give to me.' "'Do you want me, then?' said Estella, turning suddenly with a fixed and serious, if not angry, look, "'to deceive and entrap you?' Do you deceive and entrap him, Estella? Yes, and many others, all of them but you. Here is Mrs. Branley. I'll say no more. And now that I have given the one chapter to the theme that so filled my heart, and so often made it ache and ache again, I pass on unhindered to the event that had impended over me longer yet, the event that had begun to be prepared for, before I knew that the world held Estella, and in the days when her baby intelligence was receiving its first distortions from Miss Havisham's wasting hands. In the Eastern story, the heavy slab that was to fall on the bed of state in the flush of conquest was slowly wrought out of the quarry. The tunnel for the rope to hold it in its place was slowly carried through the leagues of rock. The slab was slowly raised and fitted in the roof, the rope was rove to it, and slowly taken through the miles of hollow to the great iron ring. All being made ready with much labour, and the hour come, the sultan was aroused in the dead of night, and the sharpened axe that was to sever the rope from the great iron ring was put into his hand, and he struck with it, and the rope parted and rushed away, and the ceiling fell. So, in my case, all the work, near and afar, that tended to the end, had been accomplished, and in an instant the blow was struck, and the roof of my stronghold dropped upon me. End of chapter Chapter Thirty Nine of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter Thirty Nine. I was three and twenty years of age. Not another word had I heard to enlighten me on the subject of my expectations, and my twenty-third birthday was a week gone. We had left Barnard's Inn more than a year, and lived in the temple. Our chambers were in Garden Court, down by the river. Mr. Pocket and I had for some time parted company as to our original relations, though we continued on the best terms, notwithstanding my inability to settle to anything which I hope arose out of the restless and incomplete tenure on which I held my means, I had a taste for reading, and read regularly so many hours a day. That matter of Herbert's was still progressing, and everything with me was as I have brought it down to the close of the last preceding chapter. Business had taken Herbert on a journey to Marseilles. I was alone, and had a dull sense of being alone. Dispirited and anxious, long hoping that to-morrow or next week would clear my way, and long disappointed, 
I sadly missed the cheerful face and ready response of my friend. It was wretched weather, stormy and wet, stormy and wet, and mud, 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 deep in all the streets. Day after day, a vast heavy veil had been driving over London from the east, and it drove still, as if in the east there were an eternity of cloud and wind. So furious had been the gusts, that high buildings in town had had the lead stripped off their roofs, and in the country trees had been torn up, and sails of windmills carried away, and gloomy accounts had come in from the coast of shipwreck and death. Violent blasts of rain had accompanied these rages of wind, and the day just closed as I sat down to read had been the worst of all. Alterations have been made in that part of the temple since that time, and it has not now so lonely a character as it had then, nor is it so exposed to the river. We lived at the top of the last house, and the wind rushing up the river shook the house that night, like discharges of cannon, or breakings of a sea. When the rain came with it and dashed against the windows, I thought, raising my eyes to them as they rocked, that I might have fancied myself in a storm-beaten lighthouse. Occasionally the smoke came rolling down the chimney as though it could not bear to go out into such a night, and when I set the doors open and looked down the staircase, the staircase lamps were blown out, and when I shaded my face with my hands and looked through the black windows, opening them ever so little was out of the question in the teeth of such wind and rain, I saw that the lamps in the court were blown out, and that the lamps on the bridges and the shore were shuddering and that the coal-fires and barges on the river were being carried away before the wind, like red-hot splashes in the rain. I read with my watch upon the table, purposing to close my book at eleven o'clock. As I shut it, St. Paul's, and all the many church clocks in the city, some leading, some accompanying, some following, struck that hour. The sound was curiously flawed by the wind, and I was listening, and thinking how the wind assailed and tore it, when I heard a footstep on the stair. What nervous folly made me start, and awfully connect it with the footstep of my dead sister, matters not. It was past in a moment, and I listened again, and heard the footstep stumble in coming on. Remembering then that the staircase lights were blown out, I took up my reading lamp and went out to the stairhead. Whoever was below had stopped on seeing my lamp, for all was quiet. "'There is someone down there, is there not?' I called out, looking down. "'Yes,' said a voice from the darkness beneath. "'What floor do you want?' "'The top, Mr. Pip.' "'That is my name. There's nothing the matter.' "'Nothing the matter.' returned the voice, and the man came on. I stood with my lamp held out over the stair-rail, and he came slowly within its light. It was a shaded lamp to shine upon a book, and its circle of light was very contracted, so that he was in it for a mere instant, and then out of it. In the instant I had seen a face that was strange to me, looking up with an incomprehensible air of being touched and pleased by the sight of me. Moving the lamp as the man moved, I made out that he was substantially dressed, but roughly, like a voyager by sea, that he had long iron-gray hair, that his age was about sixty, that he was a muscular man, strong on his legs, and that he was browned and hardened by exposure to weather. As he ascended the last stair or two, and the light of my lamp included us both, I saw, with a stupid kind of amazement, that he was holding out both his hands to me. "'Pray what is your business?' I asked him. "'My business,' he repeated, pausing. "'Ah, yes. I will explain my business by your leave.' "'Do you wish to come in?' "'Yes,' he replied. "'I wish to come in, master.' I had asked him the question inhospitably enough, for I resented the sort of bright and gratified recognition that still shone in his face. I resented it, 
because it seemed to imply that he expected me to respond to it. But I took him into the room I had just left, and having set the lamp on the table, asked him as civilly as I could to explain himself. He looked about him with the strangest air, an air of wondering pleasure, as if he had some part in the things he admired. And he pulled off a rough outer coat and his hat. Then I saw that his head was furrowed and bald, and that the long iron-gray hair grew only on its sides. But I saw nothing that in the least explained him. On the contrary, I saw him next moment, once more holding out both his hands to me. "'What do you mean?' said I, half expecting him to be mad. He stopped in his looking at me, and slowly rubbed his right hand over his head. "'It's disappointing to a man,' he said, in a coarse, broken voice, "'arter having looked forward so distant and come so fur. But you're not to blame for that. Neither on us is to blame for that. I'll speak in half a minute. Give me half a minute, please.' He sat down on a chair that stood before the fire, and covered his forehead with his large brown Venice hands. I looked at him attentively then, and recoiled a little from him, but I did not know him. "'There's no one nigh,' said he, looking over his shoulder. "'Is there?' "'Why do you, a stranger coming into my rooms at this time of night, ask that question?' said I. "'You're a game one,' he returned, shaking his head at me with a deliberate affection, at once most unintelligible and most exasperating.' I'm glad you growed up a game one, but don't catch hold of me. You'll be sorry afterwards to have done it. I relinquished the intention he had detected, for I knew him. Even yet I could not recall a single feature, but I knew him. If the wind and rain had driven away the intervening years, had scattered all the intervening objects, had swept us to the churchyard where we first stood face to face on such different levels, I could not have known my convict more distinctly than I knew him now as he sat in the chair before the fire. No need to take a file from his pocket and show it to me. No need to take the handkerchief from his neck and twist it round his head. No need to hug himself with both his arms, and take a shivering turn across the room, looking back at me for recognition. I knew him before he gave me one of those aids, though a moment before— I had not been conscious of remotely suspecting his identity. He came back to where I stood, and again held out both his hands, not knowing what to do, for in my astonishment I had lost my self-possession. I reluctantly gave him my hands. He grasped them heartily, raised them to his lips, kissed them, and still held them. "'You acted noble, my boy,' said he. "'Noble, Pip!' and I have never forgot it. At a change in his manner, as if he were even going to embrace me, I laid a hand upon his breast and put him away. Stay, said I, keep off. If you are grateful to me for what I did when I was a little child, I hope you have shown your gratitude by mending your way of life. If you have come here to thank me, it was not necessary. Still, however you have found me out, there must be something good in the feeling that has brought you here, and I will not repulse you, but surely you must understand that I— My attention was so attracted by the singularity of his fixed look at me, that the words died away on my tongue. "'You was a saying,' he observed, when we had confronted one another in silence, "'that surely I must understand. What surely must I understand?' that I cannot wish to renew that chance intercourse with you of long ago, under these different circumstances. I am glad to believe you have repented and recovered yourself. I am glad to tell you so. I am glad that, thinking I deserve to be thanked, you have come to thank me. But our ways are different ways, none the less. You are wet, and you look weary. Will you drink something before you go?' He had replaced his neckerchief loosely, and had stood, keenly observant of me, biting a long end of it. "'I think,' 
he answered, still with the end at his mouth and still observant of me, that I will drink, I thank you, afore I go. There was a tray ready on a side table. I brought it to the table near the fire and asked him what he would have. He touched one of the bottles without looking at it or speaking, and I made him some hot rum and water. I tried to keep my hands steady while I did so, but his look at me as he leaned back in his chair, with a long draggled end of his neckerchief between his teeth, evidently forgotten, made my hand very difficult to master. When at last I put the glass to him, I saw with amazement that his eyes were full of tears. Up to this time I had remained standing, not to disguise that I wished him gone. But I was softened by the softened aspect of the man, and felt a touch of reproach. "'I hope,' said I, hurriedly putting something into a glass for myself, and drawing a chair to the table, "'that you would not think I spoke harshly to you just now. I had no intention of doing it, and I am sorry for it if I did.' I wish you well and happy. As I put my glass to my lips, he glanced with surprise at the end of his neckerchief, dropping from his mouth when he opened it, and stretched out his hand. I gave him mine, and then he drank, and drew his sleeve across his eyes and forehead. "'How are you living?' I asked him. "'I have been a sheep-farmer, stock-breeder, other trades besides.' away in the new world, said he, many a thousand mile of stormy water off from this. I hope you've done well? I've done wonderfully well. There's others went out alonger me as has done well too, but no man has done nigh as well as me. I'm famous for it. I am glad to hear it. I hope to hear you say so, my dear boy. Without stopping to try to understand those words or the tone in which they were spoken, I turned off to a point that had just come to my mind. Have you ever seen a messenger you once sent to me, I inquired, since he undertook that trust? Never set eyes upon him. I warn't likely to it. He came faithfully. And he brought me the two one-pound notes. I was a poor boy then, as you know, and to a poor boy they were a little fortune. But, like you, I have done well since, and you must let me pay them back. You can put them to some other poor boy's use. I took out my purse. He watched me as I laid my purse upon the table and opened it, and he watched me as I separated two one-pound notes from its contents. They were clean and new, and I spread them out and handed them over to him. Still watching me, he laid them one upon the other, folded them longwise, gave them a twist, set fire to them at the lamp, and dropped the ashes into the tray. "'May I make so bold,' he said then, with a smile that was like a frown, and with a frown that was like a smile, "'as ask you how you have done well.' since you and me was out on them lone shivering marshes. How? Ha! Ah. He emptied his glass, got up, and stood at the side of the fire, with his heavy brown hand on the mantel-shelf. He put a foot up to the bars to dry and warm it, and the wet boot began to steam. But he neither looked at it nor at the fire, but steadily looked at me. It was only now that I began to tremble. When my lips had parted and had shaped some words that were without sound, I forced myself to tell him, though I could not do it distinctly, that I had been chosen to succeed to some property. "'Might a mere varmint ask what property?' said he. I faltered. "'I don't know.' "'Might a mere varmint ask whose property?' said he. I faltered again. I don't know. Could I make a guess, I wonder, said the convict, at your income since you come of age, as to the first figure now? Five? With my heart beating like a heavy hammer of disordered action, I rose out of my chair and stood with my hand upon the back of it, looking wildly at him. 
"'Concerning a guardian,' he went on, "'there ought to have been some guardian or such like whilst you was a minor. Uh, "'Some lawyer, maybe. "'As to the first letter of that lawyer's name now, would it be J?' All the truth of my position came flashing on me, and its disappointments, dangers, disgraces, consequences of all kinds, rushed in such a multitude that I was borne down by them, and had to struggle for every breath I drew. "'Put it,' he resumed, "'as the employer of that lawyer whose name begun with a J, and might be Jaggers. Put it as he had come over sea to Portsmouth, and had landed there, and had wanted to come on to you. However you have found me out, you says just now. Well, however did I find you out? Why, I wrote from Portsmouth to a person in London for particulars of your address. That person's name? Why, Wemmick. I could not have spoken one word, though it had been to save my life. I stood with a hand on the chair back and a hand on my breast, where I seemed to be suffocating, I stood so, looking wildly at him, until I grasped at the chair, when the room began to surge and turn. He caught me, drew me to the sofa, put me up against the cushions, and bent on one knee before me, bringing the face that I now well remembered, and that I shuddered at, very near to mine. "'Yes, Pip, dear boy,' I've made a gentleman on you. It's me what has done it. I swore that time, sure as ever I earned a guinea, that guinea should go to you. I swore afterwards, sure as ever I speculated and got rich, you should get rich. I lived rough, that you should live smooth. I worked hard, that you should be above work. What odds, dear boy? Do I tell it? for you to feel an obligation? Not a bit. I tell it for you to know as that there hunted dunghill dog what you kept life in, got his head so high that he could make a gentleman, and Pip, you're him. The abhorrence in which I held the man, the dread I had of him, the repugnance with which I shrank from him, could not have been exceeded if he had been some terrible beast. Looky here, Pip! I'm your second father. You're my son, more to me nor any son. I put away money, only for you to spend. When I was a hired-out shepherd in a solitary hut, not seeing no faces but faces of sheep till I half forgot what men's and women's faces was like, I seen yourn. I drops my knife many a time in that hut when I was a eatin' my dinner or my supper and I says, here's the boy again, looking at me, whilst I eats and drinks. I see you there a many times, as plain as ever I see you on them misty marshes. Lord strike me dead, I says each time, and I goes out in the air to say it under the open heavens. But what, if I gets liberty and money, I'll make that boy a gentleman. And I done it. Why, look at you, dear boy. Look at these here lodgings o' yourn, fit for a lord. A lord! Ha! You shall show money with lords for wagers, and beat em. In his heat and triumph, and in his knowledge that I had been nearly fainting, he did not remark on my reception of all this. It was the one grain of relief I had. Looky here! he went on, taking my watch out of my pocket, and turning towards him a ring on my finger, while I recoiled from his touch as if he had been a snake. A golden and a beauty! That's a gentleman's, I hope. A diamond all set round with rubies. That's a gentleman's, I hope. Look at your linen, fine and beautiful. Look at your clothes, better ain't to be got. And your books, too turning his eyes round the room, mounting up on their shelves by hundreds. And you read em, don't you? I see you've been a-readin' of em when I come in. Ha, 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 You shall read em to me, dear boy. 
and if they're in foreign languages what I don't understand, I shall be just as proud as if I did. Again he took both my hands and put them to his lips, while my blood ran cold within me. "'Don't you mind talking, Pip,' said he, after again drawing his sleeve over his eyes and forehead, as the click came in his throat which I well remembered, and he was all the more horrible to me that he was so much in earnest. "'You can't do better, nor keep quiet, dear boy. You ain't looked slowly forward to this as I have. You wasn't prepared for this as I was. But didn't you never think it might be me?' "'Oh, no, no, no,' I returned. "'Never, never!' "'Well, you see, it was me, and single-handed. Never a soul in it but my own self and Mr. Jaggers.' "'Was there no one else?' I asked. "'No,' said he, with a glance of surprise. "'Who else should there be? And, dear boy, how good-looking you have growed! There's bright eyes somewheres, eh? Isn't there bright eyes somewheres, what you love the thoughts on? Oh, Estella, Estella. They shall be yourn, dear boy, if money can buy em. Not the gentleman like you, so well set up as you, can't win em off of his own game. But money shall back you. Let me finish what I was a-telling you, dear boy. From that there hut— and that there hiring out, I got money left me by my master, which died and had been the same as me, and got my liberty and went for myself. In every single thing I went for, I went for you. Lord, strike a blight upon it, I says, whatever it was I went for, if it ain't for him. It all prospered wonderful. As I give you to understand just now, I'm famous for it. It was the money left me, and the gains of the first few year what I sent home to Mr. Jaggers, all for you, when he first come after you, agreeable to my letter. Oh, that he had never come, that he had left me at the forge, far from contented, yet, by comparison, happy. And then, dear boy, it was a recompense to me, looky here to know in secret that I was making a gentleman. The blood-horses of them colonists might fling up the dust over me as I was walking. What do I say? I says to myself, I'm making a better gentleman nor ever you'll be. When one of them says to another, he was a convict a few year ago, and is a ignorant common fellow now, for all he's lucky, what do I say? I says to myself, if I ain't a gentleman, nor yet ain't got no learning, I'm the owner of such. All of you own stock and land. Which of you owns a brought-up London gentleman? This way I kept myself a-going, and this way I held steady afore my mind that I would for certain come one day and see my boy and make myself known to him on his own ground. He laid his hand on my shoulder. I shuddered at the thought that for anything I knew his hand might be stained with blood. "'It warn't easy, Pip, for me to leave them parts, nor yet it warn't safe. But I held to it, and the harder it was, the stronger I held, for I was determined, and my mind firm made up. At last I done it. Dear boy, I done it. I tried to collect my thoughts, but I was stunned. Throughout I had seemed to myself to attend more to the wind and the rain than to him. Even now I could not separate his voice from those voices, though those were loud and his was silent. "'Where will you put me?' he asked presently. "'I must be put somewheres, dear boy.' Uh, "'To sleep?' said I. Yes, and to sleep long and sound, he answered, for I've been sea-tossed and sea-washed months and months. My friend and companion, said I, rising from the sofa, is absent. You must have his room. 
He won't come back to-morrow, will he?' "'No,' said I, answering almost mechanically, in spite of my utmost efforts. "'Not to-morrow.' "'Because, looky here, dear boy,' he said, dropping his voice and laying a long finger on my breast in an impressive manner, "'Caution is necessary.' "'How do you mean, caution?' "'By God, it's death.' "'What's death?' "'I was sent for life. It's death to come back. There's been overmuch coming back of late years, and I should of a certainty be hanged if took.' Nothing was needed but this. The wretched man, after loading wretched me with his gold and silver chains for years, had risked his life to come to me, and I held it there in my keeping. If I had loved him, instead of abhorring him, if I had been attracted to him by the strongest admiration and affection, instead of shrinking from him with the strongest repugnance, it could have been no worse. On the contrary, it would have been better, for his preservation would then have naturally and tenderly addressed my heart. My first care was to close the shutters, so that no light might be seen from without, and then to close and make fast the doors. While I did so, he stood at the table drinking rum and eating biscuit, and when I saw him thus engaged, I saw my convict on the marshes at his meal again. It almost seemed to me as if he must stoop down presently to file at his leg. When I had gone into Herbert's room, and had shut off any other communication between it and the staircase than through the room in which our conversation had been held, I asked him if he would go to bed. He said yes, but asked me for some of my gentleman's linen to put on in the morning. I brought it out and laid it ready for him, and my blood again ran cold when he again took me by both hands to give me good night. I got away from him, without knowing how I did it, and mended the fire in the room where we had been together, and sat down by it, afraid to go to bed. For an hour or more I remained too stunned to think, and it was not until I began to think that I began fully to know how wrecked I was, and how the ship in which I had sailed was gone to pieces. Miss Havisham's intentions towards me, all a mere dream. Estella, not designed for me. I only suffered in Satis House as a convenience, a sting for the greedy relations, a model with a mechanical heart to practice on when no other practice was at hand. Those were the first smarts I had. But sharpest and deepest pain of all, it was for the convict, guilty of I knew not what crimes, and liable to be taken out of those rooms where I sat thinking and hanged at the old Bailey door, that I had deserted Joe. I would not have gone back to Joe now, I would not have gone back to Biddy now, for any consideration, simply, I suppose, because my sense of my own worthless conduct to them was greater than every consideration. No wisdom on earth could have given me the comfort that I should have derived from their simplicity and fidelity, but I could never, never, undo what I had done. In every rage of wind and rush of rain I heard pursuers. Twice I could have sworn there was a knocking and whispering at the outer door. With these fears upon me I began either to imagine or recall that I had had mysterious warnings of this man's approach, that for weeks gone by I had passed faces in the streets which I had thought like his, that these likenesses had grown more numerous as he, coming over the sea, had drawn nearer, that his wicked spirit had somehow sent these messengers to mine, and that now on this stormy night he was as good as his word, and with me. Crowding up with these reflections came the reflection that I had seen him with my childish eyes to be a desperately violent man, that I had heard that other convict reiterate that he had tried to murder him, that I had seen him down in the ditch, tearing and fighting like a wild beast. Out of such remembrances I brought into the light of the fire a half-formed terror that it might not be safe to be shut up there with him in the dead of the wild, solitary night. 
This dilated until it filled the room, and impelled me to take a candle and go in and look at my dreadful burden. He had rolled a handkerchief round his head, and his face was set and lowering in his sleep. But he was asleep, and quietly too, though he had a pistol lying on the pillow. Assured of this, I softly removed the key to the outside of his door, and turned it on him before I again sat down by the fire. Gradually I slipped from the chair, and lay on the floor. When I awoke without having parted in my sleep with the perception of my wretchedness, the clocks of the eastward churches were striking five, the candles were wasted out, the fire was dead, and the wind and rain intensified the thick black darkness. This is the end of the second stage of Pip's expectations. End of chapter Chapter Forty of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter Forty. It was fortunate for me that I had to take precautions to ensure, so far as I could, the safety of my dreaded visitor, for, this thought pressing on me when I awoke, held other thoughts in a confused concourse at a distance. The impossibility of keeping him concealed in the chambers was self-evident. It could not be done, and the attempt to do it would inevitably engender suspicion. True. I had no avenger in my service now, but I was looked after by an inflammatory old female, assisted by an animated rag-bag whom she called her niece, and to keep a room secret from them would be to invite curiosity and exaggeration. They both had weak eyes, which I had long attributed to their chronically looking in at keyholes, and they were always at hand when not wanted. Indeed, that was their only reliable quality besides larceny. Not to get up a mystery with these people, I resolved to announce in the morning that my uncle had unexpectedly come from the country. This course I decided on while I was yet groping about in the darkness for the means of getting a light. Not stumbling on the means after all, I was fain to go out to the adjacent lodge and get the watchman there to come with his lantern. Now, in groping my way down the black staircase, I fell over something, and that something was a man crouching in a corner. As the man made no answer when I asked him what he did there, but eluded my touch in silence, I ran to the lodge and urged the watchman to come quickly, telling him of the incident on the way back. The wind being as fierce as ever, we did not care to endanger the light in the lantern by rekindling the extinguished lamps in the staircase, but we examined the staircase from the bottom to the top and found no one there. It then occurred to me as possible that the man might have slipped into my rooms, so, lighting my candle at the watchman's, and leaving him standing at the door, I examined them carefully, including the room in which my dreaded guest lay asleep. All was quiet, and assuredly no other man was in those chambers. It troubled me that there should have been a lurker on the stairs. On that night of all nights in the year, and I asked the watchman, on the chance of eliciting some hopeful explanation, as I handed him a dram at the door, whether he had admitted at his gate any gentleman who had perceptibly been dining out? Yes, he said, at different times of the night, three. One lived in Fountain Court, and the other two lived in the lane, and he had seen them all go home. Again, the only other man who dwelt in the house of which my chambers formed a part had been in the country for some weeks, and he certainly had not returned in the night, because we had seen his door with his seal on it as we came upstairs. "'The night being so bad, sir,' said the watchman, as he gave me back my glass, "'uncommon few have come in at my gate. 
Besides them three gentlemen that I have named, I don't call to mind another since about eleven o'clock, when a stranger asked for you. My uncle, I muttered. Yes. You saw him, sir? Yes, oh, yes. Likewise the person with him? Person with him, I replied. I judged the person to be with him, returned the watchman. The person stopped when he stopped to make inquiry of me, and the person took this way when he took this way. What sort of person? The watchman had not particularly noticed. He should say, a working person. To the best of his belief, he had a dust-coloured kind of clothes on, under a dark coat. The watchman made more light of the matter than I did, and naturally, not having my reason for attaching weight to it. When I had got rid of him, which I thought it well to do without prolonging explanations, my mind was much troubled by these two circumstances taken together. Whereas they were easy of innocent solution apart, as, for instance, some diner out or diner at home, who had not gone near this watchman's gate, might have strayed to my staircase and dropped asleep there, and my nameless visitor might have brought someone with him to show him the way. Still, joined, they had an ugly look to one as prone to distrust and fear as the changes of a few hours had made me. I lighted my fire, which burnt with a raw, pale flare at that time of the morning, and fell into a doze before it. I seemed to have been dozing a whole night when the clock struck six. As there was full an hour and a half between me and daylight, I dozed again, now waking up uneasily, with prolix conversations about nothing in my ears, now making thunder of the wind in the chimney, at length falling off into a profound sleep from which the daylight woke me with a start. All this time I had never been able to consider my own situation, nor could I do so yet. I had not the power to attend to it. I was greatly dejected and distressed, but in an incoherent wholesale sort of way. As to forming any plan for the future, I could as soon have formed an elephant. When I opened the shutters and looked out at the wet, wild morning, all of a leaden hue, when I walked from room to room, when I sat down again shivering before the fire, waiting for my laundress to appear, I thought how miserable I was, but hardly knew why, or how long I had been so, or on what day of the week I made the reflection, or even who I was that made it. At last the old woman and the niece came in the latter with a head not easily distinguishable from her dusty broom, and testified surprise at sight of me in the fire, to whom I imparted how my uncle had come in the night and was then asleep, and how the breakfast preparations were to be modified accordingly. Then I washed and dressed while they knocked the furniture about and made a dust, and so, in a sort of dream or sleep-waking, I found myself sitting by the fire again, waiting for him to come to breakfast. By and by his door opened and he came out. I could not bring myself to bear the sight of him, and I thought he had a worse look by daylight. "'I do not even know,' said I, speaking low as he took his seat at the table, "'by what name to call you. I have given out that you are my uncle.' "'That's it, dear boy. Call me uncle.' You assume some name, I suppose, on board ship? Yes, dear boy, I took the name of Provis. Do you mean to keep that name? Why, yes, dear boy, it's as good as another, unless you'd like another. What is your real name? I asked him in a whisper. Magwitch, he answered in the same tone, christened Abel. What were you brought up to be? A varmint, dear boy. He answered quite seriously, and used the word as if it denoted some profession. When you came into the temple last night, said I, pausing to wonder whether that could really have been last night, which seemed so long ago. Yes, dear boy. 
when you came in at the gate and asked the watchman the way here, had you any one with you? With me? No, dear boy. But there was some one there? I didn't take particular notice, he said dubiously, not knowing the ways of the place, but I think there was a person, too, come in alonger me. Are you known in London? I hope not, said he, giving his neck a jerk with his forefinger that made me turn hot and sick. Were you known in London once? Not over and above, dear boy. I was in the provinces, mostly. Were you tried in London? Which time? said he, with a sharp look. The last time. He nodded. First knowed Mr. Jaggers that way. Jaggers was for me. It was on my lips to ask him what he was tried for, but he took up a knife, gave it a flourish, and with the words, And what I'd done is worked out and paid for, fell to at his breakfast. He ate in a ravenous way that was very disagreeable, and all his actions were uncouth, noisy, and greedy. Some of his teeth had failed him since I saw him eat on the marshes, and as he turned his food in his mouth, and turned his head sideways to bring his strongest fangs to bear upon it, he looked terribly like a hungry old dog. If I had begun with any appetite, he would have taken it away, and I should have sat much as I did, repelled from him by an insurmountable aversion, and gloomily looking at the cloth. "'I'm a heavy grubber, dear boy,' he said, as a polite kind of apology when he made an end of his meal. "'But I always was. If it had been in my constitution to be a lighter grubber, I might have got into lighter trouble. Similarly, I must have my smoke. When I was first hired out as shepherd the other side of the world, it's my belief I should have turned into a melancholy mad sheep myself if I hadn't to have my smoke. As he said so, he got up from table, and putting his hand into the breast of the pea-coat he wore, brought out a short black pipe and a handful of loose tobacco of the kind that is called Negro Head. Having filled his pipe, he put the surplus tobacco back again, as if his pocket were a drawer. Then he took a live coal from the fire with the tongs and lighted his pipe at it, and then turned round on the hearth-rug with his back to the fire, and went through his favourite action of holding out both his hands for mine. "'And this,' said he, dandling my hands up and down in his, as he puffed at his pipe, "'and this is the gentleman what I made.' the real genuine one. It does me good fur to look at you, Pip. All I stipulate is to stand by and look at you, dear boy. I released my hands as soon as I could, and found that I was beginning slowly to settle down to the contemplation of my condition. What I was chained to, and how heavily, became intelligible to me, as I heard his hoarse voice and sat looking up at his furrowed bald head with its iron-gray hair at the sides. "'I mustn't see my gentleman a-footing it in the mire of the streets. There mustn't be no mud on his boots. My gentleman must have horses, Pip, horses to ride and horses to drive, and horses for his servant to ride and drive as well. Shall colonists have their horses? And blood-uns, if you please, good Lord!' And not my London gentleman? No, no. We'll show him another pair of shoes than that, Pip, won't us? He took out of his pocket a great thick pocket-book, bursting with papers, and tossed it on the table. There's something worth spending in that there book, dear boy. It's yourn. All I've got ain't mine. It's yourn. Don't you be afeard on it. There's more where that come from. I've come to the old country for to see my gentleman spend his money like a gentleman. That'll be my pleasure. My pleasure'll be for to see him do it. And blast you all! He wound up, looking round the room, and snapping his fingers once with a loud snap. Blast you every one, from the judge in his wig, to the colonist a-stirrin' up the dust, 
I'll show a better gentleman than the whole kit on you put together. Stop! said I, almost in a frenzy of fear and dislike. I want to speak to you. I want to know what is to be done. I want to know how you are to be kept out of danger, how long you are going to stay, what projects you have. Looky here, Pip, said he, laying his hand on my arm in a suddenly altered and subdued manner. First of all, looky here. I forgot myself half a minute ago. What I said was low. That's what it was, low. Looky here, Pip. Look over it. I ain't a-going to be low. First, I resumed, half groaning, what precautions can be taken against your being recognized and seized? No, dear boy, he said in the same tone as before. That don't go first. Lowness goes first. I ain't took so many year to make a gentleman, not without knowing what's due to him. Looky here, Pip. I was low. That's what I was, low. Look over it, dear boy. Some sense of the grimly ludicrous moved me to a fretful laugh as I replied, <laughs> I have looked over it. In heaven's name, don't harp upon it. Yes, but looky here, he persisted. Dear boy, I ain't come so fur, not fur to be low. Now, go on, dear boy. You was a saying. How are you to be guarded from the danger you have incurred? Well, dear boy, the, the danger ain't so great. Without I was informed again, the danger ain't so much to signify. There's Jaggers, and there's Wemmick, and there's you. Who else is there to inform? Is there no chance person who might identify you in the street? said I. Well, he returned, there ain't many nor yet I don't intend to advertise myself in the newspaper by the name of A.M. come back from Botany Bay, and years have rolled away, and who's to gain by it? Still, look ye here, Pip. If the danger had been fifty times as great, I should have come to see you, mind you, just the same. And how long do you remain? How long? said he, taking his black pipe from his mouth, and dropping his jaw as he stared at me. I'm not a-going back. I've come for good. Where are you to live? said I. What is to be done with you? Where will you be safe? Dear boy, he returned, there's disguising wigs can be bought for money, and there's hair powder and spectacles and black clothes, shorts and what not. Others has done it safe afore, and what others has done afore, others can do again. As to the where and how of living, dear boy, give me your own opinions on it. You take it smoothly now, said I, but you were very serious last night when you swore it was death. And so I swore it is death, said he, putting his pipe back in his mouth, and death by the rope in the open street not fur from this, and it's serious that you should fully understand it to be so. What then, when that's once done? Here I am. To go back now would be as bad as to stand ground. Worse. Besides, Pip, I'm here, because I've meant it by you, years and years. As to what I dare, I'm an old bird now, as has dared all manner of traps since first he was fledged, and I'm not afeard to perch upon a scarecrow. If there's death hid inside of it, there is, and let him come out, and I'll face him, and then I'll believe in him and not a four. And now let me have a look at my gentleman again. Once more he took me by both hands and surveyed me with an air of admiring proprietorship, smoking with great complacency all the while. It appeared to me that I could do no better than secure him some quiet lodging hard by, of which he might take possession when Herbert returned, whom I expected in two or three days. 
that the secret must be confided to Herbert as a matter of unavoidable necessity, even if I could have put the immense relief I should derive from sharing it with him out of the question, was plain to me. What it was by no means so plain to Mr. Provis, I resolved to call him by that name, who reserved his consent to Herbert's participation until he should have seen him and formed a favourable judgment of his physiognomy. "'And even then, dear boy,' said he, pulling a greasy little class black testament out of his pocket, "'we'll have him on his oath.' To state that my terrible patron carried this little black book about the world solely to swear people on in cases of emergency would be to state what I have never quite established, but this I can say— that I never knew him put it to any other use. The book itself had the appearance of having been stolen from some court of justice, and perhaps his knowledge of its antecedents, combined with his own experience in that wise, gave him a reliance on its powers as a sort of legal spell or charm. On this first occasion of his producing it, I recalled how he had made me swear fidelity in the churchyard long ago and how he had described himself last night as always swearing to his resolutions in his solitude. As he was at present dressed in a seafaring slop-suit, in which he looked as if he had some parrots and cigars to dispose of, I next discussed with him what dress he should wear. He cherished an extraordinary belief in the virtue of shorts as a disguise, and had in his own mind sketched a dress for himself that would have made him something between a dean and a dentist. It was with considerable difficulty that I won him over to the assumption of a dress more like a prosperous farmer's, and we arranged that he should cut his hair close and wear a little powder. Lastly, as he had not yet been seen by the laundress or her niece, he was to keep himself out of their view until his change of dress was made. It would seem a simple matter to decide on these precautions, but in my dazed, not to say distracted, state, it took so long that I did not get out to further them until two or three in the afternoon. He was to remain shut up in the chambers while I was gone, and was on no account to open the door. There being to my knowledge a respectable lodging-house in Essex Street, the back of which looked into the temple, and was almost within hail of my windows, I first of all repaired to that house, and was so fortunate as to secure the second floor for my uncle, Mr. Provis. I then went from shop to shop, making such purchases as were necessary to the change in his appearance. This business transacted, I turned my face, on my own account, to Little Britain. Mr. Jaggers was at his desk, but, seeing me enter, got up immediately and stood before his fire. "'Now, Pip,' said he, "'be careful.' "'I will, sir,' I returned, for coming along I had thought well of what I was going to say. "'Don't commit yourself,' said Mr. Jaggers, "'and don't commit any one. You understand, any one. Don't tell me anything. I don't want to know anything. I am not curious.' Of course I saw that he knew the man was come. "'I merely want, Mr. Jaggers,' said I, "'to assure myself that what I have been told is true. I have no hope of its being untrue, but at least I may verify it.' Mr. Jaggers nodded. "'But did you say told, or informed?' he asked me, with his head on one side, and not looking at me, but looking in a listening way at the floor. "'Told would seem to imply verbal communication. You can't have verbal communication with a man in New South Wales, you know.' "'I will say informed, Mr. Jaggers.' "'Good.' "'I have been informed by a person named Abel Magwitch that he is the benefactor so long unbeknown to me.' "'That is the man.' said Mr. Jaggers, in New South Wales. "'And only he?' said I. "'And only he?' said Mr. Jaggers. "'I am not so unreasonable, sir, as to think you at all responsible for my mistakes and wrong conclusions, but I always supposed it was Miss Havisham.' 
"'As you say, Pip,' returned Mr. Jaggers, turning his eyes upon me coolly, and taking a bite at his forefinger, "'I am not at all responsible for that.' "'And yet it looks so like it, sir,' I pleaded with a downcast heart. "'Not a particle of evidence, Pip,' said Mr. Jaggers, shaking his head and gathering up his skirts. "'Take nothing on its looks. Take everything on evidence. There's no better rule.' "'I have no more to say,' said I, with a sigh, after standing silent for a little while. I have verified my information, and there's an end. Han Magwitch, in New South Wales, having at last disclosed himself, said Mr. Jaggers, you will comprehend, Pip, how rigidly throughout my communication with you I have always adhered to the strict line of fact. There has never been the least departure from the strict line of fact. You are quite aware of that? Quite, sir. I communicated to Magwitch, in New South Wales, when he first wrote to me, from New South Wales, the caution that he must not expect me ever to deviate from the strict line of fact. I also communicated to him another caution. He appeared to me to have obscurely hinted in his letter at some distant idea he had of seeing you in England here. I cautioned him that I must hear no more of that that he was not at all likely to obtain a pardon, that he was expatriated for the term of his natural life, and that his presenting himself in this country would be an act of felony, rendering him liable to the extreme penalty of the law. "'I gave Magwitch that caution,' said Mr. Jaggers, looking hard at me. "'I wrote it to New South Wales. He guided himself by it, no doubt.' "'No doubt.' said I. "'I have been informed by Wemmick,' pursued Mr. Jaggers, still looking hard at me, "'that he has received a letter, under date Portsmouth, from a colonist of the name of Purvis, or—' "'Or Provis,' I suggested. "'Or Provis. Thank you, Pip. Perhaps it is Provis. Hmm. Perhaps you know it's Provis?' "'Yes,' said I. You know it's Provis. A letter, under date Portsmouth, from a colonist of the name of Provis, asking for the particulars of your address on behalf of Magwitch. Wemmick sent him the particulars, I understand, by return of post. Probably it is through Provis that you have received the explanation of Magwitch, in New South Wales? It came through Provis, I replied. Good day, Pip said Mr. Jaggers, offering his hand. Glad to have seen you. In writing by post to Magwitch, in New South Wales, or in communicating with him through Provis, have the goodness to mention that the particulars and vouchers of our long account shall be sent to you, together with the balance, for there is still a balance remaining. Good day, Pip. We shook hands and he looked hard at me as long as he could see me. I turned at the door, and he was still looking hard at me, while the two vile casts on the shelf seemed to be trying to get their eyelids open, and to force out of their swollen throats, "'Oh, what a man he is!' Wemmick was out, and though he had been at his desk, he could have done nothing for me. I went straight back to the temple, where I found the terrible Provis, drinking rum and water, and smoking negro head, in safety. Next day the clothes I had ordered all came home, and he put them on. Whatever he put on became him less, it dismally seemed to me, than what he had worn before. To my thinking there was something in him that made it hopeless to attempt to disguise him. The more I dressed him and the better I dressed him, the more he looked like the slouching fugitive on the marshes. This effect on my anxious fancy was partly referable, no doubt, to his old face and manner growing more familiar to me, but I believe, too, that he dragged one of his legs as if there were still a weight of iron on it, and that from head to foot there was convict in the very grain of the man. The influences of his solitary hut life were upon him besides, 
and gave him a savage air that no dress could tame. Added to these were the influences of his subsequent branded life among men, and, crowning all, his consciousness that he was dodging and hiding now. In all his ways of sitting and standing, and eating and drinking, of brooding about in a high-shouldered reluctant style, of taking out his great horn-handled jackknife and wiping it on his legs and cutting his food, of lifting light glasses and cups to his lips, as if they were clumsy pannikins, of chopping a wedge off his bread and soaking up with it the last fragments of gravy round and round his plate, as if to make the most of an allowance, and then drying his finger-ends on it and then swallowing it, in these ways and a thousand other small nameless instances arising every minute in the day, there was prisoner, felon, bondsman, plain as plain could be. It had been his own idea to wear that touch of powder, and I had conceded the powder after overcoming the shorts. But I can compare the effect of it, when on, to nothing but the probable effect of rouge upon the dead, so awful was the manner in which everything in him, that it was most desirable to repress, started through that thin layer of pretense, and seemed to come blazing out of the crown of his head. It was abandoned as soon as tried, and he wore his grizzled hair cut short. Words cannot tell what a sense I had, at the same time, of the dreadful mystery that he was to me. When he fell asleep of an evening, with his knotted hands clenching the sides of the easy-chair, and his bald head tattooed with deep wrinkles falling forward on his breast, I would sit and look at him, wondering what he had done, and loading him with all the crimes in the calendar, until the impulse was powerful on me to start up and fly from him. Every hour so increased my abhorrence of him, that I even think I might have yielded to this impulse in the first agonies of being so haunted, notwithstanding all he had done for me and the risk he ran, but for the knowledge of that Herbert must soon come back. Once I actually did start out of bed in the night, and began to dress myself in my worst clothes, hurriedly intending to leave him there with everything else I possessed, and enlist for India as a private soldier. I doubt if a ghost could have been more terrible to me, up in those lonely rooms in the long evenings and long nights, with the wind and the rain always rushing by. A ghost could not have been taken and hanged on my account, and the consideration that he could be, and the dread that he would be, were no small addition to my horrors. When he was not asleep, or playing a complicated kind of patience with a ragged pack of cards of his own, a game that I never saw before or since, and in which he recorded his winnings by sticking his jackknife into the table, when he was not engaged in either of these pursuits, he would ask me to read to him, "'Foreign language, dear boy!' While I complied, he, not comprehending a single word, would stand before the fire surveying me with the air of an exhibitor, and I would see him, between the fingers of the hand with which I shaded my face, appealing in dumb show to the furniture to take note of my proficiency. The imaginary student pursued by the misshapen creature he had impiously made was not more wretched than I, pursued by the creature who had made me, and recoiling from him with a stronger repulsion the more he admired me and the fonder he was of me. This is written of, I am sensible, as if it had lasted a year. It lasted about five days. Expecting Herbert all the time, I dared not go out, except when I took Provis for an airing after dark. At length, one evening when dinner was over and I had dropped into a slumber quite worn out, for my nights had been agitated and my rest broken by fearful dreams, I was roused by the welcome footstep on the staircase. Provis, who had been asleep too, staggered up at the noise I made, and in an instant I saw his jackknife shining in his hand. "'Quiet! It's Herbert!' I said, and Herbert came bursting in with the airy freshness of six hundred miles of France upon him. "'Handel, my dear fellow, how are you? And again, how are you? And again, how are you? 
I seem to have been gone a twelve-month. Why, so I must have been, for you have grown quite thin and pale. Handel, my— Hello! I beg your pardon. He was stopped in his running on, and in his shaking hands with me, by seeing Provis. Provis, regarding him with a fixed attention, was slowly putting up his jackknife, and groping in another pocket for something else. "'Herbert, my dear friend,' said I, shutting the double doors, while Herbert stood staring and wondering, "'something very strange has happened. This is a visitor of mine.' "'It's all right, dear boy,' said Provis, coming forward, with his little clasped black book, and then addressing himself to Herbert. "'Take it in your right hand. Lord strike you dead on the spot, if ever you split in any way some ever. Kiss it. Do so, as he wishes it, I said to Herbert. So Herbert, looking at me with a friendly uneasiness and amazement, complied, and Provis immediately shaking hands with him, said, Now you're on your oath, you know, and never believe me on mine if Pip shan't make a gentleman on you. End of chapter. Chapter 41 of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter 41. In vain should I attempt to describe the astonishment and disquiet of Herbert when he and I and Provis sat down before the fire and I recounted the whole of the secret. Enough that I saw my own feelings reflected in Herbert's face, and not least among them my repugnance towards the man who had done so much for me. What would alone have set a division between that man and us, if there had been no other dividing circumstance, was his triumph in my story. Saving his troublesome sense of having been low on one occasion since his return, on which point he began to hold forth to Herbert, the moment my revelation was finished, he had no perception of the possibility of my finding any fault with my good fortune. His boast that he had made me a gentleman, and that he had come to see me support the character on his ample resources, was made for me quite as much as for himself and that it was a highly agreeable boast to both of us, and that we must both be very proud of it, was a conclusion quite established in his own mind. "'Though looky here, Pip's comrade,' he said to Herbert, after having discourse for some time, "'I know very well that once, since I come back, for half a minute, I've been low. I said to Pip, I knowed as I had been low.' But don't you fret yourself on that score. I ain't made Pip a gentleman, and Pip ain't a going to make you a gentleman, not for me not to know what's due to you both. Dear boy, and Pip's comrade, you two may count upon me always having a genteel muzzle on. Muzzled I have been since that half a minute when I was betrayed into lowness. Muzzled I am at the present time. Muzzled I ever will be. Herbert said, Certainly, but looked as if there were no specific consolation in this, and remained perplexed and dismayed. We were anxious for the time when he would go to his lodging and leave us together, but he was evidently jealous of leaving us together, and sat late. It was midnight before I took him round to Essex Street, and saw him safely in at his own dark door. When it closed upon him, I experienced the first moment of relief I had known since the night of his arrival. Never quite free from an uneasy remembrance of the man on the stairs, I had always looked about me in taking my guest out after dark, and in bringing him back, and I looked about me now. Difficult as it is in a large city to avoid the suspicion of being watched, when the mind is conscious of danger in that regard, 
I could not persuade myself that any of the people within sight cared about my movements. The few who were passing passed on their several ways, and the street was empty when I turned back into the temple. Nobody had come out at the gate with us, nobody went in at the gate with me. As I crossed by the fountain, I saw his lighted back windows looking bright and quiet, and, when I stood for a few moments in the doorway of the building where I lived, before going up the stairs, Garden Court was as still and lifeless as the staircase was when I ascended it. Herbert received me with open arms, and I had never felt before so blessedly what it is to have a friend. When he had spoken some sound words of sympathy and encouragement, we sat down to consider the question, what was to be done? The chair that Provis had occupied still remaining where it had stood, for he had a barrack way with him of hanging about one spot, in an unsettled manner, and going through one round of observances with his pipe and his negro head and his jackknife and his pack of cards, and what not, as if it were all put down for him on a slate. I say his chair remaining where it had stood, Herbert unconsciously took it, but next moment started out of it, pushed it away, and took another. He had no occasion to say after that that he had had conceived an aversion for my patron, neither had I occasion to confess my own. We interchanged that confidence without shaping a syllable. What, said I to Herbert when he was safe in another chair, what is to be done? My poor dear Handel, he replied, holding his head, I am too stunned to think. So was I, Handel, when the blow first fell. Still, something must be done. He is intent upon various new expenses, horses and carriages and lavish appearances of all kinds. He must be stopped somehow. You mean that you can't accept? How can I? I interposed as Herbert paused. Think of him. Look at him. An involuntary shudder passed over both of us. Yet I am afraid the dreadful truth is, Herbert, that he is attached to me, strongly attached to me. Was there ever such a fate? My poor dear Handel, Herbert repeated. Then, said I, after all, stopping short here, never taking another penny from him, think what I owe him already. Then again I am heavily in debt, very heavily for me who have now no expectations, and I have been bred to no calling, and I am fit for nothing. "'Well, well, well,' Herbert remonstrated. "'Don't say fit for nothing. "'What am I fit for? "'I know only one thing that I am fit for, and that is to go for a soldier. "'And I might have gone, my dear Herbert, but for the prospect of taking counsel with your friendship and affection.' "'Of course I broke down there.' and of course Herbert, beyond seizing a warm grip of my hand, pretended not to know it. "'Anyhow, my dear Handel,' said he presently, "'soldiering won't do. If you were to renounce this patronage and these favours, I suppose you would do so with some faint hope of one day repaying what you have already had. Not very strong, that hope, if you went soldiering. Besides, it's absurd.' You would be infinitely better in Clarriker's house, small as it is. I am working up towards a partnership, you know. Poor fellow! He little suspected with whose money. But there is another question, said Herbert. This is an ignorant, determined man who has long had one fixed idea. More than that, he seems to me, I may misjudge him, to be a man of desperate and fierce character. I know he is, I returned. Let me tell you what evidence I have seen of it. And I told him what I had not mentioned in my narrative, of that encounter with the other convict. See, then, said Herbert, think of this. He comes here at the peril of his life for the realization of his fixed idea. In the moment of realization, after all his toil and waiting, you cut the ground from under his feet, destroy his idea, and make his gains worthless to him. Do you see nothing that he might do under the disappointment? I have seen it, Herbert, and dreamed of it, 
ever since the fatal night of his arrival. Nothing has been in my thoughts so distinctly as his putting himself in the way of being taken. Then you may rely upon it, said Herbert, that there would be great danger of his doing it. That is his power over you as long as he remains in England, and that would be his reckless course if you forsook him. I was so struck by the horror of this idea, which had weighed upon me from the first, and the working out of which would make me regard myself, in some sort, as his murderer, that I could not rest in my chair, but began pacing to and fro. I said to Herbert, meanwhile, that even if Provis were recognized and taken, in spite of himself, I should be wretched as the cause, however innocently. Yes, even though I was so wretched in having him at large and near me, and even though I would far rather have worked at the forge all the days of my life than I would ever have come to this. But there was no staving off the question, what was to be done? The first and the main thing to be done, said Herbert, is to get him out of England. You will have to go with him, and then he might be induced to go. But get him where I will, could I prevent his coming back? My good Handel, is it not obvious that with Newgate in the next street there must be far greater hazard in your breaking your mind to him, and making him reckless here, than elsewhere? If a pretext to get him away could be made out of that other convict, or out of anything else in his life now. There again, said I, stopping before Herbert with my open hands held out, as if they contained the desperation of the case. I know nothing of his life. It has almost made me mad to sit here of a night, and see him before me, so bound up with my fortunes and misfortunes, and yet so unknown to me, except as the miserable wretch who terrified me two days in my childhood. Herbert got up, and linked his arm in mine, and we slowly walked to and fro together, studying the carpet. Handel said Herbert, stopping. You feel convinced that you can take no further benefits from him, do you? Fully. Surely you would, too, if you were in my place. And you feel convinced that you must break with him? Herbert, can you ask me? And you have, and are bound to have, that tenderness for the life he has risked on your account, that you must save him, if possible, from throwing it away. Then you must get him out of England before you stir a finger to extricate yourself. That done, extricate yourself in heaven's name, and we'll see it out together, dear old boy. It was a comfort to shake hands upon it, and walk up and down again with only that done. Now, Herbert, said I, with reference to gaining some knowledge of his history, there is but one way that I know of, I must ask him point-blank. Yes, ask him, said Herbert, when we sit at breakfast in the morning. For he had said, on taking leave of Herbert, that he would come to breakfast with us. With this project formed, we went to bed. I had the wildest dreams concerning him, and woke unrefreshed. I woke, too, to recover the fear which I had lost in the night, of his being found out as a returned transport. Waking, I never lost that fear. He came round at the appointed time, took out his jack-knife, and sat down to his meal. He was full of plans for his gentleman's coming out strong and like a gentleman, and urged me to begin speedily upon the pocket-book which he had left in my possession. He considered the chambers and his own lodging as temporary residences, and advised me to look out at once for a fashionable crib near Hyde Park, in which he could have a shake-down. When he had made an end of his breakfast, and was wiping his knife on his leg, I said to him, without a word of preface, "'After you were gone last night, I told my friend of the struggle that the soldiers found you engaged in on the marshes when we came up. You remember?' "'Remember?' said he. "'I think so.' "'We want to know something about that man.' and about you. It is strange to know no more about either, and particularly you, than I was able to tell last night. Is not this as good a time as another for our knowing more?' "'Well,' 
he said, after consideration. "'You're on your oath, you know, Pips Conrad.' "'Assuredly,' replied Herbert. "'As to anything I say, you know,' he insisted, "'the oath applies to all.' "'I understand it to do so.' "'And looky here. Whatever I done is worked out and paid for,' he insisted again. "'So be it.' He took out his black pipe, and was going to fill it with negro head, when, looking at the tangle of tobacco in his hand, he seemed to think it might perplex the thread of his narrative. He put it back again, stuck his pipe in a buttonhole of his coat, spread a hand on each knee, and after turning an angry eye on the fire for a few silent moments, looked round at us, and said what follows. End of chapter Chapter Forty Two of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter Forty Two. Dear Boy. And Pip's comrade, I am not a goin for to tell you my life like a song or a story book, but to give it to you short and handy, I'll put it once into a mouthful of English, in jail and out of jail, in jail and out of jail, in jail and out of jail. There you've got it. That's my life, pretty much, down to such times as I got shipped off. Arter Pib stood my friend. I've been done everything, too, pretty well, except hanged. I've been locked up as much as a silver tea-kettle. I've been carted here and carted there, and put out of this town and put out of that town, and stuck in the stocks and whipped and worried and drove. I've no more notion where I was born than you have, if so much. I first became aware of myself down in Essex, a thieving turnips for my living. Some in had run away from me, a man, a tinker, and he took the fire with him and left me very cold. I knowed my name to be Magwitch, christened Abel. How did I know it? Much as I knowed the birds' names in the hedges to be Chaffinch, Sparrow, Thrush, I might have thought it was all lies together, only as the birds' names come out true, I supposed mine did. So fur as I could find, there warn't a soul that see young Abel Magwitch with us little on him as in him, but what caught fright at him, and either drove him off or took him up. I was took up, took up, took up to that extent that I regularly growed up, took up. This is the way it was, that when I was a ragged little creature as much to be pitied as ever I see, not that I looked in the glass, for there weren't many insides of furnished houses known to me. I got the name of being hardened. This is a terrible hardened one, they says to prison visitors, picking out me. May be said to live in jails, this boy. Then they looked at me, and I looked at them, and they measured my head, some on em. They had better a measured my stomach and others on em give me tracts what I couldn't read, made me speeches what I couldn't understand. They always went on again me about the devil. But what the devil was I to do? I must put something into my stomach, mustn't I? Howsomever, I'm a-getting low, and I know what's due. Dear boy and Pip's comrade, don't you be afeard of me being low. Tramping, begging, thieving, working sometimes when I could, though that warn't as often as you may think, till you put the question whether you would have been over ready to give me work yourselves. A bit of a poacher, a bit of a labourer, a bit of a wagoner, a bit of a haymaker, a bit of a hawker, a bit of most things that don't pay and lead to trouble, 
I got to be a man. A deserting soldier in a traveller's rest, what lay hid up to the chin under a load of taters, learnt me to read. And a travelling giant, what signed his name at a penny a time, learnt me to write. I warn't locked up as often now as formerly, but I wore out my good share of key metal still. At Epsom races, a matter of over twenty years ago, I got acquainted with a man whose skull I'd crack with his poker, like the claw of a lobster, if I got it on this hob. His right name was Compison, and that's the man, dear boy, what you see me a poundin' in the ditch, according to what you truly told your comrade arter I was gone last night. He set up for a gentleman, this Compison, and he'd been to a public boarding school and had learnin'. He was a smooth one to talk, and was a dab at the way of gentlefolks. He was good-looking, too. It was the night afore the great race when I found him on the heath, in a booth that I'd knowed on. Him and some more was a sitting among the tables when I went in, and the landlord, which had a knowledge of me and was a sporting one, called him out and said, I think this is a man that might suit you meaning I was. Compison, he looks at me very noticing, and I look at him. He has a watch and a chain and a ring and a breast pin and a handsome suit of clothes. To judge from appearances, you're out of luck, says Compison to me. Yes, master, and I've never been in it much. I had come out of Kingston jail last on a vagrancy committal. Not but what it might have been for something else, but it warn't. Luck changes, says Compison. Perhaps yours is going to change. I says, I hope it may be so. There's room. What can you do, says Compison. Eat and drink, I says, if you'll find the materials. Compison laughed, looked at me again very noticing. Give me five shillings and appointed me for next night, same place. I went to Compison next night, same place, and Compison took me on to be his man and partner. And what was Compison's business in which we was to go partners? Compison's business was the swindling, handwriting forging, stolen banknote passing, and such like. All sorts of traps as Compison could set with his head, and keep his own legs out of, and get the profits from, and let another man in for, was Compison's business. He'd no more heart than an iron file. He was as cold as death, and he had the head of the devil aforementioned. There was another in with Compison, as was called Arthur, not as being so christened, but as a surname. He was in a decline, and was a shadow to look at. Him and Compison had been in a bad thing with a rich lady some years afore, and they'd made a pot of money by it. But Compison betted and gamed, and he'd have run through the king's taxes. So Arthur was a dying, and a dying poor, and with the horrors on him, and Compison's wife, which Compison kicked mostly, was a having pity on him when she could, and Compison was having pity on nothing and no body. I might have took warning by Arthur, but I didn't, and I won't pretend I was particular, for where be the good on it, dear boy and comrade? So I begun with Compison, and a poor tool I was in his hands. Arthur lived at the top of Compison's house, over nigh Brentford it was, and Compison kept a careful account again him for board and lodging, in case he should ever get better to work it out. But Arthur soon settled the account. The second or third time as ever I see him, he come a tearin' down into Compison's parlour late at night, in only a flannel gown, with his hair all in a sweat, and he says to Compison's wife, Sally, she really is upstairs a longer me now, and I can't get rid of her. She's all in white, he says with white flowers in her hair, and she's awful mad, and she's got a shroud hanging over her arm, 
and she says she'll put it on me at five in the morning. Says Compeyson, Why, you fool, don't you know she's got a living body? And how should she be up there, without coming through the door, or in at the window, and up the stairs? I don't know how she's there, says Arthur, shaking dreadful with the horrors, but she's standing in the corner at the foot of the bed, awful mad and over where her heart's broke, you broke it. There's drops of blood. Compeyson spoke hardy, but he was always a coward. Go up alonger this drivelin' sick man, he says to his wife, and Magwitch, lend her a hand, will ye? And he never come nigh himself. Compeyson's wife and me took him up to bed again, and he raved most dreadful. Why, look at her! he cries out. She's a-shaking the shroud at me. Don't you see her? Look at her eyes. Ain't it awful to see her so mad? Next he cries. She'll put it on me, and then I'm done for. Take it away from her, take it away. And then he catched hold of us, and kept on a-talking to her, and answering of her, till I half-believed I see her myself. Compeyson's wife, being used to him, gave him some liquor to get the horrors off, and by and by he quieted. Ho, oh, she's gone. Has her helper been for her? he says. Yes, says Compeyson's wife. Did you tell him to lock her and bar her in? Yes. And to take that ugly thing away from her? Yes, yes, all right. You're a good creature, he says and don't leave me whatever you do, and thank you. He rested pretty quiet till it might want a few minutes of five, and then he starts up with a scream and screams out, Here she is! She's got the shroud again. She's unfolding it. She's coming out of the corner. She's coming to the bed. Hold me, both on you, one on each side. Don't let her touch me with it. Ha! She missed me that time. Don't let her throw it over my shoulders. Don't let her lift me up to get it round me. She's lifting me up. Keep me down. Then he lifted himself up hard and was dead. Cobbison took it easy as a good riddance for both sides. Him and me was soon busy, and first he swore me, being ever artful, on my own book. Dis here little black book, dear boy what I swore your comrade on. Not to go into the things that Compeyson planned, and I done, which would take a week, I'll simply say to you, dear boy, and Pip's comrade, that that man got me into such nets as made me his black slave. I was always in debt to him, always under his thumb, always a working, always a getting into danger. He was younger than me, but he got craft, and he got learning, and he overmatched me five hundred times told, and no mercy. My missus, as I had the hard time with, stop, though, I ain't brought her in. He looked about him in a confused way, as if he had lost his place in the book of his remembrance, and he turned his face to the fire, and spread his hands broader on his knees, and lifted them off and put them on again. "'There ain't no need to go into it,' he said, looking round once more. "'The time with Compeyson was almost as hard a time as ever I had. "'That said, all said. "'Did I tell you as I was tried, alone, for misdemeanor, while with Compeyson?' "'I answered, no.' "'Well,' he said, "'I was, and got convicted. "'As to took up on suspicion,' That was twice or three times in the four or five years that it lasted, but evidence was wanting. At last, me and Compeyson was both committed for felony, on a charge of putting stolen notes in circulation, and there was other charges behind. Compeyson says to me, separate defences, no communication, and that was all. And I was so miserable poor that I sold all the clothes I had except what hung on my back, 
afore I could get jaggers. When we was put in on the dock, I noticed first of all what a gentleman Compeyson looked, with his curly hair and his black clothes and his white pocket handkerchief, and what a common sort of wretch I looked. When the prosecution opened and the evidence was put short aforehand, I noticed how heavy it all bore on me, and how light on him. When the evidence was give in the box, I noticed how it was always me that had come forward, and could be swore to, how it was always me that the money had been paid to, how it was always me that it seemed to work the thing and get the profit. But when the defence come on, then I see the plan plainer, for, says the counsellor for Compeyson, my lord and gentlemen, here you has afore you, side by side, two persons as your eyes can separate wide, one, the younger, well brought up, who will be spoke to as such, one, the elder, ill brought up, who will be spoke to as such, one, the younger, seldom have ever seen of these here transactions, and only suspected, the other, the elder, always seen in em, and always with his guilt brought home. Can you doubt, if there is but one in it, which is the one, and, if there is two in it, which is much the worst one? And such like. And when it come to character, weren't it compeyson as had been to the school, and warn it his schoolfellows as was in this position and in that, and warn it him as had been knowed by witnesses in such clubs and societies, and now to his disadvantage, and warn it me as had been tried afore, and has been knowed up hill and down dale in bridewells and lock-ups, and when it come to speech-making, warn it Compeyson as could speak to him with his face dropping every now and then into his white pocket handkercher. Ha! and with verses in his speech, too. And warn't it me as could only say, Gentlemen, this man at my side is a most precious rascal. And when the verdict come, warn't it Compeyson as was recommended to mercy on account of good character and bad company, and giving up all the information he could again me. And warn't it me as got never a word but guilty. And when I says to Compeyson, once out of this court, I'll smash that face of yourn. Ain't it Compeyson as prays the judge to be protected, and gets two turnkeys stood betwixt us? And when we're sentenced, ain't it him as gets seven year, and me fourteen? And ain't it him as the judge is sorry for, because he might have done so well? And ain't it me as the judge perceives to be an old offender of violent passion, likely to come to worse. He had worked himself into a state of great excitement, but he checked it, took two or three short breaths, swallowed as often, and stretching out his hand toward me, said in a reassuring manner, I ain't a-going to be low, dear boy. He had so heated himself that he took out his handkerchief and wiped his face and head and neck and hands before he could go on. I had said to Compeyson that I'd smash that face of his, and I swore Lord smash mine to do it. We was in the same prison ship, but I couldn't get at him for long, though I tried. At last I come behind him and hit him on the cheek to turn him round and get a smashin' one at him when I was seen and seized. The black hole of that ship warn't a strong one, to a judge of black holes that could swim and dive, I escaped to the shore, and I was a-hiding among the graves there, envying them as was in em and all over, when I first seen my boy. He regarded me with a look of affection that made him almost abhorrent to me again, though I had felt great pity for him. By my boy I was give to understand as Compeyson was out on them marshes too. Upon my soul I half believe he escaped in his terror, to get quit of me, not knowing it was me as had got ashore. I hunted him down. I smashed his face. And now, says I, as the worst thing I can do, caring nothing for myself, 
I'll drag you back. And I'd have swum off, towing him by the hair, if it had come to that, and I'd have got him aboard without the soldiers. Of course, he'd much the best of it to the last. His character was so good. He had escaped when he had made half wild by me and my murderous intentions, and his punishment was light. I was put in irons, brought to trial again, and sent for life. I didn't stop for life, dear boy, and Pip's comrade, being here. He wiped himself again, as he had done before, and then slowly took his tangle of tobacco from his pocket, and plucked his pipe from its buttonhole, and slowly filled it, and began to smoke. "'Is he dead?' I asked, after a silence. "'Is who dead, dear boy?' Compison. "'He hopes I am, if he's alive, you may be sure,' with a fierce look. I never heard no more of him. Herbert had been writing with his pencil in the cover of a book. He softly pushed the book over to me, as Provis stood smoking with his eyes on the fire, and I read in it. Young Havisham's name was Arthur. Compison is the man who professed to be Miss Havisham's lover. I shut the book, and nodded slightly to Herbert, and put the book by but we neither of us said anything, and both looked at Provis as he stood smoking by the fire. End of chapter Chapter 43 of Great Expectations This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens Chapter 43 Why should I pause to ask how much of my shrinking from Provis might be traced to Estella? Why should I loiter on my road, to compare the state of mind in which I had tried to rid myself of the stain of the prison before meeting her at the coach-office, with a state of mind in which I now reflected on the abyss between Estella in her pride and beauty, and the returned transport whom I harboured. The road would be none the smoother for it, the end would be none the better for it, he would not be helped, nor I extenuated. A new fear had been engendered in my mind by his narrative, or rather his narrative had given form and purpose to the fear that was already there. If Compeyson were alive and should discover his return, I could hardly doubt the consequence. That Compeyson stood in mortal fear of him, neither of the two could know much better than I, and that any such man as that man had been described to be would hesitate to release himself for good from a dreaded enemy by the safe means of becoming an informer, was scarcely to be imagined. Never had I breathed, and never would I breathe, or so I resolved, a word of Estella to Provis. But I said to Herbert that, before I could go abroad, I must see both Estella and Miss Havisham. This was when we were left alone on the night of the day when Provis told us his story. I resolved to go out to Richmond next day, and I went. On my presenting myself at Mrs. Branley's, Estella's maid was called to tell that Estella had gone into the country. Where? to Saddis House, as usual. Not as usual, I said, for she had never yet gone there without me. When was she coming back? There was an air of reservation in the answer which increased my perplexity, and the answer was that her maid believed she was only coming back at all for a little while. I could make nothing of this, except that it was meant that I should make nothing of it, and I went home again in complete discomfiture. Another night consultation with Herbert after Provis was gone home, I always took him home, and always looked well about me, led us to the conclusion that nothing should be said about going abroad until I came back from Miss Havisham's. In the meantime, Herbert and I were to consider separately what it would be best to say, whether we should devise any pretense of being afraid that he was under 
suspicious observation, or whether I, who had never yet been abroad, should propose an expedition. We both knew that I had but to propose anything, and he would consent. We agreed that his remaining many days in his present hazard was not to be thought of. Next day I had the meanness to feign that I was under a binding promise to go down to Joe, but I was capable of almost any meanness towards Joe or his name. Provis was to be strictly careful while I was gone, and Herbert was to take the charge of him that I had taken. I was to be absent only one night, and on my return the gratification of his impatience for my starting as a gentleman on a greater scale was to be begun. It occurred to me then, and as I afterwards found to Herbert also, that he might be best got away across the water on that pretense, as to make purchases or the like. Having thus cleared the way for my expedition to Miss Havisham's, I set off by the early morning coach before it was yet light, and was out on the open country road when the day came creeping on, halting and whimpering and shivering, and wrapped in patches of cloud and rags of mist, like a beggar. When we drove up to the Blue Boar after a drizzly ride, whom should I see come out under the gateway, toothpick in hand, to look at the coach, but Bentley Drummle? As he pretended not to see me, I pretended not to see him. It was a very lame pretense on both sides, the lamer because we both went into the coffee-room, where he had just finished his breakfast, and where I ordered mine. It was poisonous to me to see him in the town, for I very well knew why he had come there. Pretending to read a smeary newspaper long out of date, which had nothing half so legible in its local news as the foreign matter of coffee, pickles, fish sauces, gravy, melted butter, and wine with which it was sprinkled all over, as if it had taken the measles in a highly irregular form, I sat at my table while he stood before the fire. By degrees it became an enormous injury to me that he stood before the fire. And I got up, determined to have my share of it. I had to put my hand behind his legs for the poker when I went up to the fireplace to stir the fire, but still pretended not to know him. "'Is this a cut?' said Mr. Drummle. "'Oh,' said I, poker in hand, "'it's you, is it? How do you do? I was wondering who it was who kept the fire off.' With that I poked tremendously, and having done so, planted myself side by side with Mr. Drummle, my shoulders squared and my back to the fire. "'You have just come down,' said Mr. Drummle, edging me a little away with his shoulder. "'Yes,' said I, edging him a little away with my shoulder. "'Beastly place,' said Drummle. "'You're part of the country, I think.' "'Yes,' I assented. "'I am told it's very like your Shropshire.' "'Not in the least like it.' said Drummle. Here Mr. Drummle looked at his boots, and I looked at mine, and then Mr. Drummle looked at my boots, and I looked at his. "'Have you been here long?' I asked, determined not to yield an inch of the fire. "'Long enough to be tired of it,' <sighs> returned Drummle, pretending to yawn, but equally determined. "'Do you stay here long?' "'Can't say.' answered Mr. Drummle. "'Do you?' "'Can't say,' said I. I felt here, through a ting in my blood, that if Mr. Drummle's shoulder had claimed another hair's breadth of room, I should have jerked him into the window. Equally, that if my own shoulder had urged a similar claim, Mr. Drummle would have jerked me into the nearest box. He whistled a little. So did I. "'Large tract of marshes about here, I believe,' said Drummle. "'Yes. What of that?' said I. Mr. Drummle looked at me, and then at my boots, and said, "'Ho! Oh. ha! <laughs> and laughed. "'Are you amused, Mr. Drummle?' "'No,' said he. "'Not particularly. I am going out for a ride in the saddle. I mean to explore those marshes for amusement.' Out of the way villages there, they tell me. Curious little public houses, and smithies, and that. Waiter! Yes, sir. Is that horse of mine ready? 
brought round to the door, sir. I say, look here, you, sir. The lady won't ride today. The weather won't do. Very good, sir. And I don't dine because I'm going to dine at the ladies. Very good, sir. Then Drummle glanced at me with an insolent triumph on his great jowled face that cut me to the heart, dull as he was, and so exasperated me that I felt inclined to take him in my arms, as the robber in the story-book is said to have taken the old lady, and seat him on the fire. One thing was manifest to both of us, and that was, that until relief came, neither of us could relinquish the fire. There we stood, well squared up before it, shoulder to shoulder and foot to foot, with our hands behind us, not budging an inch. The horse was visible outside in the drizzle at the door. My breakfast was put on the table. Drummle's was cleared away. The waiter invited me to begin. I nodded. We both stood our ground. "'Have you been to the grove since?' said Drummle. "'No,' said I. I had quite enough of the finches the last time I was there. Was that when we had a difference of opinion? Yes, I replied very shortly. Come, come, they let you off easily enough, sneered Drummle. You shouldn't have lost your temper. Mr. Drummle, said I, you are not competent to give advice on that subject. When I lose my temper— not that I admit having done so on that occasion. I don't throw glasses. I do, said Drummle. After glancing at him once or twice, in an increased state of smouldering ferocity, I said, Mr. Drummle, I did not seek this conversation, and I don't think it an agreeable one. I am sure it's not, said he, superciliously over his shoulder. I don't think anything about it. And therefore, I went on, with your leave I will suggest that we hold no kind of communication in future. Quite my opinion, said Drummle, and what I should have suggested myself, or done, more likely, without suggesting. But don't lose your temper. Have you lost enough without that? What do you mean, sir? Waiter, said Drummle, by way of answering me. The waiter reappeared. Look here, you, sir. You quite understand that the young lady don't ride today, and that I dine at the young lady's? Quite so, sir. When the waiter had felt my fast-cooling teapot with the palm of his hand, and had looked imploringly at me, and had gone out, Drummle, careful not to move the shoulder next me, took a cigar from his pocket and bit the end off, but showed no sign of stirring. Choking and boiling as I was, I felt that we could not go a word further without introducing Estella's name, which I could not endure to hear him utter, and therefore I looked stonily at the opposite wall, as if there were no one present, and forced myself to silence. How long we might have remained in this ridiculous position, it is impossible to say, but for the incursion of three thriving farmers, laid on by the waiter, I think— who came into the coffee-room unbuttoning their greatcoats and rubbing their hands, and before whom, as they charged at the fire, we were obliged to give way. I saw him through the window, seizing his horse's mane, and mounting in his blundering, brutal manner, and sidling and backing away. I thought he was gone, when he came back, asking for a light for the cigar in his mouth, which he had forgotten. A man in a dust-coloured dress appeared with what was wanted, I could not have said from where, whether from the inn-yard or the street or where not, and as Drummle leaned down from the saddle and lighted his cigar and laughed, with a jerk of his head towards the coffee-room windows, the slouching shoulders and ragged hair of this man whose back was toward me reminded me of Orlick. Too heavily out of sorts to care much at the time whether it were he or no, or after all to touch the breakfast, I washed the weather and the journey from my face and hands, and went out to the memorable old house that it would have been so much the better for me never to have entered, never to have seen. End of chapter
Chapter Forty Four of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter Forty Four. In the room where the dressing table stood, and where the wax candles burnt on the wall, I found Miss Havisham and Estella. Miss Havisham seated on a settee near the fire, and Estella on a cushion at her feet. Estella was knitting, and Miss Havisham was looking on. They both raised their eyes as I went in, and both saw an alteration in me. I derived that from the look they interchanged. "'And what wind?' said Miss Havisham. "'Blows you here, Pip!' Though she looked steadily at me, I saw that she was rather confused. Estella, pausing a moment in her knitting with her eyes upon me, and then going on, I fancied that I read in the action of her fingers, as plainly as if she had told me in the dumb alphabet, that she perceived I had discovered my real benefactor. "'Miss Havisham,' said I, I went to Richmond yesterday to speak to Estella, and finding that same wind had blown her here, I followed. Miss Havisham motioning to me for the third or fourth time to sit down, I took the chair by the dressing-table, which I had often seen her occupy. With all that ruin at my feet and about me, it seemed a natural place for me that day. What I had to say to Estella, Miss Havisham, I will say before you, presently, in a few moments. It will not surprise you. It will not displease you. I am as unhappy as you can ever have meant me to be. Miss Havisham continued to look steadily at me. I could see in the action of Estella's fingers as they worked that she attended to what I said, but she did not look up. I have found out who my patron is. It is not a fortunate discovery and it is not likely ever to enrich me in reputation, station, fortune, or anything. There are reasons why I must say no more of that. It is not my secret, but another's. As I was silent for a while, looking at Estella and considering how to go on, Miss Havisham repeated, "'It is not your secret, but another's? Well?' "'When you first caused me to be brought here, Miss Havisham,' when I belonged to the village over yonder, that I wish I had never left, I suppose I did really come here, as any other chance boy might have come, as a kind of servant, to gratify a want or a whim, and to be paid for it? Ay, Pip, replied Miss Havisham, steadily nodding her head, you did. And that Mr. Jaggers, Mr. Jaggers, said Miss Havisham, taking me up in a firm tone, had nothing to do with it, and knew nothing of it. His being my lawyer, and his being the lawyer of your patron, is a coincidence. He holds the same relation towards numbers of people, and it might easily arise. Be that as it may, it did arise, and was not brought about by any one." Any one might have seen in her haggard face that there was no suppression or evasion so far. But when I fell into the mistake I have so long remained in, at least you led me on? said I. Yes, she returned, again nodding steadily. I let you go on. Was that kind? Who am I? cried Miss Havisham, striking her stick upon the floor, and flashing into wrath so suddenly that Estella glanced up at her in surprise. "'Who am I, for God's sake, that I should be kind?' It was a weak complaint to have made, and I had not meant to make it. I told her so, as she sat brooding after this outburst. "'Well, well, well,' she said. "'What else?' I was liberally paid for my old attendance here, I said, to soothe her, in being apprenticed, and I have asked these questions only for my own information. What follows has another, and I hope more disinterested, purpose. 
In humouring my mistake, Miss Havisham, you punished, practised on, Perhaps you will supply whatever term expresses your intention, without offence, your self-seeking relations? I did. Why, they would have it so. So would you. What has been my history that I should be at the pains of entreating either them or you not to have it so? You made your own snares. I never made them. Waiting until she was quiet again, for this, too, flashed out of her in a wild and sudden way, I went on. I have been thrown among one family of your relations, Miss Havisham, and have been constantly among them since I went to London. I know them to have been as honestly under my delusion as I myself, and I should be false and base if I did not tell you whether it is acceptable to you or no, and whether you are inclined to give credence to it or not that you deeply wrong both Mr. Matthew Pocket and his son Herbert, if you suppose them to be otherwise than generous, upright, open, and incapable of anything designing or mean. "'They are your friends,' said Miss Havisham. "'They made themselves my friends,' said I, when they supposed me to have superseded them, and when Sarah Pocket, Miss Georgiana, and Mistress Camilla were not my friends, I think. This contrasting of them with the rest seemed, I was glad to see, to do them good with her. She looked at me keenly for a little while, and then said quietly, "'What do you want for them?' "'Only,' said I, "'that you would not confound them with the others. They may be of the same blood, but, believe me, they are not of the same nature.' Still looking at me keenly, Miss Havisham repeated, "'What do you want for them?' "'I am not so cunning, you see,' I said in answer, conscious that I reddened a little, as that I could hide from you, even if I desired, that I do want something. "'Miss Havisham, if you would spare the money to do my friend Herbert a lasting service in life, but which from the nature of the case must be done without his knowledge,' I could show you how. "'Why must it be done without his knowledge?' she asked, settling her hands upon her stick, that she might regard me the more attentively. "'Because,' said I, "'I began the service myself more than two years ago, without his knowledge, and I don't want to be betrayed. Why I fail in my ability to finish it, I cannot explain.' It is part of the secret which is another's and not mine. She gradually withdrew her eyes from me and turned them on the fire. After watching it for what appeared in the silence and by the light of the slowly wasting candles to be a long time, she was roused by the collapse of some of the red coals and looked towards me again, at first vacantly, then with a gradually concentrating attention. All this time Estella knitted on. When Miss Havisham had fixed her attention on me, she said, speaking as if there had been no lapse in our dialogue, "'What else?' "'Estella,' said I, turning to her now, and trying to command my trembling voice, "'you know I love you. You know that I have loved you long and dearly.' She raised her eyes to my face, on being thus addressed, and her fingers plied their work, and she looked at me with an unmoved countenance. I saw that Miss Havisham glanced from me to her, and from her to me. I should have said this sooner, but for my long mistake. It induced me to hope that Miss Havisham meant us for one another. While I thought you could not help yourself, as it were, I refrained from saying it, but I must say it now." Preserving her unmoved countenance, and with her fingers still going, Estella shook her head. "'I know,' said I, in answer to that action, "'I know. I have no hope that I shall ever call you mine, Estella. I am ignorant what may become of me very soon, how poor I may be, or where I may go. Still, I love you. I have loved you ever since I first saw you in this house.' Looking at me perfectly unmoved and with her fingers busy, she shook her head again. 
It would have been cruel in Miss Havisham, horribly cruel, to practice on the susceptibility of a poor boy, and to torture me through all these years with a vain hope and an idle pursuit, if she had reflected on the gravity of what she did. But I think she did not. I think that, in the endurance of her own trial, she forgot mine, Estella. I saw Miss Havisham put her hand to her heart and hold it there, as she sat looking by turns at Estella and at me. "'It seems,' said Estella very calmly, "'that there are sentiments, fancies, I don't know how to call them, which I am not able to comprehend. When you say you love me, I know what you mean, as a form of words, but nothing more. You address nothing in my breast. You touch nothing there. I don't care for what you say at all. I have tried to warn you of this, now, have I not? I said, in a miserable manner, Yes. Yes, but you would not be warned, for you thought I did not mean it. Now, did you not think so? I thought and hoped you could not mean it, you, so young, untried, and beautiful, Estella, surely it is not in nature. It is in my nature, she returned, and then she added, with a stress upon the words, It is in the nature formed within me. I make a great difference between you and all other people when I say so much. I can do no more. Is it not true, said I, that Bentley Drummle is in town here and pursuing you? It is quite true, she replied, referring to him with the indifference of utter contempt. That you encourage him and ride out with him, and that he dines with you this very day? She seemed a little surprised that I should know it, but again replied, Quite true. You cannot love him, Estella. Her fingers stopped for the first time, as she retorted rather angrily, "'What have I told you? Do you still think, in spite of it, that I do not mean what I say?' "'You would never marry him, Estella?' She looked towards Miss Havisham, and considered for a moment with her work in her hands. Then she said, "'Why not tell you the truth? I am going to be married to him.' I dropped my face into my hands, but was able to control myself better than I could have expected, considering what agony it gave me to hear her say those words. When I raised my face again, there was such a ghastly look upon Miss Havisham's that it impressed me, even in my passionate hurry and grief. Estella, dearest Estella, do not let Miss Havisham lead you into this fatal step. Put me aside for ever. You have done so, I well know, but bestow yourself on some worthier person than Drummle. Miss Havisham gives you to him, as the greatest slight and injury that could be done to the many far better men who admire you, and to the few who truly love you. Among those few there may be one who loves you even as dearly, though he has not loved you as long as I. Take him, and I can bear it better for your sake." My earnestness awoke a wonder in her that seemed as if it would have been touched with compassion, if she could have rendered me at all intelligible to her own mind. "'I am going,' she said again, in a gentler voice, "'to be married to him. The preparations for my marriage are making, and I shall be married soon. Why do you injuriously introduce the name of my mother by adoption? It is my own act.' "'Your own act, Estella, to fling yourself away upon a brute?' "'On whom should I fling myself away?' she retorted, with a smile. "'Should I fling myself away upon the man who would the soonest feel, if people do feel such things, that I took nothing to him? There, it is done. I shall do well enough, and so will my husband. As to leading me into what you call this fatal step—' Miss Havisham would have had me wait, and not marry yet, but I am tired of the life I have led, which has very few charms for me, 
and I am willing enough to change it. Say no more. We shall never understand each other. Such a mean brute! Such a stupid brute! I urged in despair. Don't be afraid of my being a blessing to him, said Estella. I shall not be that. Come, here is my hand. Do we part on this, you visionary boy, or man? Oh, Estella! I answered as my bitter tears fell fast on her hand, do what I would to restrain them. Even if I remained in England and could hold my head up with the rest, how could I see you Drummle's wife? Nonsense, she returned. Nonsense. This will pass in no time. Never, Estella. You will get me out of your thoughts in a week. Out of my thoughts? You are part of my existence, part of myself. You have been in every line I have ever read since I first came here, the rough common boy whose poor heart you wounded even then. You have been in every prospect I have ever seen since, on the river, on the sails of the ships, on the marshes, in the clouds, in the light, in the darkness, in the wind, in the woods, in the sea, in the streets. You have been the embodiment of every graceful fancy that my mind has ever become acquainted with. The stones of which the strongest London buildings are made are not more real, or more impossible to be displaced by your hands, than your presence and influence have been to me, there and everywhere, and will be. Estella, to the last hour of my life you cannot choose but remain part of my character, part of the little good in me, part of the evil. But in this separation I associate you only with the good, and I will faithfully hold you to that always, for you must have done me far more good than harm. Let me feel now what sharp distress I may. Oh, God bless you! God forgive you! In what ecstasy of unhappiness I got these broken words out of myself, I don't know. The rhapsody welled up within me, like blood from an inward wound, and gushed out. I held her hand to my lips some lingering moments, and so I left her. But ever afterwards I remembered, and soon afterwards with stronger reason, that while Estella looked at me merely with incredulous wonder, the spectral figure of Miss Havisham, her hand still covering her heart, seemed all resolved into a ghastly stare of pity and remorse. All done, all gone. So much was done and gone that when I went out at the gate, the light of the day seemed of a darker colour than when I went in. For a while I hid myself among some lanes and by-paths, and then struck off to walk all the way to London. For I had by that time come to myself, so far as to consider, that I could not go back to the inn and see Drummle there, that I could not bear to sit upon the coach and be spoken to, that I could do nothing half so good for myself as tire myself out. It was past midnight when I crossed London Bridge, pursuing the narrow intricacies of the streets which at that time tended westward near the Middlesex shore of the river. My readiest access to the temple was close by the riverside, through Whitefriars. I was not expected till to-morrow, but I had my keys, and if Herbert were gone to bed, could get to bed myself without disturbing him. As it seldom happened that I came in at that Whitefriars gate after the temple was closed, and as I was very muddy and weary, I did not take it ill that the night-porter examined me with much attention as he held the gate a little way open for me to pass in. To help his memory I mentioned my name. "'I was not quite sure, sir, but I thought so. Here's a note, sir. The messenger that brought it said you would be so good as read it by my lantern. Much surprised by the request, I took the note. It was directed to Philip Pip, Esquire, and on the top of the superscription were the words, Please read this here. I opened it, the watchman holding up his light, and read inside, in Wemmick's writing, Don't go home. End of chapter.
Chapter Forty Five of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter Forty Five. Turning from the temple gate as soon as I had read the warning, I made the best of my way to Fleet Street, and there got a late hackney chariot, and drove to the Hummins in Covent Garden. In those times a bed was always to be got there at any hour of the night, and the Chamberlain, letting me in at his ready wicket, lighted the candle next in order on his shelf, and showed me straight into the bedroom next in order on his list. It was a sort of vault on the ground floor at the back with a despotic monster of a four-post bedstead in it, straddling over the whole place, putting one of his arbitrary legs into the fireplace and another into the doorway, and squeezing the wretched little washing-stand in quite a divinely righteous manner. As I had asked for a night-light, the chamberlain had brought me in, before he left me, the good old constitutional rush-light of those virtuous days, an object like the ghost of a walking-cane, which instantly broke its back if it were touched, which nothing could ever be lighted at, and which was placed in solitary confinement at the bottom of a high tin tower, perforated with round holes that made a staringly wide-awake pattern on the walls. When I had got into bed and lay there footsore, weary, and wretched, I found that I could no more close my own eyes than I could close the eyes of this foolish Argus, and thus, in the gloom and death of the night, we stared at one another. What a doleful night! How anxious, how dismal, how long! There was an inhospitable smell in the room, of cold soot and hot dust, and, as I looked up into the corners of the tester over my head, I thought what a number of blue-bottle flies from the butchers, and earwigs from the market, and grubs from the country, must be holding on up there, lying by for next summer. This led me to speculate whether any of them ever tumbled down, and then I fancied that I felt light falls on my face, a disagreeable turn of thought, suggesting other and more objectionable approaches up my back. When I had lain awake a little while, these extraordinary voices with which silence teems began to make themselves audible. The closet whispered, the fireplace sighed, the little washing-stand ticked, and one guitar-string played occasionally in the chest of drawers. At about the same time the eyes on the wall acquired a new expression, and in every one of those staring rounds I saw written, DON'T GO HOME. Whatever night fancies and night noises crowded on me, they never warded off this DON'T GO HOME. It plated itself into whatever I thought of, as a bodily pain would have done. Not long before, I had read in the newspapers how a gentleman unknown had come to the Hummins in the night, and had gone to bed, and had destroyed himself, and had been found in the morning weltering in blood. It came into my head that he must have occupied this very vault of mine, and I got out of bed to assure myself that there were no red marks about, then opened the door to look out into the passages, and cheer myself with the companionship of a distant light near which I knew the Chamberlain to be dozing. But all this time, why I was not to go home, and what had happened at home, and when I should go home, and whether Provis was safe at home, were questions occupying my mind so busily that one might have supposed there could be no more room in it for any other theme. Even when I thought of Estella, and how we had parted that day for ever, and when I recalled all the circumstances of our parting, and all her looks and tones, and the action of her fingers while she knitted, even then I was pursuing, here and there and everywhere, the caution, don't go home. When at last I dozed, in sheer exhaustion of mind and body, it became a vast shadowy verb which I had to conjugate. Imperative mood, present tense. Do not thou go home. Let him not go home, let us not go home. Do not ye, or you go home, let not them go home. Then, potentially, 
I may not and I cannot go home, and I might not, could not, would not, and should not go home, until I felt that I was going distracted, and rolled over on the pillow, and looked at the staring rounds upon the wall again. I had left directions that I was to be called at seven, for it was plain that I must see Wemmick before seeing any one else, and equally plain that this was a case in which his Walworth sentiments only could be taken. It was a relief to get out of the room where the night had been so miserable, and I needed no second knocking at the door to startle me from my uneasy bed. The castle battlements arose upon my view at eight o'clock. The little servant happening to be entering the fortress with two hot rolls, I passed through the postern and crossed the drawbridge in her company, and so came without announcement into the presence of Wemmick as he was making tea for himself and the aged. An open door afforded a perspective view of the aged in bed. "'Hello, Mr. Pip,' said Wemmick. "'You did come home, then?' "'Yes,' I returned. "'But I didn't go home.' "'That's all right,' said he, rubbing his hands. "'I left a note for you at each of the temple gates on the chance. Which gate did you come to?' I told him. "'I'll go round to the others in the course of the day and destroy the notes.' said Wemmick. It's a good rule never to leave documentary evidence if you can help it, because you don't know when it may be put in. I'm going to take a liberty with you. Would you mind toasting this sausage for the aged P? I said I should be delighted to do it. Then you can go about your work, Marianne, said Wemmick to the little servant, which leaves us to ourselves, don't you see, Mr. Pip? he added, winking as she disappeared. I thanked him for his friendship and caution, and our discourse proceeded in a low tone, while I toasted the aged sausage, and he buttered the crumb of the aged's roll. "'Now, Mr. Pip, you know,' said Wemmick, "'you and I understand one another. We are in our private and personal capacities, and we have been engaged in a confidential transaction before to-day. Official sentiments are one thing. We are extra-official.' I cordially assented. I was so very nervous that I had already lighted the aged sausage like a torch, and been obliged to blow it out. "'I accidentally heard, yesterday morning,' said Wemmick, "'being in a certain place where I once took you. Even between you and me, it's as well not to mention names when avoidable.' "'Much better not,' said I. "'I understand you.' "'I heard there by chance yesterday morning.' said Wemmick, that a certain person not altogether of uncolonial pursuits, and not unpossessed of portable property, I don't know who it may really be, we won't name this person. Not necessary, said I, had made some little stir in a certain part of the world where a good many people go, not always in gratification of their own inclinations, and not quite irrespective of the government expense. In watching his face, I made quite a firework of the aged sausage, and greatly discomposed both my own attention and Wemmick's, for which I apologized. By disappearing from such place, and being no more heard of thereabouts, from which, said Wemmick, conjectures had been raised and theories formed. I also heard that you at your chambers in Garden Court, Temple, had been watched, and might be watched again. "'By whom?' said I. "'I wouldn't go into that,' said Wemmick, evasively. "'It might clash with official responsibilities. I heard it, as I have in my time heard other curious things in the same place. I don't tell it you on information received. I heard it.' He took the toasting-fork and sausage from me as he spoke, and set forth the aged's breakfast neatly on a little tray. Previous to placing it before him, he went into the aged's room with a clean white cloth, and tied the same under the old gentleman's chin, and propped him up, and put his nightcap on one side, and gave him quite a rakish air. Then he placed his breakfast before him with great care, and said, "'All right, ain't you, aged P?' to which the cheerful aged replied, "'All right, John, my boy, all right!' 
as there seemed to be a tacit understanding that the aged was not in a presentable state, and was therefore to be considered invisible, I made a pretense of being in complete ignorance of these proceedings. This watching of me at my chambers, which I have once had reason to suspect, I said to Wemmick when he came back, is inseparable from the person to whom you have adverted, is it? Wemmick looked very serious. I couldn't undertake to say that of my own knowledge. I mean, I couldn't undertake to say it was at first. But it either is, or it will be, or it's in great danger of being. As I saw that he was restrained by fealty to Little Britain from saying as much as he could, and as I knew with thankfulness to him how far out of his way he went to say what he did, I could not press him. But I told him, after a little meditation over the fire, that I would like to ask him a question, subject to his answering or not answering, as he deemed right, and sure that his course would be right. He paused in his breakfast, and crossing his arms and pinching his shirt-sleeves, his notion of indoor comfort was to sit without any coat, he nodded to me once to put my question. "'You have heard of a man of bad character, whose true name is Compison? He answered with one other nod. "'Is he living?' One other nod. "'Is he in London?' He gave me one other nod, compressed the post-office exceedingly, gave me one last nod, and went on with his breakfast. "'Now,' said Wemmick, "'questioning being over,' which he emphasized and repeated for my guidance, I come to what I did, after hearing what I heard. I went to Garden Court to find you. Not finding you, I went to Clericurs to find Mr. Herbert. "'And him you found?' said I, with great anxiety. "'And him I found. Without mentioning any names, or going into any details, I gave him to understand that if he was aware of anybody, Tom, Jack, or Richard, being about the chambers— or about the immediate neighbourhood, he had better get Tom, Jack, or Richard out of the way while you were out of the way. He would be greatly puzzled what to do? He was puzzled what to do, not the less because I gave him my opinion that it was not safe to try to get Tom, Jack, or Richard too far out of the way at present. Mr. Pip, I'll tell you something. Under existing circumstances there is no place like a great city when you are once in it. Don't break cover too soon. Lie close. Wait till things slacken before you try the open, even for foreign air. I thanked him for his valuable advice, and asked him what Herbert had done. Mr. Herbert, said Wemmick, after being all of a heap for half an hour, struck out a plan. He motioned to me as a secret that he is courting a young lady who has, as no doubt you are aware, a bedridden pa, which pa, having been in the purser line of life, lies abed in a bow window where he can see the ship sail up and down the river. You are acquainted with the young lady, most probably? Not personally, said I. The truth was, that she had objected to me as an expensive companion who did Herbert no good, and that, when Herbert had first proposed to present me to her, she had received the proposal with such very moderate warmth, that Herbert had felt himself obliged to confine the state of the case to me, with a view to the lapse of a little time before I made her acquaintance. When I had begun to advance Herbert's prospects by stealth, I had been able to bear this with cheerful philosophy, he and his affianced, for their part, had naturally not been very anxious to introduce a third person into their interviews, and thus, although I was assured that I had risen in Clara's esteem, and though the young lady and I had long regularly interchanged messages and remembrances by Herbert, I had never seen her. However, I did not trouble Wemmick with these particulars. "'The house with the bow window,' said Wemmick, being by the river-side, down the pool there between Limehouse and Greenwich, 
and being kept, it seems, by a very respectable widow who has a furnished upper floor to let. Mr. Herbert put it to me. What did I think of that, as a temporary tenement for Tom, Jack, or Richard? Now I thought very well of it, for three reasons I'll give you. That is to say, firstly, it's altogether out of all your beats, and is well away from the usual heap of streets great and small. Secondly, without going near it yourself, you could always hear of the safety of Tom, Jack, or Richard, through Mr. Herbert. Thirdly, after a while, and when it might be prudent, if you should want to slip Tom, Jack, or Richard, on board a foreign packet-boat, there he is, ready. Much comforted by these considerations, I thanked Wemmick again and again, and begged him to proceed. "'Well, sir, Mr. Herbert threw himself into the business with a will, and by nine o'clock last night he housed Tom, Jack, or Richard, whichever it may be, you and I don't want to know, quite successfully. At the old lodgings it was understood that he was summoned to Dover, and, in fact, he was taken down the Dover Road and cornered out of it. Now, another great advantage of all this is that it was done without you, and when, if any one was concerning himself about your movements, you must be known to be ever so many miles off and quite otherwise engaged. This diverts suspicion and confuses it, and for the same reason I recommended that, even if you came back last night, you should not go home. It brings in more confusion, and you want confusion. Wemmick, having finished his breakfast, here looked at his watch and began to get his coat on. "'And now, Mr. Pip,' said he, with his hands still in the sleeves, "'I have probably done the most I can do. But if I can ever do more, from a Walworth point of view, and in a strictly private and personal capacity, I shall be glad to do it. Here's the address.' There can be no harm in your going here to-night, and seeing for yourself that all is well with Tom, Jack, or Richard, before you go home, which is another reason for your not going home last night. But, after you have gone home, don't go back here. You are very welcome, I am sure, Mr. Pip. His hands were now out of his sleeves, and I was shaking them. And let me finally impress one important point upon you. He laid his hands upon my shoulders, and added in a solemn whisper, "'Avail yourself of this evening to lay hold of his portable property. You don't know what may happen to him. Don't let anything happen to the portable property.' Quite despairing of making my mind clear to Wemmick on this point, I forbore to try. "'Time's up,' said Wemmick, "'and I must be off.' If you had nothing more pressing to do than to keep here till dark, that's what I should advise. You look very much worried, and it would do you good to have a perfectly quiet day with the aged. He'll be up presently, and a little bit of—you remember the pig? Of course, said I. Well, and a little bit of him. That sausage you toasted was his, and he was in all respects a first-rater. Do try him if it is only for old acquaintance' sake. Good-bye, aged parent! In a cheery shout. All right, John, all right, my boy! piped the old man from within. I soon fell asleep before Wemmick's fire, and the aged and I enjoyed one another's society by falling asleep before it more or less all day. We had loin of pork for dinner, and greens grown on the estate, and I nodded at the aged with a good intention whenever I failed to do it drowsily. When it was quite dark, I left the aged preparing the fire for toast, and I inferred from the number of teacups, as well as from his glances at the two little doors in the wall, that Miss Skiffins was expected. End of chapter Chapter Forty Six of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens Chapter 46 Eight o'clock had struck before I got into the air, that was scented, not disagreeably, by the chips and shavings of the longshore boat-builders, and mast, oar, and block-makers. All that waterside region of the upper and lower pool below bridge was unknown ground to me, and when I struck down by the river, I found that the spot I wanted was not where I had supposed it to be, and was anything but easy to find. It was called Mill Pond Bank, Chink's Basin, and I had no other guide to Chink's Basin than the old green copper rope walk. It matters not what stranded ships repairing in dry docks I lost myself among, what old hulls of ships in course of being knocked to pieces, what ooze and slime and other dregs of tide, what yards of shipbuilders and shipbreakers, what rusty anchors blindly biting into the ground, though for years off duty, what mountainous country of accumulated casks and timber, how many rope-walks that were not the old green copper. After several times falling short of my destination, and as often overshooting it, I came unexpectedly round a corner upon Mill Pond Bank. It was a fresh kind of place, all circumstances considered, where the wind from the river had room to turn itself round, and there were two or three trees in it, and there was the stump of a ruined windmill, and there was the old green copper rope-walk, whose long and narrow vista I could trace in the moonlight, along a series of wooden frames set in the ground, and that looked like superannuated haymaking rakes, which had grown old and lost most of their teeth. Selecting from the few queer houses upon Mill Pond Bank, a house with a wooden front and three stories of bow window, not bay window, which is another thing, I looked at the plate upon the door, and read there, Mrs. Wimple. That being the name I wanted, I knocked, and an elderly woman of a pleasant and thriving appearance responded. She was immediately deposed, however, by Herbert, who silently led me into the parlour, and shut the door. It was an odd sensation to see his very familiar face established quite at home in that very unfamiliar room and region, and I found myself looking at him, much as I looked at the corner cupboard with the glass and china, the shells upon the chimney-piece, and the coloured engravings on the wall, representing the death of Captain Cook, a ship launch, and His Majesty King George the Third in a state coachman's wig, leather breeches, and top boots, on the terrace at Windsor. "'All is well, Handel,' said Herbert, "'and he is quite satisfied, though eager to see you. My dear girl is with her father, and if you'll wait till she comes down, I'll make her known to you, and then we'll go upstairs.' "'That's her father.' I had become aware of an alarming growling overhead, and had probably expressed the fact in my countenance. "'I am afraid he is a sad old rascal,' said Herbert, smiling. "'But I have never seen him. Don't you smell rum? He is always at it.' "'At rum?' said I. "'Yes,' returned Herbert. "'And you may suppose how mild it makes his gout.' He persists, too, in keeping all the provisions upstairs in his room, and serving them out. He keeps them on shelves over his head, and will weigh them all. His room must be like a chandler's shop. While he thus spoke, the growling noise became a prolonged roar, and then died away. "'What else can be the consequence?' said Herbert, in explanation. "'If he will cut the cheese. A man with a gout in his right hand, and everywhere else,' can't expect to get through a double Gloucester without hurting himself. He seemed to have hurt himself very much, for he gave another furious roar. "'To have Provis for an upper lodger is quite a godsend to Mrs. Wimple,' said Herbert, "'for of course people in general won't stand that noise. A curious place, Handel, isn't it?' It was a curious place, indeed, but remarkably well kept and clean. Mrs. Wimple— said Herbert, when I told him so, is the best of housewives, and I really do not know what my Clara would do without her motherly help. 
for Clara has no mother of her own handle, and no relation in the world but old Gruff and Grim. Surely that's not his name, Herbert? <laughs> no, no, said Herbert. That's my name for him. His name is Mr. Barley. But what a blessing it is for the son of my father and mother to love a girl who has no relations, and who can never bother herself or anybody else about her family. Herbert had told me on former occasions, and now reminded me, that he first knew Miss Clara Barley when she was completing her education at an establishment at Hammersmith, and that on her being recalled home to nurse her father, he and she had confided their affection to the motherly Mrs. Wimple, by whom it had been fostered and regulated with equal kindness and discretion ever since. It was understood that nothing of a tender nature could possibly be confided to old Barley, by reason of his being totally unequal to the consideration of any subject more psychological than gout, rum, and purser's stores. As we were thus conversing in a low tone, while old Barley's sustained growl vibrated in the beam that crossed the ceiling, the room door opened and a very pretty, slight, dark-haired girl of twenty or so came in with a basket in her hand, whom Herbert tenderly relieved of the basket, and presented, blushing, as Clara. She really was a most charming girl, and might have passed for a captive fairy, whom that truculent ogre, old Barley, had pressed into his service. "'Look here,' said Herbert, showing me the basket, with a compassionate and tender smile, after we had talked a little, Here's poor Clara's supper, served out every night. Here's her allowance of bread, and here's her slice of cheese, and here's her rum, which I drink. This is Mr. Barley's breakfast for to-morrow, served out to be cooked. Two mutton chops, three potatoes, some split peas, a little flour, two ounces of butter, a pinch of salt, and all this black pepper. It's stewed up together and taken hot, and it's a nice thing for the gout, I should think." There was something so natural and winning in Clara's resigned way of looking at these stores in detail, as Herbert pointed them out, and something so confiding, loving, and innocent in her modest manner of yielding herself to Herbert's embracing arm, and something so gentle in her, so much needing protection on Mill Pond Bank, by Chink's Basin, and the old green copper rope-walk, with old barley growling in the beam that I would not have undone the engagement between her and Herbert for all the money in the pocket-book I had never opened. I was looking at her with pleasure and admiration, when suddenly the growl swelled into a roar again, and a frightful bumping noise was heard above, as if a giant with a wooden leg was trying to bore it through the ceiling to come at us. Upon this Clara said to Herbert, "'Papa wants me, darling,' and ran away. "'There is an unconscionable old shark for you,' said Herbert. "'What do you suppose he wants now, Handel?' "'I don't know,' said I. "'Something to drink?' "'That's it,' cried Herbert, as if I had made a guess of extraordinary merit. "'He keeps his grog ready mixed in a little tub on the table. "'Wait a moment, and you'll hear Clara lift him up to take some. "'There he goes!' Another roar with a prolonged shake at the end. Now, said Herbert, as it was succeeded by silence, he's drinking. Now, said Herbert, as the growl resounded in the beam once more, he's down again on his back. Clara returned soon afterwards, and Herbert accompanied me upstairs to see our charge. As we passed Mr. Barley's door, he was heard hoarsely muttering within, in a strain that rose and fell like wind. The following refrain, in which I substitute good wishes for something quite the reverse. Ahoy, bless your eyes, there's old Bill Barley. Here's old Bill Barley, bless your eyes. Here's old Bill Barley on the flat of his back, by the Lord. Lying on the flat of his back like a drifting old dead flounder. Here's your old Bill Barley, bless your eyes. Ahoy, bless ya. In this strain of consolation, Herbert informed me the invisible Barley would commune with himself by the day and night together. Often, while it was light, having at the same time one eye at a telescope which was fitted on his bed for the convenience of sweeping the river. 
In his two cabin rooms at the top of the house, which were fresh and airy, and in which Mr. Barley was less audible than below, I found Provis comfortably settled. He expressed no alarm, and seemed to feel none that was worth mentioning, but it struck me that he was softened, indefinably, for I could not have said how, and could never afterwards recall how when I tried, but certainly. The opportunity that the day's rest had given me for reflection had resulted in my fully determining to say nothing to him respecting Compeyson. For anything I knew, his animosity towards the man might otherwise lead to his seeking him out and rushing on his own destruction. Therefore, when Herbert and I sat down with him by his fire, I asked him first of all whether he relied on Wemmick's judgment and sources of information. "'Aye, aye, dear boy,' he answered with a grave nod. "'Jagger's nose.' "'Then I have talked with Wemmick,' said I, "'and have come to tell you what caution he gave me, and what advice.' This I did accurately, with the reservation just mentioned, and I told him how Wemmick had heard, in Newgate Prison, whether from officers or prisoners I could not say, that he was under some suspicion, and that my chambers had been watched, how Wemmick had recommended his keeping close for a time, and my keeping away from him, and what Wemmick had said about getting him abroad. I added that, of course, when the time came, I should go with him, or should follow close upon him, as might be safest in Wemmick's judgment. What was to follow that I did not touch upon, neither, indeed, was I at all clear or comfortable about it in my own mind, now that I saw him in that softer condition and in declared peril for my sake. As to altering my way of living by enlarging my expenses, I put it to him whether in our present unsettled and difficult circumstances it would not be simply ridiculous if it were no worse. He could not deny this, and indeed was very reasonable throughout. His coming back was a venture, he said, and he had always known it to be a venture. He would do nothing to make it a desperate venture, and he had very little fear of his safety with such good help. Herbert, who had been looking at the fire and pondering, here said that something had come into his thoughts, arising out of Wemmick's suggestion, which it might be worth while to pursue. We are both good watermen, Handel, and could take him down the river ourselves when the right time comes. No boat would then be hired for the purpose, and no boatman. That would save at least a chance of suspicion, and any chance is worth saving. Never mind the season. Don't you think it might be a good thing if you began at once to keep a boat at the temple stairs, and were in the habit of rowing up and down the river? You fall into that habit, and then who notices or minds? Do it twenty or fifty times, and there is nothing special in your doing it the twenty-first or fifty-first. I liked this scheme, and Provis was quite elated by it. We agreed that it should be carried into execution, and that Provis should never recognize us if we came below bridge and rode past Millpond Bank. But we further agreed that he should pull down the blind in that part of his window, which gave upon the east whenever he saw us, and all was right. Our conference being now ended, and everything arranged, I rose to go, remarking to Herbert that he and I had better not go home together, and that I would take half an hour's start of him. "'I don't like to leave you here,' I said to Provis, "'though I cannot doubt your being safer here than near me. Good-bye.' "'Dear boy,' he answered, clasping my hands, "'I don't know when we may meet again, and I don't like good-bye.' Say good night. Good night. Herbert will go regularly between us, and when the time comes you may be certain I shall be ready. Good night. Good night. We thought it best that he should stay in his own rooms, and we left him on the landing outside his door, holding a light over the stair rail to light us downstairs. Looking back at him, I thought of the first night of his return, when our positions were reversed and when I little supposed my heart could ever be as heavy and anxious at parting from him as it was now. Old Barley was growling and swearing when we repassed his door, with no appearance of having ceased or of meaning to cease. When we got to the foot of the stairs, I asked Herbert whether he had preserved the name of Provis. 
he replied, Certainly not, and that the lodger was Mr. Campbell. He also explained that the utmost known of Mr. Campbell there was, that he, Herbert, had Mr. Campbell's consigned to him, and felt a strong personal interest in his being well cared for, and living a secluded life. So, when we went into the parlour where Mrs. Wimple and Clara were seated at work, I said nothing of my own interest in Mr. Campbell, but kept it to myself. When I had taken leave of the pretty, gentle, dark-eyed girl, and of the motherly woman who had not outlived her honest sympathy with a little affair of true love, I felt as if the old green copper rope-walk had grown quite a different place. Old Barley might be as old as the hills, and might swear like a whole field of troopers, but there were redeeming youth and trust and hope enough in Chink's Basin to fill it to overflowing. And then I thought of Estella, and of our parting, and went home very sadly. All things were as quiet in the temple as ever I had seen them. The windows of the rooms on that side, lately occupied by Provis, were dark and still, and there was no lounger in Garden Court. I walked past the fountain twice or thrice before I descended the steps that were between me and my rooms, but I was quite alone. Herbert coming to my bedside when he came in, for I went straight to bed, dispirited and fatigued, made the same report. Opening one of the windows after that, he looked out into the moonlight, and told me that the pavement was as solemnly empty as the pavement of any cathedral at that same hour. Next day I set myself to get the boat. It was soon done, and the boat was brought round to the temple stairs, and lay where I could reach her within a minute or two. Then I began to go out, as for training and practice, sometimes alone, sometimes with Herbert. I was often out in cold, rain, and sleet, but nobody took much note of me after I had been out a few times. At first I kept above Blackfriars Bridge, but as the hours of the tide changed I took towards London Bridge. It was old London Bridge in those days, and at certain states of the tide there was a race and fall of water there which gave it a bad reputation. But I knew well enough how to shoot the bridge after seeing it done and so began to row about among the shipping in the pool, and down to Erith. The first time I passed Mill Pond Bank, Herbert and I were pulling a pair of oars, and both in going and returning we saw the blind towards the east come down. Herbert was rarely there less frequently than three times in a week, and he never brought me a single word of intelligence that was at all alarming. Still, I knew that there was cause for alarm, and I could not get rid of the notion of being watched. Once received, it is a haunting idea. How many undesigning persons I suspected of watching me, it would be hard to calculate. In short, I was always full of fears for the rash man who was in hiding. Herbert had sometimes said to me that he found it pleasant to stand at one of our windows after dark, and when the tide was running down and to think that it was flowing, with everything it bore, towards Clara. But I thought with dread that it was flowing towards Magwitch, and that any black mark on its surface might be his pursuers, going swiftly, silently, and surely, to take him. End of chapter Chapter forty seven of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter forty seven. Some weeks passed without bringing any change. We waited for Wemmick, and he made no sign. If I had never known him out of Little Britain, and had never enjoyed the privilege of being on a familiar footing at the castle, I might have doubted him. Not so for a moment, knowing him as I did. My worldly affairs began to wear a gloomy appearance, and I was pressed for money by more than one creditor. Even I myself began to know the want of money. I mean of ready money in my own pocket. 
and to relieve it by converting some easily spared articles of jewellery into cash. But I had quite determined that it would be a heartless fraud to take more money from my patron in the existing state of my uncertain thoughts and plans. Therefore I had sent him the unopened pocket-book by Herbert to hold in his own keeping, and I felt a kind of satisfaction, whether it was a false kind or a true, I hardly know, in not having profited by his generosity since his revelation of himself. As the time wore on, an impression settled heavily upon me that Estella was married. Fearful of having it confirmed, though it was all but a conviction, I avoided the newspapers, and begged Herbert, to whom I had confided the circumstances of our last interview, never to speak of her to me. Why I hoarded up this last wretched little rag of the robe of hope that was rent and given to the winds, how do I know? Why did you who read this commit that not dissimilar inconsistency of your own last year, last month, last week? It was an unhappy life that I lived, and its one dominant anxiety, towering above all its other anxieties, like a high mountain above a range of mountains, never disappeared from my view. Still, no new cause for fear arose. Let me start from my bed as I would, with the terror fresh upon me that he was discovered. Let me sit listening, as I would with dread, for Herbert's returning step at night, lest it should be fleeter than ordinary, and winged with evil news. For all that, and much more to like purpose, the round of things went on. Condemned to inaction and a state of constant restlessness and suspense, I rode about in my boat, and waited, 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 as I best could. There were states of the tide when, having been down the river, I could not get back through the eddy-chafed arches and starlings of old London Bridge. Then I left my boat at a wharf near the Custom House, to be brought up afterwards to the Temple Stairs. I was not averse to doing this, as it served to make me and my boat a commoner incident among the waterside people there. From this slight occasion sprang two meetings that I have now to tell of. One afternoon, late in the month of February, I came ashore at the wharf at dusk. I had pulled down as far as Greenwich with the ebb tide, and had turned with the tide. It had been a fine, bright day, but it had become foggy as the sun dropped and I had had to feel my way back among the shipping, pretty carefully. Both in going and returning I had seen the signal in his window, all well. As it was a raw evening, and I was cold, I thought I would comfort myself with dinner at once, and as I had hours of dejection and solitude before me if I went home to the temple, I thought I would afterwards go to the play. The theatre where Mr. Wopsle had achieved his questionable triumph was in that waterside neighbourhood, it is nowhere now, and to that theatre I resolved to go. I was aware that Mr. Wopsle had not succeeded in reviving the drama, but on the contrary had rather partaken of its decline. He had been ominously heard of, through the playbills, as a faithful black, in connection with a little girl of noble birth, and a monkey and Herbert had seen him as a predatory tartar of comic propensities, with a face like a red brick, and an outrageous hat all over bells. I dined at what Herbert and I used to call a geographical chop-house, where there were maps of the world in porter-pot rims on every half-yard of the tablecloths, and charts of gravy on every one of the knives. To this day— there is scarcely a single chop-house within the Lord Mayor's dominions which is not geographical, and wore out the time in dozing over crumbs, staring at gas, and baking in a hot blast of dinners. By and by I roused myself and went to the play. There I found a virtuous boatswain in His Majesty's service, a most excellent man, though I could have wished his trousers not quite so tight in some places, and not quite so loose in others, who knocked all the little men's hats over their eyes, though he was very generous and brave, and who wouldn't hear of anybody's paying taxes, though he was very patriotic. He had a bag of money in his pocket, like a pudding in the cloth, 
and on that property married a young person in bed furniture, with great rejoicings, the whole population of Portsmouth, nine in number at the last census, turning out on the beach to rub their own hands and shake everybody else's, and sing, Phil, Phil. A certain dark-complexioned swab, however, who wouldn't fill, or do anything else that was proposed to him, and whose heart was openly stated, by the boatswain, to be as black as his figurehead, proposed to two other swabs to get all mankind into difficulties, which was so effectually done, the swab family having considerable political influence, that it took half the evening to set things right, and then it was only brought about through an honest little grocer with a white hat, black gaiters, and red nose, getting into a clock with a gridiron, and listening, and coming out, and knocking everybody down from behind with the gridiron whom I couldn't confute with what he had overheard. This led to Mr. Wopsle's, who had never been heard of before, coming in with a star and garter on, as a plenipotentiary of great power direct from the Admiralty, to say that the swabs were all to go to prison on the spot, and that he had brought the boatswain down the Union Jack, as a slight acknowledgment of his public services. The boatswain, unmanned for the first time, respectfully dried his eyes on the jack, and then cheering up, and addressing Mr. Wopsle as, Your Honour, solicited permission to take him by the fin. Mr. Wopsle, conceding his fin with a gracious dignity, was immediately shoved into a dusty corner, while everybody danced a hornpipe, and from that corner, surveying the public with a discontented eye, became aware of me. The second piece was the last new grand comic, Christmas Pantomime, in the first scene of which it pained me to suspect that I detect Mr. Wopsle with red worsted legs under a highly magnified phosphoric countenance and a shock of red curtain fringe for his hair, engaged in the manufacture of thunderbolts in a mine, and displaying great cowardice when his gigantic master came home, very hoarse, to dinner. But he presently presented himself under worthier circumstances, for, the genius of youthful love being in want of assistance, on account of the parental brutality of an ignorant farmer who opposed the chance of his daughter's heart, by purposely falling upon the object, in a flour-sack, out of the first-floor window, summoned a sententious enchanter, and he, coming up from the antipodes rather unsteadily, after an apparently violent journey, proved to be Mr. Wopsle in a high-crowned hat, with a necromantic work in one volume under his arm. The business of this enchanter on earth being principally to be talked at, sung at, butted at, danced at, and flashed at with fires of various colours, he had a good deal of time on his hands, and I observed with great surprise that he devoted it to staring in my direction as if he were lost in amazement. There was something so remarkable in the increasing glare of Mr. Wopsle's eye, and he seemed to be turning so many things over in his mind, and to grow so confused, that I could not make it out. I sat thinking of it long after he had ascended to the clouds in a large watch-case, and still I could not make it out. I was still thinking of it when I came out of the theatre an hour afterwards, and found him waiting for me, near the door. "'How do you do?' said I, shaking hands with him as we turned down the street together. "'I saw that you saw me.' "'Saw you, Mr. Pip,' he returned. "'Yes, of course I saw you. But who else was there?' "'Who else?' "'It is the strangest thing,' said Mr. Wopsle, drifting into his lost look again, "'and yet I could swear to him.' Becoming alarmed, I entreated Mr. Wopsle to explain his meeting. "'Whether I should have noticed him at first but for your being there,' said Mr. Wopsle, going on in the same lost way, "'I can't be positive. Yet I think I should.' Involuntarily I looked round me, as I was accustomed to look round me when I went home, for these mysterious words gave me a chill. "'Oh, he can't be in sight,' said Mr. Wopsle. "'He went out before I went off. I saw him go.' 
Having the reason that I had for being suspicious, I even suspected this poor actor. I mistrusted a design to entrap me into some admission. Therefore I glanced at him as we walked on together, but said nothing. I had a ridiculous fancy that he must be with you, Mr. Pip, till I saw that you were quite unconscious of him, sitting behind you there like a ghost. My former chill crept over me again, but I was resolved not to speak yet, for it was quite consistent with his words that he might be set on to induce me to connect these references with Provis. Of course, I was perfectly sure and safe that Provis had not been there. I dare say you wonder at me, Mr. Pip. Indeed, I see you do. But it is so very strange. You will hardly believe what I am going to tell you. I could hardly believe it myself if you told me. Indeed, said I. No, indeed. Mr. Pip, you remember in old times, a certain Christmas day when you were quite a child, and I dined at Gargery's, and some soldiers came to the door to get a pair of handcuffs mended? I remember it very well. And you remember that there was a chase after two convicts, and that we joined in it, and that Gargery took you on his back, and that I took the lead, and you kept with me as well as you could? I remember it all very well. Better than he thought, except the last clause. And you remember that we came up with the two in a ditch, and that there was a scuffle between them, and that one of them had been severely handled and much mauled about the face by the other? I see it all before me. And that the soldiers lighted torches, and put the two in the centre, and that we went on to see the last of them, over the black marshes, with a torchlight shining on their faces. I am particular about that with the torchlight shining on their faces, when there was an outer ring of dark night all about us? Yes, said I. I remember all that. Then, Mr. Pip, one of those two prisoners sat behind you to-night. I saw him over your shoulder. Steady, I thought. I asked him then, Which of the two do you suppose you saw? the one who had been mauled, he answered readily, and I'll swear I saw him. The more I think of him, the more certain I am of him. This is very curious, said I, with the best assumption I could put on of its being nothing more to me. Very curious indeed. I cannot exaggerate the enhanced disquiet into which this conversation threw me, or the special and peculiar terror I felt at Compeyson's having been behind me, like a ghost. If he had ever been out of my thoughts for a few moments together since the hiding had begun, it was in those very moments when he was closest to me, and to think that I should be so unconscious and off my guard, after all my care, was as if I had shut an avenue of a hundred doors to keep him out, and then had found him at my elbow. I could not doubt, either, that he was there, because I was there, and that, however slight an appearance of danger there might be about us, danger was always near and active. I put such questions to Mr. Wopsle as, When did the man come in? He could not tell me that. He saw me, and over my shoulder he saw the man. It was not until he had seen him for some time that he began to identify him, but he had from the first vaguely associated him with me and known him as somehow belonging to me in the old village time. How was he dressed? Prosperously, but not noticeably otherwise, he thought, in black. Was his face at all disfigured? No, he believed not. I believed not, too, for although in my brooding state I had taken no especial notice of the people behind me, I thought it likely that a face at all disfigured would have attracted my attention. When Mr. Wopsle had imparted to me all that he could recall or I extract, and when I had treated him to a little appropriate refreshment, after the fatigues of the evening, we parted. It was between twelve and one o'clock when I reached the temple, and the gates were shut. No one was near me when I went in and went home. 
Herbert had come in, and we held a very serious council by the fire. But there was nothing to be done, saving to communicate to Wemmick what I had that night found out, and to remind him that we waited for his hint. As I thought that I might compromise him if I went too often to the castle, I made this communication by letter. I wrote it before I went to bed, and went out and posted it, and again no one was near me. Herbert and I agreed that we could do nothing else but be very cautious. And we were very cautious indeed, more cautious than before, if that were possible, and I, for my part, never went near Chink's Basin, except when I rode by, and then I only looked at Mill Pond Bank as I looked at anything else. End of chapter Chapter Forty Eight of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter Forty Eight. The second of the two meetings referred to in the last chapter occurred about a week after the first. I had again left my boat at the wharf below bridge. The time was an hour earlier in the afternoon, and undecided where to dine, I had strolled up into Cheapside, and was strolling along it, surely the most unsettled person in all the busy concourse, when a large hand was laid upon my shoulder by someone overtaking me. It was Mr. Jagger's hand, and he passed it through my arm. "'As we are going in the same direction, Pip, we may walk together. Where are you bound for?' "'For the temple, I think,' said I. "'Don't you know?' said Mr. Jaggers. "'Well,' I returned, glad for once to get the better of him in cross-examination, "'I do not know, for I have not made up my mind.' "'You are going to dine?' said Mr. Jaggers. "'You don't mind admitting that, I suppose?' No, I returned. I don't mind admitting that. And are not engaged? I don't mind admitting also that I am not engaged. Then, said Mr. Jaggers, come and dine with me. I was going to excuse myself when he added, When it's coming? So I changed my excuse into an acceptance, the few words I had uttered serving for the beginning of either, and we went along Cheapside and slanted off to Little Britain, where the lights were springing up brilliantly in the shop windows, and the street lamplighters, scarcely finding ground enough to plant their ladders on in the midst of the afternoon's bustle, were skipping up and down and running in and out, opening more red eyes in the gathering fog than my rushlight tower at the Hummins had opened white eyes in the ghostly wall. At the office in Little Britain there was the usual letter-writing, hand-washing, candle-snuffing, and safe-locking that closed the business of the day. As I stood idle by Mr. Jagger's fire, its rising and falling flame made the two casts on the shelf look as if they were playing a diabolical game of bow-peep with me, while the pair of coarse, fat office candles that dimly lighted Mr. Jagger's as he wrote in a corner were decorated with dirty winding-sheets as if in remembrance of a host of hanged clients. We went to Gerard Street, all three together, in a hackney coach, and, as soon as we got there, dinner was served. Although I should not have thought of making in that place the most distant reference by so much as a look to Wemmick's Walworth sentiments, yet I should have had no objection to catching his eye now and then in a friendly way. But it was not to be done. He turned his eyes on Mr. Jaggers whenever he raised them from the table, and was as dry and distant to me as if there were twin Wemmicks, and this was the wrong one. "'Did you send that note of Miss Havisham's to Mr. Pip, Wemmick?' Mr. Jaggers asked, soon after we began dinner. "'No, sir,' returned Wemmick. "'It was going by post when you brought Mr. Pip into the office. Here it is.' He handed it to his principal instead of to me. "'It's a note of two lines, Pip,' said Mr. Jaggers, handing it on. 
sent up to me by Miss Havisham on account of her not being sure of your address. She tells me that she wants to see you on a little matter of business you mentioned to her. You'll go down? Yes, said I, casting my eyes over the note, which was exactly in those terms. When do you think of going down? I have an impending engagement, said I, glancing at Wemmick, who was putting fish into the post-office, that renders me rather uncertain of my time. At once, I think. If Mr. Pip has the intention of going at once, said Wemmick to Mr. Jaggers, he needn't write an answer, you know. Receiving this as an intimation that it was best not to delay, I settled that I would go to-morrow, and said so. Wemmick drank a glass of wine, and looked with a grimly satisfied air at Mr. Jaggers, but not at me. "'So, Pip, our friend the Spider,' said Mr. Jaggers, "'has played his cards. He has won the pool.' It was as much as I could do to assent. "'Ha! He is a promising fellow, in his way, but he may not have it all his own way. The stronger will win in the end.' but the stronger has to be found out first. If he should turn to and beat her— Surely, I interrupted with a burning face and heart, you do not seriously think that he is scoundrel enough for that, Mr. Jaggers? I didn't say so, Pip. I am putting a case. If he should turn to and beat her, he may possibly get the strength on his side. If it should be a question of intellect, he certainly will not. It would be chance work to give an opinion how a fellow of that sort will turn out in such circumstances, because it's a toss-up between two results. May I ask what they are? A fellow like our friend the spider, answered Mr. Jaggers, either beats or cringes. He may cringe and growl, or cringe and not growl but he either beats or cringes. Ask Wemmick his opinion. "'Either beats or cringes,' said Wemmick, not at all addressing himself to me. "'So here's to Mrs. Bentley Drummle,' said Mr. Jaggers, taking a decanter of choicer wine from his dumb-waiter, and filling for each of us and for himself. "'And may the question of supremacy be settled to the lady's satisfaction.' To the satisfaction of the lady and the gentleman, it never will be. <laughs> now, Molly, 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 how slow you are today. She was at his elbow when he addressed her, putting a dish upon the table. As she withdrew her hands from it, she fell back a step or two, nervously muttering some excuse, and a certain action of her fingers as she spoke arrested my attention. What's the matter? said Mr. Jaggers. "'Nothing. Only the subject we were speaking of,' said I, "'was rather painful to me.' The action of her fingers was like the action of knitting. She stood looking at her master, not understanding whether she was free to go, or whether he had more to say to her and would call her back if she did go. Her look was very intent. Surely I had seen exactly such eyes and such hands on a memorable occasion very lately. He dismissed her, and she glided out of the room. But she remained before me as plainly as if she were still there. I looked at those hands. I looked at those eyes. I looked at that flowing hair, and I compared them with other hands, other eyes, other hair that I knew of and with what those might be after twenty years of a brutal husband and a stormy life. I looked again at those hands and eyes of the housekeeper, and thought of the inexplicable feeling that had come over me when I last walked, not alone, in the ruined garden and through the deserted brewery. I thought how the same feeling had come back when I saw a face looking at me, and a hand waving to me from a stagecoach window and how it had come back again and had flashed about me like lightning when I had passed in a carriage, not alone, through a sudden glare of light in a dark street. I thought how one link of association had helped that identification in the theatre, and how such a link, wanting before, had been riveted for me now, when I had passed by a chance, swift from Estella's name to the fingers with their knitting action, 
and the attentive eyes, and I felt absolutely certain that this woman was Estella's mother. Mr. Jaggers had seen me with Estella, and was not likely to have missed the sentiments I had been at no pains to conceal. He nodded when I said the subject was painful to me, clapped me on the back, put round the wine again, and went on with his dinner. Only twice more did the housekeeper reappear, and then her stay in the room was very short, and Mr. Jaggers was sharp with her. But her hands were Estella's hands, and her eyes were Estella's eyes, and if she had reappeared a hundred times I could have been neither more sure nor less sure that my conviction was the truth. It was a dull evening, for Wemmick drew his wine, when it came round, quite as a matter of business, just as he might have drawn his salary when that came round, and with his eyes on his chief sat in a state of perpetual readiness for cross-examination. As to the quantity of wine, his post-office was as indifferent and ready as any other post-office for its quantity of letters. From my point of view, he was the wrong twin all the time, and only externally like the Wemmick of Walworth. We took our leave early and left together. Even when we were groping among Mr. Jagger's stock of boots for our hats, I felt that the right twin was on his way back, and we had not gone half a dozen yards down Gerard Street in the Walworth direction before I found that I was walking arm in arm with the right twin, and that the wrong twin had evaporated into the evening air. Well, said Wemmick, that's over. He's a wonderful man without his living likeness, but I feel that I have to screw myself up when I dine with him, and I dine more comfortably unscrewed. I felt that this was a good statement of the case, and told him so. "'Wouldn't say it to anybody but yourself,' he answered. "'I know that what is said between you and me goes no further.' I asked him if he had ever seen Miss Havisham's adopted daughter, Mrs. Bentley Drummle. He said no. To avoid being too abrupt, I then spoke of the aged and of Miss Skiffins. He looked rather sly when I mentioned Miss Skiffins, and stopped in the street to blow his nose, with a roll of the head, and a flourish not quite free from latent boastfulness. "'Wemmick,' said I, "'do you remember telling me, before I first went to Mr. Jagger's private house, to notice that housekeeper?' "'Did I?' he replied. "'Ah, I dare say I did. Deuce take me,' he added suddenly. "'I know I did. I find I am not quite unscrewed yet.' "'A wild beast tamed, you called her.' "'And what do you call her?' "'The same. How did Mr. Jaggers tame her, Wemmick?' "'That's his secret. She has been with him many a long year.' I wish you would tell me her story. I feel a particular interest in being acquainted with it. You know that what is said between you and me goes no further. Well, Wemmick replied, I don't know her story. That is, I don't know all of it. But what I do know I'll tell you. We are in our private and personal capacities, of course. Of course. A score or so of years ago, that woman was tried at the Old Bailey for murder, and was acquitted. She was a very handsome young woman, and I believe had some gypsy blood in her. Anyhow, it was hot enough when it was up, as you may suppose. But she was acquitted. Mr. Jaggers was for her, pursued Wemmick with a look full of meaning, and worked the case in a way quite astonishing. It was a desperate case, and it was comparatively early days with him then, and he worked it to general admiration. In fact, it may almost be said to have made him. He worked it himself at the police office, day after day, for many days, contending against even a committal, and at the trial, where he couldn't work it himself, sat under counsel, and, everyone knew, put in all the salt and pepper. The murdered person was a woman, a woman a good ten years older, very much larger, and very much stronger. It was a case of jealousy. 
They both led tramping lives, and this woman in Gerard Street here had been married very young, over the broomstick, as we say, to a tramping man, and was a perfect fury in point of jealousy. The murdered woman, more a match for the man certainly in point of years, was found dead in a bar near Hounslow Heath. There had been a violent struggle, perhaps a fight. She was bruised and scratched and torn, and had been hailed by the throat at last and choked. Now, there was no reasonable evidence to implicate any person but this woman, and on the improbabilities of her having been able to do it, Mr. Jaggers principally rested his case. You may be sure, said Wemmick, touching me on the sleeve, that he never dwelt upon the strength of her hands then, though he sometimes does now. I had told Wemmick of his showing us her wrists that day of the dinner-party. "'Well, sir,' Wemmick went on, "'it happened, happened, don't you see, that this woman was so very artfully dressed from the time of her apprehension that she looked much slighter than she really was, in particular. Her sleeves are always remembered to have been so skilfully contrived that her arms had quite a delicate look.' She had only a bruise or two about her, nothing for a tramp. But the backs of her hands were lacerated, and the question was, was it with finger-nails? Now Mr. Jagger showed that she had struggled through a great lot of brambles which were not as high as her face, but which she could not have got through and kept her hands out of, and bits of those brambles were actually found in her skin and put in evidence as well as the fact that the brambles in question were found on examination to have been broken through, and to have little shreds of her dress and little spots of blood upon them here and there. But the boldest point he made was this. It was attempted to be set up, in proof of her jealousy, that she was under strong suspicion of having, at about the time of the murder, frantically destroyed her child by this man, some three years old, to revenge herself upon him. Mr. Jaggers worked that in this way. We say these are not marks of fingernails, but marks of brambles, and we show you the brambles. You say they are marks of fingernails, and you set up the hypothesis that she destroyed her child. You must accept all consequences of that hypothesis. For anything we know, she may have destroyed her child and the child in clinging to her may have scratched her hands. What then? You are not trying her for the murder of her child. Why don't you? As to this case, if you will have scratches, we say that, for anything we know, you may have accounted for them, assuming for the sake of argument that you have not invented them. To sum up, sir, said Wemmick, Mr. Jaggers was altogether too many for the jury, and they gave in. Has she been in his service ever since? Yes, but not only that, said Wemmick. She went into his service immediately after her acquittal, tamed as she is now. She has since been taught one thing and another in the way of her duties, but she was tamed from the beginning. Do you remember the sex of the child? Said to have been a girl. You have nothing more to say to me to-night? Nothing. I got your letter and destroyed it. Nothing. We exchanged a cordial good night, and I went home with new matter for my thoughts, though with no relief from the old. End of chapter Chapter Forty Nine of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter Forty Nine. Putting Miss Havisham's note in my pocket, 
that it might serve as my credentials for so soon reappearing at Satis House, in case her waywardness should lead her to express any surprise at seeing me, I went down again by the coach next day. But I alighted at the halfway house, and breakfasted there, and walked the rest of the distance, for I sought to get into the town quietly by the unfrequented ways, and to leave it in the same manner. The best light of the day was gone when I passed along the quiet echoing courts behind the high street. The nooks of ruin where the old monks had once had their refectories and gardens, and where the strong walls were now pressed into the service of humble sheds and stables, were almost as silent as the old monks in their graves. The cathedral chimes had at once a sadder and a more remote sound to me, as I hurried on avoiding observation, than they had ever had before. So the swell of the old organ was borne to my ears like funeral music, and the rooks, as they hovered about the grey tower and swung in the bare high trees of the priory garden, seemed to call to me that the place was changed and that Estella was gone out of it for ever. An elderly woman, whom I had seen before as one of the servants who lived in the supplementary house across the back courtyard, opened the gate. The lighted candle stood in the dark passage within, as of old, and I took it up and ascended the staircase, alone. Miss Havisham was not in her own room, but was in the larger room across the landing. Looking in at the door, after knocking in vain, I saw her sitting on the hearth in a ragged chair, close before, and lost in the contemplation of, the ashy fire. Doing as I had often done, I went in, and stood touching the old chimney-piece, where she could see me when she raised her eyes. There was an air of utter loneliness upon her, that would have moved me to pity, though she had wilfully done me a deeper injury than I could charge her with. As I stood compassionating her, and thinking how, in the progress of time, I too had come to be a part of the wrecked fortunes of that house, her eyes rested on me. She stared, and said in a low voice, "'Is it real?' "'It is I, Pip. Mr. Jaggers gave me your note yesterday, and I have lost no time. Thank you, thank you. As I brought another of the ragged chairs to the hearth and sat down, I remarked a new expression on her face, as if she were afraid of me. I went, she said, to pursue that subject you mentioned to me when you were last here, and to show you that I am not all stone, but perhaps you can never believe now that there is anything human in my heart? When I said some reassuring words, she stretched out her tremulous right hand, as though she was going to touch me, but she recalled it again before I understood the action, or knew how to receive it. You said, speaking for your friend, that you could tell me how to do something useful and good. Something that you would like done, is it not? Something that I would like done very much. What is it? I began explaining to her that secret history of the partnership. I had not got far into it, when I judged from her looks that she was thinking in a discursive way of me, rather than of what I said. It seemed to be so, for when I stopped speaking, many moments passed before she showed that she was conscious of the fact. "'Do you break off?' she asked then, with her former air of being afraid of me. "'Because you hate me so much to bear to speak to me?' "'No, no,' I answered. "'How can you think so, Miss Havisham? I stopped because I thought you were not following what I said.' "'Perhaps I was not,' she answered, putting a hand to her head. "'Begin again, and let me look at something else.' Stay. Now tell me. She set her hand upon her stick in the resolute way that sometimes was habitual to her, and looked at the fire with a strong expression of forcing herself to attend. I went on with my explanation, and told her how I had hoped to complete the transaction out of my means, but how in this I was disappointed. That part of the subject, I reminded her, 
involved matters which could form no part of my explanation, for they were the weighty secrets of another. So, said she, assenting with her head, but not looking at me, and how much money is wanting to complete the purchase? I was rather afraid of stating it, for it sounded a large sum. Nine hundred pounds. If I give you the money for this purpose, will you keep my secret as you have kept your own? Quite as faithfully. And your mind will be more at rest? Much more at rest. "'Are you very unhappy now?' She asked this question still without looking at me, but in an unwanted tone of sympathy. I could not reply at the moment, for my voice failed me. She put her left arm across the head of her stick, and softly laid her forehead on it. "'I am far from happy, Miss Havisham, but I have other causes of disquiet than any you know of. They are the secrets I have mentioned. After a little while she raised her head and looked at the fire again. It is noble in you to tell me that you have other causes of unhappiness. Is it true? Too true. Can I only serve you, Pip, by serving your friend? Regarding that as done, is there nothing I can do for you yourself? Nothing. I thank you for the question. I thank you even more for the tone of the question. But there is nothing. She presently rose from her seat, and looked about the blighted room for the means of writing. There were none there, and she took from her pocket a yellow set of ivory tablets, mounted in tarnished gold, and wrote upon them with a pencil in a case of tarnished gold that hung from her neck. "'You are still on friendly terms with Mr. Jaggers?' "'Quite. I dined with him yesterday.' "'This is an authority to him to pay you that money, to lay out at your irresponsible discretion for your friend. I keep no money here, but if you would rather Mr. Jaggers knew nothing of the matter, I will send it to you.' "'Thank you, Miss Havisham.' I have not the least objection to receiving it from him. She read me what she had written, and it was direct and clear, and evidently intended to absolve me from any suspicion of profiting by the receipt of the money. I took the tablets from her hand, and it trembled again, and it trembled more as she took off the chain to which the pencil was attached, and put it in mine. All this she did without looking at me. My name is on the first leaf. If you can ever write under my name, I forgive her, though ever so long after my broken heart is dust, pray do it. Oh, Miss Havisham, said I, I can do it now. There have been sore mistakes, and my life has been a blind and thankless one, and I want forgiveness and direction far too much to be bitter with you. She turned her face to me for the first time since she had averted it, and to my amazement, I may even add to my terror, dropped on her knees at my feet, with her folded hands raised to me in the manner in which, when her poor heart was young and fresh and whole, they must often have been raised to heaven from her mother's side. To see her with her white hair and her worn face kneeling at my feet gave me a shock through all my frame. I entreated her to rise, and got my arms about her to help her up, but she only pressed that hand of mine which was nearest to her grasp, and hung her head over it, and wept. I had never seen her shed a tear before, and, in the hope that the relief might do her good, I bent over her without speaking. She was not kneeling now, but was down upon the ground. Oh! she cried despairingly. What have I done? What have I done? If you mean, Miss Havisham, what have you done to injure me, let me answer. Very little. I should have loved her under any circumstances. 
Is she married? Yes. It was a needless question, for a new desolation in the desolate house had told me so. What have I done? What have I done? She wrung her hands and crushed her white hair, and returned to this cry over and over again. What have I done? I knew not how to answer, or how to comfort her. That she had done a grievous thing in taking an impressionable child to mould into the form that her wild resentment, spurned affection, and wounded pride found vengeance in, I knew full well. But that, in shutting out the light of day, she had shut out infinitely more, that in seclusion she had secluded herself from a thousand natural and healing influences, that her mind, brooding solitary, had grown diseased, as all minds do and must and will that reverse the appointed order of their maker, I knew equally well. And could I look upon her without compassion, seeing her punishment and the ruin she was, in her profound unfitness for this earth on which she was placed, in the vanity of sorrow, which had become a master mania, like the vanity of penitence, the vanity of remorse, the vanity of unworthiness, and other monstrous vanities that have been curses in this world? Until you spoke to her the other day, and until I saw in you a looking-glass that showed me what I once felt myself, I did not know what I had done. What have I done? What have I done? And so again, twenty, fifty times over, what had she done? Miss Havisham, I said, when her cry had died away, you may dismiss me from your mind and conscience, but Estella is a different case, and if you can ever undo any scrap of what you have done amiss in keeping a part of her right nature away from her, it will be better to do that than to bemoan the past through a hundred years. Yes, yes, I know it, but Pip, my dear, there was an earnest womanly compassion for me and her new affection. My dear, believe this, when she first came to me, I meant to save her from misery like my own. At first I meant no more. Well, well, said I, I hope so. But as she grew and promised to be very beautiful, I gradually did worse, and with my praises, and with my jewels, and with my teachings, and with this figure of myself always before her, a warning to back and point my lessons. I stole her heart away and put ice in its place. Better, I could not help saying, to have left her a natural heart, even to be bruised or broken. With that Miss Havisham looked distractedly at me for a while, and then burst out again, what had she done? If you knew all my story, she pleaded, you would have some compassion for me and a better understanding of me. Miss Havisham, I answered as delicately as I could, I believe I may say that I do know your story, and have known it ever since I first left this neighbourhood. It has inspired me with great commiseration, and I hope I understand it and its influences. Does what has passed between us— Give me any excuse for asking you a question relative to Estella? Not as she is, but as she was when she first came here? She was seated on the ground, with her arms on the ragged chair, and her head leaning on them. She looked full at me when I said this, and replied, Go on. Whose child was Estella? She shook her head. You don't know? She shook her head again. But Mr. Jaggers brought her here, or sent her here? Brought her here. Will you tell me how that came about? She answered in a low whisper, and with caution. I had been shut up in these rooms a long time. I don't know how long. You know what time the clocks keep here. 
when I told him that I wanted a little girl to rear and love, and save from my fate. I had first seen him when I sent for him to lay this play waste for me, having read of him in the newspapers, before I and the world parted. He told me that he would look about him for such an orphan child. One night he brought her here, asleep, and I called her Estella. Might I ask her age, then? Two or three? She herself knows nothing, but that she was left an orphan, and I adopted her. So convinced I was of that woman's being her mother, that I wanted no evidence to establish the fact in my own mind. But to any mind, I thought, the connection here was clear and straight. What more could I hope to do by prolonging the interview? I had succeeded on behalf of Herbert, Miss Havisham had told me all she knew of Estella, I had said and done what I could to ease her mind. No matter with what other words we parted, we parted. Twilight was closing in when I went downstairs into the natural air. I called to the woman who had opened the gate when I entered, that I would not trouble her just yet, but would walk round the place before leaving for I had a presentiment that I should never be there again, and I felt that the dying light was suited to my last view of it. By the wilderness of casks that I had walked on long ago, and on which the rain of years had fallen since, rotting them in many places, and leaving miniature swamps and pools of water upon those that stood on end, I made my way to the ruined garden. I went all round it, round by the corner where Herbert and I had fought our battle, round by the paths where Estella and I had walked, so cold, so lonely, so dreary all. Taking the brewery on my way back, I raised the rusty latch of a little door at the garden end of it and walked through. I was going out at the opposite door, not easy to open now, for the damp wood had started and swelled, and the hinges were yielding, and the threshold was encumbered with a growth of fungus, when I turned my head to look back. A childish association revived with wonderful force in the moment of the slight action, and I fancied that I saw Miss Havisham hanging to the beam. So strong was the impression that I stood under the beam, shuddering from head to foot before I knew it was a fancy, though to be sure I was there in an instant. The mournfulness of the place and time, and the great terror of this illusion, though it was but momentary, caused me to feel an indescribable awe as I came out between the open wooden gates where I had once wrung my hair after Estella had wrung my heart. Passing on into the front courtyard, I hesitated whether to call the woman to let me out at the locked gate, of which she had the key or first to go upstairs and assure myself that Miss Havisham was as safe and well as I had left her. I took the latter course and went up. I looked into the room where I had left her, and saw her seated in the ragged chair upon the hearth, close to the fire, with her back towards me. In the moment when I was withdrawing my head to go quietly away, I saw a great flaming light spring up. In the same moment I saw her running at me, shrieking, with a whirl of fire blazing all about her, and soaring at least as many feet above her head as she was high. I had a double-caped great coat on, and over my arm another thick coat. That I got them off, closed with her, threw her down, and got them over her, that I dragged the great cloth from the table for the same purpose, and with it dragged down the heap of rottenness in the midst, and all the ugly things that sheltered there, that we were on the ground struggling like desperate enemies, and that the closer I covered her, the more wildly she shrieked and tried to free herself. That this occurred, I knew through the result, but not through anything I felt, or thought, or knew I did. I knew nothing until I knew that we were on the floor by the great table, and that patches of tinder yet alight were floating in the smoky air, which a moment ago had been her faded bridal dress. Then I looked round and saw the disturbed beetles and spiders running away over the floor, and the servants coming in with breathless cries at the door. 
I still held her forcibly down with all my strength, like a prisoner who might escape, and I doubt if I even knew who she was, or why we had struggled, or that she had been in flames, or that the flames were out, until I saw the patches of tinder that had been her garments no longer alight, but falling in a black shower around us. She was insensible, and I was afraid to have her moved or even touched. Assistance was sent for, and I held her until it came, as if I unreasonably fancied, I think I did, that, if I let her go, the fire would break out again and consume her. When I got up, on the surgeon's coming to her with other aid, I was astonished to see that both my hands were burnt, for I had no knowledge of it through the sense of feeling. On examination it was pronounced that she had received serious hurts, but that they of themselves were far from hopeless, the danger lay mainly in the nervous shock. By the surgeon's directions her bed was carried into that room and laid upon the great table, which happened to be well suited to the dressing of her injuries. When I saw her again an hour afterwards, she lay indeed where I had seen her strike her stick, and had heard her say that she would lie one day. Though every vestige of her dress was burnt, as they told me, she still had something of her old ghastly bridal appearance, for they had covered her to the throat with white cotton wool, and as she lay with a white sheet loosely overlying that, the phantom air of something that had been and was changed was still upon her. I found, on questioning the servants, that Estella was in Paris, and I got a promise from the surgeon that he would write to her by the next post. Miss Havisham's family I took upon myself, intending to communicate with Mr. Matthew Pocket only, and leave him to do as he liked about informing the rest. This I did next day, through Herbert, as soon as I returned to town. There was a stage that evening, when she spoke collectedly of what had happened, though with a certain terrible vivacity. Towards midnight she began to wander in her speech, and after that it gradually set in that she said innumerable times in a low, solemn voice, "'What have I done?' And then, "'When she first came I meant to save her from misery like mine.' And then, "'Take the pencil and write under my name. I forgive her.' She never changed the order of these three sentences, but she sometimes left out a word in one or other of them, never putting in another word, but always leaving a blank and going on to the next word. As I could do no service there, and as I had, nearer home, that pressing reason for anxiety and fear which even her wanderings could not drive out of my mind, I decided, in the course of the night, that I would return by the early morning coach, walking a mile or so, and being taken up clear of the town. At about six o'clock of the morning, therefore, I leaned over her and touched her lips with mine, just as they said, not stopping for being touched, "'Take the pencil and write unto my name. I forgive her.'" End of chapter Chapter 50 of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter 50. My hands had been dressed twice or thrice in the night, and again in the morning. My left arm was a good deal burned to the elbow, and, less severely, as high as the shoulder. It was very painful, but the flames had set in that direction, and I felt thankful it was no worse. My right hand was not so badly burnt, but that I could move the fingers. It was bandaged, of course, but much less inconveniently than my left hand and arm, those I carried in a sling, and I could only wear my coat like a cloak, 
loose over my shoulders and fastened at the neck. My hair had been caught by the fire, but not my head or face. When Herbert had been down to Hammersmith and seen his father, he came back to me at our chambers, and devoted the day to attending on me. He was the kindest of nurses, and at stated times took off the bandages, and steeped them in the cooling liquid that was kept ready, and put them on again, with a patient tenderness that I was deeply grateful for. At first, as I lay quiet on the sofa, I found it painfully difficult, I might say impossible, to get rid of the impression of the glare of the flames, their hurry and noise, and the fierce burning smell. If I dozed for a minute, I was awakened by Miss Havisham's cries, and by her running at me with all that height of fire above her head. This pain of the mind was much harder to strive against than any bodily pain I suffered, and Herbert, seeing that, did his utmost to hold my attention engaged. Neither of us spoke of the boat, but we both thought of it. That was made apparent by our avoidance of the subject, and by our agreeing, without agreement, to make my recovery of the use of my hands a question of so many hours, not of so many weeks. My first question when I saw Herbert had been, of course, whether all was well down the river. As he replied in the affirmative, with perfect confidence and cheerfulness, we did not resume the subject until the day was wearing away. But then, as Herbert changed the bandages, more by the light of the fire than by the outer light, he went back to it spontaneously. "'I sat with Provis last night, Handel, two good hours.' "'Where was Clara?' "'Dear little thing,' said Herbert. "'She was up and down with Gruff and Grim all the evening.' He was perpetually pegging at the floor the moment she left his sight. I doubt if he can hold out long, though. What with rum and pepper, and pepper and rum, I should think his pegging must be nearly over. And then you will be married, Herbert? How can I take care of the dear child otherwise? Lay your arm out upon the back of the sofa, my dear boy, and I'll sit down here and get the bandage off so gradually that you shall not know when it comes. I was speaking of Provis. Do you know, Handel, he improves? I said to you I thought he was softened when I last saw him. So you did, and so he is. He was very communicative last night, and told me more of his life. You remember his breaking off here about some woman that he had had great trouble with? Did I hurt you? I had started, but not under his touch. His words had given me a start. I had forgotten that, Herbert, but I remember it now you speak of it. Well, he went into that part of his life, and a dark, wild part it is. Shall I tell you? Or would it worry you just now? Tell me by all means, every word. Herbert bent forward to look at me more nearly, as if my reply had been rather more hurried or more eager than he could quite account for. "'Your head is cool?' he said, touching it. "'Quite,' said I. "'Tell me what Provis said, my dear Herbert.' "'It seems,' said Herbert, "'there's a bandage off most charmingly, and now comes the cool one. Makes you shrink at first, my poor dear fellow, don't it? But it will be comfortable presently. It seems that the woman was a young woman.' and a jealous woman, and a revengeful woman, revengeful handle to the last degree. To what last degree? Murder! Does it strike too cold on that sensitive place? I don't feel it. How did she murder? Whom did she murder? Why, the deed may not have merited quite so terrible a name, said Herbert, but— she was tried for it, and Mr. Jaggers defended her, and the reputation of that defence first made his name known to Provis. It was another and a stronger woman who was the victim, and there had been a struggle, in a barn. Who began it, or how fair it was, or how unfair, may be doubtful, but how it ended is certainly not doubtful, for the victim was found throttled. Was the woman brought in guilty? No. 
She was acquitted. My poor Handel, I hurt you. It is impossible to be gentler, Herbert. Yes, what else? The acquitted young woman in Provis had a little child, a little child of whom Provis was exceedingly fond. On the evening of the very night when the object of her jealousy was strangled, as I tell you, the young woman presented herself before Provis for one moment, and swore that she would destroy the child, which was in her possession, and he should never see it again. Then she vanished. There's the worst arm comfortably in the sling once more, and now there remains but the right hand, which is a far easier job. I can do it better by this light than by a stronger for my hand is steadiest when I don't see the poor blistered patches too distinctly. You don't think your breathing is affected, my dear boy. You seem to breathe quickly. Perhaps I do, Herbert. Did the woman keep her oath? There comes the darkest part of Provis's life. She did. That is, he says she did. Oh, why, of course, my dear boy returned Herbert in a tone of surprise, and again bending forward to get a nearer look at me. He says it all. I have no other information. No, to be sure. Now, whether, pursued Herbert, he had used the child's mother ill, or whether he had used the child's mother well, Provis doesn't say, but she had shared some four or five years of the wretched life he described to us at this fireside, and he seems to have felt pity for her, and forbearance towards her. Therefore, fearing he should be called upon to depose about this destroyed child, and so be the cause of her death, he hid himself, much as he grieved for the child, kept himself dark, as he says, out of the way and out of the trial, and was only vaguely talked of as a certain man called Abel, out of whom the jealousy arose. After the acquittal she disappeared, and thus he lost the child and the child's mother. I want to ask, a moment, my dear boy, and I have done. That evil genius, Compison, the worst of scoundrels among many scoundrels, knowing of his keeping out of the way at that time, and of his reasons for doing so, of course afterwards held the knowledge over his head as a means of keeping him poorer and working him harder. It was clear last night that this barbed the point of Provis's animosity. "'I want to know,' said I, "'and particularly, Herbert, whether he told you when this happened.' "'Particularly? Let me remember, then, what he said as to that. His impression was— a round score a year ago, and almost directly after I took up with Compison. How old were you when you came upon him in the little churchyard? I think in my seventh year. Aye, it had happened some three or four years then, he said, and you brought into his mind the little girl so tragically lost, who would have been about your age. Herbert, said I, after a short silence, in a hurried way. Can you see me best by the light of the window, or the light of the fire? By the firelight, answered Herbert, coming close again. Look at me. I do look at you, my dear boy. Touch me. I do touch you, my dear boy. You are not afraid that I am in any fever— or that my head is much disordered by the accident of last night? No, my dear boy, said Herbert, after taking time to examine me. You are rather excited, but you are quite yourself. I know I am quite myself, and the man we have in hiding down the river is Estella's father. End of chapter Chapter Fifty One of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. 
Great Expectations by Charles Dickens Chapter 51 What purpose I had in view when I was hot on tracing out and proving Estella's parentage, I cannot say. It will presently be seen that the question was not before me in a distinct shape until it was put before me by a wiser head than my own. But when Herbert and I had held our momentous conversation, I was seized with a feverish conviction that I ought to hunt the matter down, that I ought not to let it rest, but that I ought to see Mr. Jaggers, and come at the bare truth. I really do not know whether I felt that I did this for Estella's sake, or whether I was glad to transfer to the man in whose preservation I was so much concerned, some rays of the romantic interest that had so long surrounded me. Perhaps the latter possibility may be the nearer to the truth. Anyway, I could scarcely be withheld from going out to Gerard Street that night. Herbert's representations that, if I did, I should probably be laid up and stricken useless, when our fugitive's safety would depend upon me, alone restrained my impatience. On the understanding, again and again reiterated, that, come what would, I was to go to Mr. Jagger's to-morrow, I at length submitted to keep quiet, and to have my hurts looked after, and to stay at home. Early next morning we went out together, and at the corner of Giltspur Street by Smithfield, I left Herbert to go his way into the city, and took my way to Little Britain. There were periodical occasions when Mr. Jaggers and Wemmick went over the office accounts, and checked off the vouchers, and put all things straight. On these occasions Wemmick took his books and papers into Mr. Jaggers' room, and one of the upstairs clerks came down into the outer office. Finding such clerk on Wemmick's post that morning, I knew what was going on, but I was not sorry to have Mr. Jaggers and Wemmick together, as Wemmick would then hear for himself that I said nothing to compromise him. My appearance, with my arm bandaged and my coat loose over my shoulders, favoured my object. Although I had sent Mr. Jaggers a brief account of the accident, as soon as I had arrived in town, yet I had to give him all the details now, and the speciality of the occasion caused our talk to be less dry and hard, and less strictly regulated by the rules of evidence, than it had been before. When I described the disaster, Mr. Jaggers stood, according to his wont, before the fire. Wemmick leaned back in his chair, staring at me, with his hands in the pockets of his trousers, and his pen put horizontally into the post. The two brutal casts, always inseparable in my mind from the official proceedings, seemed to be congestively considering whether they didn't smell fire at the present moment. My narrative finished, and their questions exhausted, I then produced Miss Havisham's authority to receive the nine hundred pounds for Herbert. Mr. Jaggers's eyes retired a little deeper into his head when I handed him the tablets, but he presently handed them over to Wemmick, with instructions to draw the check for his signature. While that was in course of being done, I looked on at Wemmick as he wrote, and Mr. Jaggers, poising and swaying himself on his well-polished boots, looked on at me. "'I am sorry, Pip,' said he, as I put the check in my pocket when he had signed it, "'that we do nothing for you.' "'Miss Havisham was good enough to ask me,' I returned, "'whether she could do nothing for me, and I told her no.' "'Everybody should know his own business,' said Mr. Jaggers, and I saw Wemmick's lips form the words, "'Portable Property.' "'I should not have told her no if I had been you,' said Mr. Jaggers. "'But every man ought to know his own business best.' "'Every man's business,' said Wemmick, rather reproachfully towards me, "'is portable property.' As I thought the time was now come for pursuing the theme I had at heart, I said, turning on Mr. Jaggers, "'I did ask something of Miss Havisham, however, sir.' I asked her to give me some information relative to her adopted daughter, and she gave me all she possessed. "'Did she?' said Mr. Jaggers, bending forward to look at his boots, and then straightening himself. "'Ha! I don't think I should have done so if I had been Miss Havisham. But she ought to know her own business best.' 
"'I know more of the history of Miss Havisham's adopted child than Miss Havisham herself does, sir. I know her mother.' Mr. Jaggers looked at me inquiringly, and repeated, "'Mother?' "'I have seen her mother within these three days.' "'Yes,' said Mr. Jaggers. "'And so have you, sir. And you have seen her still more recently.' "'Yes,' said Mr. Jaggers. "'Perhaps I know more of Estella's history than even you do,' said I. "'I know her father, too.' A certain stop that Mr. Jaggers came to in his manner— he was too self-possessed to change his manner, but he could not help its being brought to an indefinably attentive stop, assured me that he did not know who her father was. This I had strongly suspected from Provis's account, as Herbert had repeated it, of his having kept himself dark, which I pieced on to the fact that he himself was not Mr. Jagger's client until some four years later, and when he could have no reason for claiming his identity." but I could not be sure of this unconsciousness on Mr. Jagger's part before, though I was quite sure of it now. "'So, you know the young lady's father, Pip?' said Mr. Jaggers. "'Yes,' I replied, "'and his name is Provis, from New South Wales.' Even Mr. Jaggers started when I said those words. It was the slightest start that could escape a man." the most carefully repressed and the sooner checked, but he did start, though he made it a part of the action of taking out his pocket-handkerchief. How Wemmick received the announcement I am unable to say, for I was afraid to look at him just then, lest Mr. Jagger's sharpness should detect that there had been some communication unknown to him between us. "'And on what evidence, Pip?' asked Mr. Jaggers very coolly as he paused with his handkerchief halfway to his nose, "'Does Provis make this claim?' "'He does not make it,' said I, "'and has never made it, and has no knowledge or belief that his daughter is in existence.' For once the powerful pocket-handkerchief failed. My reply was so unexpected that Mr. Jaggers put the handkerchief back into his pocket without completing the usual performance— folded his arms, and looked with stern attention at me, though with an immovable face. Then I told him all I knew, and how I knew it, with the one reservation that I left him to infer that I knew from Miss Havisham what I in fact knew from Wemmick. I was very careful indeed as to that. Nor did I look towards Wemmick until I had finished all I had to tell, and had been for some time silently meeting Mr. Jagger's look, when I did at last turn my eyes in Wemmick's direction, I found that he had unposted his pen, and was intent upon the table before him. "'Ha!' said Mr. Jaggers, at last, as he moved towards the papers on the table. "'What item was it you were at, Wemmick, when Mr. Pip came in?' But I could not submit to be thrown off in that way, and I made a passionate, almost an indignant appeal— to him to be more frank and manly with me. I reminded him of the false hopes into which I had lapsed, the length of time they had lasted, and the discovery I had made, and I hinted at the danger that weighed upon my spirits. I represented myself as being surely worthy of some little confidence from him, in return for the confidence I had just now imparted. I said that I did not blame him, or suspect him, or mistrust him, but I wanted assurance of the truth from him. And if he asked me why I wanted it, and why I thought I had any right to it, I would tell him, little as he cared for such poor dreams, that I had loved Estella dearly and long, and that although I had lost her, and must live a bereaved life, whatever concerned her was still nearer and dearer to me than anything else in the world. And seeing that Mr. Jagger stood quite still and silent, and apparently quite obdurate under this appeal, I turned to Wemmick and said, "'Wemmick, I know you to be a man with a gentle heart. I have seen your pleasant home, and your old father, and all the innocent, cheerful, playful ways with which you refresh your business life. And I entreat you to say a word for me to Mr. Jaggers, and to represent to him that, all circumstances considered, he ought to be more open with me. 
I have never seen two men look more oddly at one another than Mr. Jaggers and Wemmick did after this apostrophe. At first a misgiving crossed me that Wemmick would be instantly dismissed from his employment, but it melted as I saw Mr. Jaggers relax into something like a smile, and Wemmick became bolder. "'What's all this?' said Mr. Jaggers. "'You with an old father, and you with pleasant and playful ways?' "'Well,' returned Wemmick, "'if I don't bring him here, what does it matter?' "'Pip,' said Mr. Jaggers, laying his hand upon my arm and smiling openly, "'this man must be the most cunning impostor in all London.' "'Not a bit of it,' returned Wemmick, growing bolder and bolder. "'I think you're another.' Again they exchanged their former odd looks, each apparently still distrustful that the other was taking him in. "'You with a pleasant home?' said Mr. Jaggers. "'Since it don't interfere with business,' returned Wemmick, "'let it be so. Now I look at you, sir. I shouldn't wonder if you might be planning and contriving to have a pleasant home of your own, one of these days, when you're tired of all this work.' Mr. Jaggers nodded his head retrospectively two or three times, and actually drew a sigh. "'Pip,' said he, "'we won't talk about poor dreams, and you know more about such things than I, having much fresher experience of that kind. But now about this other matter. I'll put a case to you. Mind, I admit nothing.' He waited for me to declare that I quite understood that he expressly said that he admitted nothing. "'Now, Pip,' said Mr. Jaggers, "'put this case. Put the case that a woman, under such circumstances as you have mentioned, held her child concealed, and was obliged to communicate the fact to her legal adviser, on his representing to her, that he must know, with an eye to the latitude of his defence, how the fact stood about that child.' Put the case that, at the same time he held a trust to find a child for an eccentric rich lady to adopt and bring up. I follow you, sir. Put the case that he lived in an atmosphere of evil, and that all he saw of children was their being generated in great numbers for certain destruction. Put the case that he often saw children solemnly tried at a criminal bar, where they were held up to be seen, Put the case that he habitually knew of their being imprisoned, whipped, transported, neglected, cast out, qualified in all ways for the hangman, and growing up to be hanged. Put the case that pretty nigh all the children he saw in his daily business life he had reason to look upon as so much spawn, to develop into the fish that were to come to his net, to be prosecuted, defended, forsworn, made orphans, be devilled somehow. I follow you, sir. Put the case, Pip, that here was one pretty little child, out of the heap who could be saved, whom the father believed dead, and dared make no stir about, as to whom over the mother the legal adviser had this power. I know what you did and how you did it. You came so and so, you did such and such things to divert suspicion. I have tracked you through it all, and I tell it you all. Part with a child, unless it should be necessary to produce it to clear you, and then it shall be produced. Give the child into my hands, and I will do my best to bring you off. If you are saved, your child is saved too. If you are lost, your child is still saved. Put the case that this was done, and that the woman was cleared. I understand you perfectly. But that I make no admissions? That you make no admissions. And Wemmick repeated, No admissions. Put the case, Pip, that passion and the terror of death had a little shaken the woman's intellects, and that when she was set at liberty, she was scared out of the ways of the world, and went to him to be sheltered. Put the case that he took her in and that he kept down the old, wild, violent nature whenever he saw an inkling of its breaking out, 
by asserting his power over her in the old way. Do you comprehend the uh, imaginary case? Quite. Put the case that the child grew up and was married for money, that the mother was still living, that the father was still living that the mother and father, unknown to one another, were dwelling within so many miles, furlongs, yards, if you like, of one another, that the secret was still a secret, except that you had got wind of it. Put that last case to yourself very carefully. I do. I ask Wemmick to put it to himself very carefully. And Wemmick said, I do. For whose sake would you reveal the secret? For the father's? I think he would not be much the better for the mother. For the mother's? I think if she had done such a deed, she would be safer where she was. For the daughter's? I think it would hardly serve her to establish her parentage for the information of her husband, and to drag her back to disgrace, after an escape of twenty years, pretty secure to last for life. But add the case that you had loved her, Pip, and had made her the subject of those poor dreams which have at one time or another been in the heads of more men than you think likely, then I tell you that you had better, and would much sooner, when you would thought well of it, chop off that bandaged left hand of yours with your bandaged right hand, and then pass the chopper on to Wemmick here to cut that off too. I looked at Wemmick, whose face was very grave. He gravely touched his lips with his forefinger. I did the same. Mr. Jaggers did the same. "'Now, Wemmick,' said the latter then, resuming his usual manner, "'what item was it you were at when Mr. Pip came in?' Standing by for a little, while they were at work, I observed that the odd looks they had cast at one another were repeated several times with this difference now— that each of them seemed suspicious, not to say conscious, of having shown himself in a weak and unprofessional light to the other. For this reason, I suppose, they were now inflexible with one another, Mr. Jaggers being highly dictatorial, and Wemmick obstinately justifying himself whenever there was the smallest point in abeyance for a moment. I had never seen them on such ill terms, for generally they got on very well indeed together but they were both happily relieved by the opportune appearance of Mike, the client with the fur cap and the habit of wiping his nose on his sleeve, whom I had seen on the very first day of my appearance within these walls. This individual, who, either in his own person or in that of some member of his family, seemed to be always in trouble, which in that place meant Newgate, called to announce that his eldest daughter was taken up on suspicion of shoplifting, as he imparted this melancholy circumstance to Wemmick, Mr. Jaggers, standing magisterially before the fire and taking no share in the proceedings, Mike's eye happened to twinkle with a tear. "'What are you about?' demanded Wemmick, with the utmost indignation. "'What do you come snivelling here for?' "'I didn't go to do it, Mr. Wemmick.' "'You did,' said Wemmick. "'How dare you?' You're not in a fit state to come here, if you can't come here without spluttering like a bad pen. What do you mean by it? A man can't help his feelings, Mr. Wemmick, pleaded Mike. His what? demanded Wemmick, quite savagely. Say that again. Now look here, my man, said Mr. Jaggers, advancing a step and pointing to the door. Get out of this office. I'll have no feelings here. Get out. It serves you right, said Wemmick. Get out. So the unfortunate Mike very humbly withdrew, and Mr. Jaggers and Wemmick appeared to have re-established their good understanding, and went to work again with an air of refreshment upon them, as if they had just had lunch. End of chapter. Chapter Fifty Two of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit 
LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens Chapter 52 From Little Britain I went, with my check in my pocket, to Miss Skiffin's brother, the accountant, and Miss Skiffin's brother, the accountant, going straight to Clericker's and bringing Clericker to me, I had the great satisfaction of concluding that arrangement. It was the only good thing I had done, and the only completed thing I had done, since I was first apprised of my great expectations. Clericker informing me on that occasion that the affairs of the house were steadily progressing, that he would now be able to establish a small branch house in the east, which was much wanted for the extension of the business, and that Herbert in his new partnership capacity would go out and take charge of it, I found that I must have prepared for a separation from my friend, even though my own affairs had been more settled. And now, indeed, I felt as if my last anchor were loosening its hold, and I should soon be driving with the winds and waves. But there was recompense in the joy with which Herbert would come home of a night and tell me of these changes, little imagining that he told me no news, and would sketch airy pictures of himself conducting Clara Barley to the land of the Arabian Nights, and of me going out to join them, with a caravan of camels, I believe, and of our all going up the Nile and seeing wonders. Without being sanguine as to my own part in these bright plans, I felt that Herbert's way was clearing fast, and that old Bill Barley had but to stick to his pepper and rum, and his daughter would soon be happily provided for. We had now got into the month of March. My left arm, though it presented no bad symptoms, took in the natural course so long to heal that I was still unable to get a coat on. My right arm was tolerably restored, disfigured, but fairly serviceable. On a Monday morning, when Herbert and I were at breakfast, I received the following letter from Wemmick by the post. Walworth, burn this as soon as read. Early in the week, or say Wednesday, you might do what you know of, if you felt disposed to try it. Now burn. When I had shown this to Herbert, and had put it in the fire, but not before we had both got it by heart, we considered what to do for, of course, my being disabled could now be no longer kept out of view. "'I have thought it over again and again,' said Herbert, "'and I think I know a better course than taking a Thames waterman. Take Startop. A good fellow, a skilled hand, fond of us, and enthusiastic and honourable. I had thought of him more than once. "'But how much would you tell him, Herbert?' It is necessary to tell him very little. Let him suppose it a mere freak, but a secret one, until the morning comes. Then let him know that there is urgent reason for your getting Provis aboard and away. You go with him? No doubt. Where? It had seemed to me, in the many anxious considerations I had given the point, almost indifferent what port we made for. Hamburg, Rotterdam, Antwerp, the place signified little, so that he was out of England. Any foreign steamer that fell in our way and would take us up would do. I had always proposed to myself to get him well down the river in the boat, certainly well beyond Gravesend, which was a critical place for search or inquiry if suspicion were afoot. As foreign steamers would leave London at about the time of high water, our plan would be to get down the river by a previous ebb tide, and lie by in some quiet spot until we could pull off to one. The time when one would be due where we lay, wherever that might be, could be calculated pretty nearly if we made inquiries beforehand. Herbert assented to all this, and we went out immediately after breakfast to pursue our investigations. We found that a steamer for Hamburg was likely to suit our purpose best, and we directed our thoughts chiefly to that vessel but we noted down what other foreign steamers would leave London with the same tide, and we satisfied ourselves that we knew the build and colour of each. We then separated for a few hours, I to get at once such passports as were necessary, Herbert to see Startop at his lodgings. We both did what we had to do without any hindrance, 
and when we met again at one o'clock reported it done. I, for my part, was prepared with passports. Herbert had seen Startop, and he was more than ready to join. Those two should pull a pair of oars, we settled, and I would steer. Our charge would be sitter and keep quiet. As speed was not our object, we should make way enough. We arranged that Herbert should not come home to dinner before going to Mill Pond Bank that evening, that he should not go there at all to-morrow evening, Tuesday, that he should prepare Provost to come down to some stairs hard by the house on Wednesday, when he saw us approach, and not sooner, that all the arrangements with him should be concluded that Monday night, and he should be communicated with no more in any way until we took him on board. These precautions well understood by both of us, I went home. On opening the outer door of our chambers with my key, I found a letter in the box, directed to me, a very dirty letter, though not ill-written. It had been delivered by hand, of course, since I left home, and its contents were these. If you are not afraid to come to the old marshes to-night or to-morrow night at nine, and to come to the little sluice-house by the lime-kiln, you had better come. If you want information regarding your uncle Provis, you had much better come and tell no one, and lose no time. You must come alone. Bring this with you. I had had load enough upon my mind before the receipt of this strange letter. What to do now, I could not tell. And the worst was that I must decide quickly, or I should miss the afternoon coach, which would take me down in time for to-night. Tomorrow night I could not think of going, for it would be too close upon the time of the flight, and again, for anything I knew, the proffered information might have some important bearing on the flight itself. If I had had ample time for consideration, I believe I should still have gone. Having hardly any time for consideration, my watch showing me that the coach started within half an hour, I resolved to go. I should certainly not have gone but for the reference to my uncle Provis. That, coming on Wemmick's letter and the morning's busy preparation, turned the scale. It is so difficult to become clearly possessed of the contents of almost any letter, in a violent hurry, that I had to read this mysterious epistle again twice, before its injunction to me to be secret got mechanically into my mind. Yielding to it in the same mechanical kind of way, I left a note in pencil for Herbert, telling him that as I should be so soon going away, I knew not for how long, I had decided to hurry down and back, to ascertain for myself how Miss Havisham was faring. I had then barely time to get my greatcoat, lock up the chambers, and make for the coach office by the short byways. If I had taken a hackney chariot and gone by the streets, I should have missed my aim, going as I did, I caught the coach just as it came out of the yard. I was the only inside passenger, jolting away knee-deep in straw, when I came to myself. For I really had not been myself since the receipt of the letter. It had so bewildered me, ensuing on the hurry of the morning. The morning hurry and flutter had been great, for, long and anxiously as I had waited for Wemmick, his hint had come like a surprise, at last and now I began to wonder at myself for being in the coach, and to doubt whether I had sufficient reason for being there, and to consider whether I should get out presently and go back, and to argue against ever heeding an anonymous communication, and, in short, to pass through all those phases of contradiction and indecision to which I suppose very few hurried people are strangers. Still, the reference to Provis by name mastered everything. I reasoned as I had reasoned already without knowing it, if that be reasoning, in case any harm should befall him through my not going, how could I ever forgive myself? It was dark before we got down, and the journey seemed long and dreary to me, who could see little of it inside, and who could not go outside in my disabled state. Avoiding the blue boar, I put up at an inn of minor reputation down the town, and ordered some dinner. While it was preparing, I went to Satis house and inquired for Miss Havisham. She was still very ill, though considered something better. 
My inn had once been a part of an ancient ecclesiastical house, and I dined in a little octagonal common room, like a font. As I was not able to cut my dinner, the old landlord with a shining bald head did it for me. This bringing us into conversation, he was so good as to entertain me with my own story. Of course, with the popular feature that Pumblechook was my earliest benefactor and the founder of my fortunes. "'Do you know the young man?' said I. "'Know him,' repeated the landlord. "'Ever since he was. And no height at all.' "'Does he ever come back to this neighbourhood? "'Aye, he comes back.' said the landlord, to his great friends now and again, and gives the cold shoulder to the man that made him. What man is that? Him that I speak of, said the landlord, Mr. Pumblechook. Is he ungrateful to no one else? No doubt he would be if he could, returned the landlord, but he can't. And why? Because Pumblechook done everything for him. "'Does Pumblechook say so?' "'Say so?' replied the landlord. "'He ain't no call to say so.' "'But does he say so?' "'It would turn a man's blood to white wine vinegar to hear him tell of it, sir,' said the landlord. I thought, "'Yet, Joe, dear Joe, you never tell of it. Long-suffering and loving Joe, you never complain.' nor you, sweet-tempered Biddy. "'Your appetite's been touched like by your accident,' said the landlord, glancing at the bandaged arm under my coat. "'Try a tenderer bit.' "'No, thank you,' I replied, turning from the table to brood over the fire. "'I can eat no more. Please take it away.' I had never been struck at so keenly, for my thanklessness to Joe— as through the brazen impostor Pumblechook. The falser he, the truer Joe. The meaner he, the nobler Joe. My heart was deeply and most deservedly humbled as I mused over the fire for an hour or more. The striking of the clock aroused me, but not from my dejection or remorse, and I got up and had my coat fastened round my neck, and went out. I had previously sought in my pockets for the letter, that I might refer to it again, but I could not find it, and was uneasy to think that it must have been dropped in the straw of the coach. I knew very well, however, that the appointed place was the little sluice-house by the lime-kiln on the marshes, and the hour nine. Towards the marshes I now went straight, having no time to spare. End of chapter Chapter Fifty Three of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter Fifty Three. It was a dark night though the full moon rose as I left the enclosed lands and passed out upon the marshes. Beyond their dark line there was a ribbon of clear sky, hardly broad enough to hold the red large moon. In a few minutes she had ascended out of that clear field, in among the piled mountains of cloud. There was a melancholy wind, and the marshes were very dismal. A stranger would have found them insupportable, and even to me they were so oppressive that I hesitated— half inclined to go back. But I knew them well, and could have found my way on a far darker night, and had no excuse for returning, being there. So, having come there against my inclination, I went on against it. The direction that I took was not that in which my old home lay, nor that in which we had pursued the convicts. My back was turned towards the distant hulks as I walked on, and though I could see the old lights away on the spits of sand, I saw them over my shoulder. I knew the lime-kiln as well as I knew the old battery, but they were miles apart, so that, if a light had been burning at each point that night, there would have been a long strip of the blank horizon between the two bright specks. 
At first I had to shut some gates after me, and now and then to stand still while the cattle that were lying in the banked-up pathway arose and blundered down among the grass and reeds. But after a little while I seemed to have the whole flats to myself. It was another half-hour before I drew near to the kiln. The lime was burning with a sluggish, stifling smell, but the fires were made up and left, and no workmen were visible. Hard by was a small stone quarry. It lay directly in my way, and had been worked that day, as I saw by the tools and barrows that were lying about. Coming up again to the marsh level out of this excavation, for the rude path lay through it, I saw a light in the old sluice-house. I quickened my pace and knocked at the door with my hand. Waiting for some reply, I looked about me, noticing how the sluice was abandoned and broken, and how the house, of wood with a tiled roof, would not be proof against the weather much longer, if it were so even now, and how the mud and ooze were coated with lime, and how the choking vapour of the kiln crept in a ghostly way towards me. Still there was no answer, and I knocked again. No answer still, and I tried the latch. It rose under my hand, and the door yielded. Looking in, I saw a lighted candle on a table, a bench, and a mattress on a truckle bedstead. As there was a loft above, I called, "'Is anyone here?' But no voice answered. Then I looked at my watch, and finding that it was past nine, called again, "'Is there anyone here?' There being still no answer, I went out at the door, irresolute what to do. It was beginning to rain fast. Seeing nothing save what I had seen already, I turned back into the house and stood just within the shelter of the doorway, looking out into the night. While I was considering that someone must have been there lately and must soon be coming back, or the candle would not be burning, it came into my head to look if the wick were long. I turned round to do so, and had taken up the candle in my hand, when it was extinguished by some violent shock, and the next thing I comprehended was that I had been caught in a strong running noose, thrown over my head from behind. "'Now,' said a suppressed voice with an oath, "'I've got you.' "'What is this?' I cried, struggling. "'Who is it? Help! Help! Help!' Not only were my arms pulled close to my sides, but the pressure on my bad arm caused me exquisite pain. Sometimes a strong man's hand, sometimes a strong man's breast, was set against my mouth to deaden my cries, and with a hot breath always close to me, I struggled ineffectually in the dark while I was fastened tight to the wall. "'And now,' said the suppressed voice with another oath, "'call out again, and I'll make short work of you.' faint and sick with the pain of my injured arm, bewildered by the surprise, and yet conscious how easily this threat could be put in execution, I desisted, and tried to ease my arm were it ever so little. But it was bound too tight for that. I felt as if, having been burnt before, it was now being broiled. The sudden exclusion of the night, and the substitution of black darkness in its place, warned me that the man had closed a shutter. After groping about for a little, he found the flint and steel he wanted, and began to strike a light. I strained my sight upon the sparks that fell among the tinder, and upon which he breathed and breathed, match in hand, but I could only see his lips, and the blue point of the match, even those but fitfully. The tinder was damp, no wonder there, and one after another the sparks died out. The man was in no hurry, and struck again with the flint and steel. As the sparks fell thick and bright about him, I could see his hands, and touches of his face, and could make out that he was seated and bending over the table, but nothing more. Presently I saw his blue lips again, breathing on the tinder, and then a flare of light flashed up, and showed me Orlick. Whom I had looked for, I don't know. I had not looked for him. Seeing him, I felt that I was in a dangerous strait indeed, and I kept my eyes upon him. He lighted the candle from the flaring match with great deliberation, and dropped the match and trod it out. Then he put the candle away from him on the table, so that he could see me, and sat with his arms folded on the table, and looked at me. 
I made out that I was fastened to a stout perpendicular ladder a few inches from the wall, a fixture there, the means of ascent to the loft above. Now, said he, when we had surveyed one another for some time, I've got you. Unbind me. Let me go. Ha! Ah, he returned. I'll let you go. I'll let you go to the moon. I'll let you go to the stars. All in good time. Why have you lured me here? Don't you know, said he with a deadly look. Why have you set upon me in the dark? Because I mean to do it all myself. One keeps a secret better than two. Oh, you enemy! You enemy! His enjoyment of the spectacle I furnished, as he sat with his arms folded on the table, shaking his head at me and hugging himself, had a malignity in it that made me tremble. As I watched him in silence, he put his hand into the corner at his side, and took up a gun with a brass-bound stock. "'Do you know this?' said he, making as if he would take aim at me. "'Do you know where you saw it afore? Speak, wolf!' "'Yes,' I answered. "'You cost me that place. You did. Speak.' "'What else could I do?' "'You did that, and that would be enough, without more. How dared you to come betwixt me and a young woman I liked?' "'When did I?' "'When didn't you? It was you as always give old Orlick a bad name to her.' "'You gave it to yourself. You gained it for yourself.' I could have done you no harm if you had done yourself none. You're a liar, and you'll take any pains and spend any money to drive me out of this country, will you? Said he, repeating my words to Biddy in the last interview I had with her. Now I'll tell you a piece of information. It was never so well worth your while to get me out of this country as it is to-night. Ah, if it was all your money twenty times told to the last brass farthing. As he shook his heavy hand at me, with his mouth snarling like a tiger's, I felt that it was true. "'What are you going to do to me?' "'I'm a-goin,' said he, bringing his fist down upon the table with a heavy blow, and rising as the blow fell to give it greater force, "'I'm a-goin to have your life!' He leaned forward, staring at me slowly unclenched his hand and drew it across his mouth as if his mouth watered for me and sat down again you was always in old orlick's ways ever since you was a child you goes out of his way this present night he'll have no more on you you're dead i felt that i had come to the brink of my grave for a moment i looked wildly round my trap for any chance of escape but there was none "'More than that,' said he, folding his arms on the table again. "'I won't have a rag of you. I won't have a bone of you, left on earth. I'll put your body in the kiln. I'd carry two such to it on my shoulders, and, let people suppose what they may of you, they shall never know nothing.' My mind, with inconceivable rapidity, followed out all the consequences of such a death. Estella's father would believe I had deserted him would be taken, would die accusing me. Even Herbert would doubt me, when he compared the letter I had left for him with the fact that I had called at Miss Havisham's gate for only a moment. Joe and Biddy would never know how sorry I had been that night. None would ever know what I had suffered, how true I had meant to be, what an agony I had passed through. The death close before me was terrible, but far more terrible than death was the dread of being misremembered after death and so quick were my thoughts that I saw myself despised by unborn generations, Estella's children and their children, while the wretch's words were yet on his lips. "'Now, Wolf,' said he, "'afore I kill you like any other beast, which is what I mean to do and what I have tied you up for, I'll have a good look at you and have a good goad at you. Oh, you enemy!' It had passed through my thoughts to cry out for help again, though few could know better than I the solitary nature of the spot, and the hopelessness of aid. But as he sat gloating over me, I was supported by a scornful detestation of him that sealed my lips. 
above all things I resolved that I would not entreat him, and that I would die making some last poor resistance to him. Softened as my thoughts of all the rest of men were in that dire extremity, humbly beseeching pardon, as I did, of heaven, melted at heart, as I was, by the thought that I had taken no farewell, and never now could take farewell of those who were dear to me, or could explain myself to them, or ask for their compassion on my miserable errors, still, if I could have killed him, even in dying, I would have done it. He had been drinking, and his eyes were red and bloodshot. Around his neck was slung a tin bottle, as I had often seen his meat and drink slung about him in other days. He brought the bottle to his lips and took a fiery drink from it, and I smelt the strong spirits that I saw flash into his face. "'Wolf,' said he, folding his arms again, "'old Orlick's a going to tell you something. It was you as did for your shrew sister.' Again my mind, with its former inconceivable rapidity, had exhausted the whole subject of the attack upon my sister, her illness and her death, before his slow and hesitating speech had formed these words. "'It was you, villain,' said I. "'I tell you it was your doing. I tell you it was done through you,' he retorted, catching up the gun and making a blow with the stock at the vacant air between us. I come upon her from behind, as I come upon you to-night. I give it her. I left her for dead, and if there had been a lime-kiln as nigh her as there is now nigh you, she shouldn't have come to life again. But it warn't old Orlick as did it. It was you. You was favoured, and he was bullied and beat. Old Orlick bullied and beat, eh? Now you pays for it. You done it. Now you pays for it. He drank again, and became more ferocious. I saw by his tilting of the bottle that there was no great quantity left in it. I distinctly understood that he was working himself up with its contents to make an end of me. I knew that every drop it held was a drop of my life. I knew that when I was changed into a part of the vapour that crept towards me, but a little while before, like my own warning ghost, he would do as he had done in my sister's case— make all haste to the town, and be seen slouching about there, drinking at the alehouses. My rapid mind pursued him to the town, made a picture of the street with him in it, and contrasted its lights and life with the lonely marsh and the white vapour creeping over it, into which I should have dissolved. It was not only that I could have summed up years and years and years while he said a dozen words, but that what he did say presented pictures to me and not mere words. In the excited and exalted state of my brain, I could not think of a place without seeing it, or of persons without seeing them. It is impossible to overstate the vividness of these images, and yet I was so intent, all the time, upon him himself, who would not be intent on the tiger crouching to spring, that I knew of the slightest action of his fingers. When he had drunk the second time, he rose from the bench on which he sat, and pushed the table aside. Then he took up the candle, and shading it with his murderous hand so as to throw its light on me, stood before me, looking at me, and enjoying the sight. "'Wolf, I'll tell you something more. It was old Orlick as you tumbled over on your stairs that night.' I saw the staircase with its extinguished lamps. I saw the shadows of the heavy stair-rails thrown by the watchman's lantern on the wall. I saw the rooms that I was never to see again, here a door half open, there a door closed, all the articles of furniture around. And why was old Orlick there? I'll tell you something more, Wolf. You and her have pretty well hunted me out of this country, so far as getting an easy living in it goes and I've took up with new companions, and new masters. Some of them writes my letters when I want some wrote. Do you mind? Writes my letters, Wolf. They writes fifty hands. They're not like sneaking you, as writes but one. I've a firm mind and a firm will to have your life, since you was down here at your sister's burying. 
I ha'n't seen a way to get you safe, and I've looked arter you to know your ins and outs. For, says old Orlick to himself, somehow or another I'll have him. What? When I looks for you, I find your Uncle Provis, eh? Mill Pond Bank and Chink's Basin and the old green copper rope walk, all so clear and plain. Provis in his rooms, the signal whose use was over. Pretty Clara, the good motherly woman, old Bill Barley on his back, all drifting by, as on the swift stream of my life, fast running out to sea. You with a uncle, too. Why, I knowed you at Gargary's when you was so small a wolf, that I could have took your weasin betwixt this finger and thumb and chucked you away dead. As I'd thoughts a doin, odd times, when I see you loitering amongst the pollards on a Sunday. And you hadn't found no uncles then. No, not you. But when old Orlick come for to hear that your uncle Provis had most like wore the leg iron what old Orlick had picked up, filed asunder on these meshes ever so many year ago, and what he kept by him till he dropped your sister with it, like a bullock, as he means to drop you, hey? When he come for to hear that, hey? In his savage taunting he flared the candle so close at me that I turned my face aside to save it from the flame. Ah! he cried, laughing, after doing it again. The burnt child dreads the fire. Old Orlick knowed you was burnt. Old Orlick knowed you was smuggling your Uncle Provis away. Old Orlick's a match for you, and knowed you'd come to-night. Now I'll tell you something more, Wolf, and this ends it. There's them that's as good a match for your Uncle Provis as Old Orlick has been for you. Let him wear them when he's lost his nevy. Let him wear them when no man can't find a rag of his dear relation's clothes nor yet a bone of his body. There's them that can't, and that won't have Magwitch. Yes, I know the name, alive in the same land with them, and that's had such sure information of him when he was alive in another land, as that he couldn't and shouldn't leave it unbeknown and put them in danger. Perhaps it's them that writes fifty hands, and that's not like sneaking you as writes but one." Where Compeyson, Magwitch, and the gallows. He flared the candle at me again, smoking my face and hair, and for an instant blinding me, and turned his powerful back as he replaced the light on the table. I had thought a prayer, and had been with Joe and Biddy and Herbert, before he turned towards me again. There was a clear space of a few feet between the table and the opposite wall. Within this space, he now slouched backwards and forwards. His great strength seemed to sit stronger upon him than ever before, as he did this with his hands hanging loose and heavy at his sides, and with his eyes scowling at me. I had no grain of hope left. Wild as my inward hurry was, and wonderful the force of the pictures that rushed by me instead of thoughts, I could yet clearly understand that, unless he had resolved that I was within a few moments of surely perishing out of all human knowledge, he would never have told me what he had told. Of a sudden he stopped, took the cork out of his bottle, and tossed it away. Light as it was, I heard it fall like a plummet. He swallowed slowly, tilting up the bottle by little and little, and now he looked at me no more. The last few drops of liquor he poured into the palm of his hand, and licked up. Then, with a sudden hurry of violence and swearing horribly, he threw the bottle from him, and stooped, and I saw in his hand a stone hammer with a long, heavy handle. The resolution I had made did not desert me, for, without uttering one vain word of appeal to him, I shouted out with all my might, and struggled with all my might. It was only my head and my legs that I could move, but to that extent I struggled with all the force, until then unknown, that was within me. In the same instant I heard responsive shouts, saw figures and a gleam of light dash in at the door, heard voices in tumult, and saw Orlick emerge from a struggle of men, as if it were tumbling water, clear the table at a leap, and fly out into the night. After a blank... I found that I was lying unbound, on the floor, 
in the same place, with my head on someone's knee. My eyes were fixed on the ladder against the wall when I came to myself, had opened on it before my mind saw it, and thus as I recovered consciousness I knew that I was in the place where I had lost it. Too indifferent at first, even to look round and ascertain who supported me, I was lying looking at the ladder, when there came between me and it a face. The face of Trab's boy. "'I think he's all right,' said Trab's boy in a sober voice. "'But ain't he just pale, though?' At these words the face of him who supported me looked over into mine, and I saw my supporter to be— "'Herbert! Great heaven!' "'Softly,' said Herbert. "'Gently, Handel. Don't be too eager.' "'And our old comrade Startop!' I cried, as he too bent over me. "'Remember what he is going to assist us in,' said Herbert, "'and be calm.' The illusion made me spring up, though I dropped again from the pain in my arm. "'The time has not gone by, Herbert, has it? What night is to-night? How long have I been here?' For I had a strange and strong misgiving that I had been lying there a long time, a day and a night, two days and nights, more. The time has not gone by. It is still Monday night. Thank God! And you have all to-morrow, Tuesday, to rest in, said Herbert. But you can't help groaning, my dear Handel. What hurt have you got? Can you stand? Yes, yes, said I. I can walk. I have no hurt but in this throbbing arm. They laid it bare and did what they could. It was violently swollen and inflamed, and I could scarcely endure to have it touched. But they tore up their handkerchiefs to make fresh bandages, and carefully replaced it in the sling, until we could get to the town and obtain some cooling lotion to put upon it. In a little while we had shut the door of the dark and empty sluice-house, and were passing through the quarry on our way back. Trab's boy, Trab's overgrown young man now, went before us with a lantern, which was the light I had seen come in at the door but the moon was a good two hours higher than when I had last seen the sky, and the night, though rainy, was much lighter. The white vapour of the kiln was passing from us as we went by, and as I had thought a prayer before, I thought a thanksgiving now. Entreating Herbert to tell me how he had come to my rescue, which at first he had flatly refused to do, but had insisted on my remaining quiet, I learnt that I had in my hurry dropped the letter, open, in our chambers, where he, coming home to bring with him Startop, whom he had met in the street on his way to me, found it, very soon after I was gone. Its tone made him uneasy, and the more so because of the inconsistency between it and the hasty letter I had left for him. His uneasiness increasing, instead of subsiding, after a quarter of an hour's consideration, he set off for the coach-office with Startop, who volunteered his company, to make inquiry when the next coach went down. Finding that the afternoon coach was gone, and finding that his uneasiness grew into positive alarm, as obstacles came in his way, he resolved to follow in a post-chaise. So he and Startop arrived at the Blue Boar, fully expecting there to find me, or tidings of me, but, finding neither, went on to Miss Havisham's, where they lost me. Hereupon they went back to the hotel, doubtless at about the time when I was hearing the popular local version of my own story, to refresh themselves and get someone to guide them out upon the marshes. Among the loungers under the Boar's archway happened to be Trab's boy, true to his ancient habit of happening to be everywhere where he had no business and Trab's boy had seen me passing from Miss Havisham's in the direction of my dining-place. Thus Trab's boy became their guide, and with him they went out to the sluice-house, though by the town-way to the marshes, which I had avoided. Now as they went along, Herbert reflected that I might, after all, have been brought there on some genuine and serviceable errand, tending to Provis's safety, and bethinking himself that in that case interruption must be mischievous, left his guide and startop on the edge of the quarry, and went on by himself, and stole round the house two or three times, 
endeavouring to ascertain whether all was right within. As he could hear nothing but indistinct sounds of one deep rough voice, this was while my mind was so busy, he even at last began to doubt whether I was there, when suddenly I cried out loudly and he answered the cries, and rushed in, closely followed by the other two. When I told Herbert what had passed within the house, he was for our immediately going before a magistrate in the town, late at night as it was, and getting out a warrant. But I had already considered that such a course, by detaining us there, or binding us to come back, might be fatal to Provis. There was no gainsaying this difficulty, and we relinquished all thoughts of pursuing Orlick at that time. For the present, under the circumstances, we deemed it prudent to make rather light of the matter to Trabb's boy, who, I am convinced, would have been much affected by disappointment, if he had known that his intervention saved me from the lime-kiln. Not that Trabb's boy was of a malignant nature, but that he had too much spare vivacity, and that it was in his constitution to want variety and excitement at anybody's expense. When we parted, I presented him with two guineas, which seemed to meet his views, and told him that I was sorry ever to have had an ill opinion of him, which made no impression on him at all. Wednesday being so close upon us, we determined to go back to London that night, three in the post-chaise, the rather, as we should then be clear away before the night's adventure began to be talked of. Herbert got a large bottle of stuff from my arm, and by dint of having this stuff dropped over it all the night through, I was just able to bear its pain on the journey. It was daylight when we reached the temple, and I went at once to bed, and lay in bed all day. My terror, as I lay there, of falling ill and being unfitted for to-morrow, was so besetting that I wonder it did not disable me of itself. It would have done so, pretty surely, in conjunction with the mental wear and tear I had suffered, but for the unnatural strain upon me that to-morrow was. So anxiously looked forward to, charged with such consequences, its results so impenetrably hidden, though so near. No precaution could have been more obvious than our refraining from communication with him that day, yet this again increased my restlessness. I started at every footstep and every sound, believing that he was discovered and taken, and this was the messenger to tell me so. I persuaded myself that I knew he was taken, that there was something more upon my mind than a fear or a presentiment, that the fact had occurred, and I had a mysterious knowledge of it. As the days wore on, and no ill news came, as the day closed in and darkness fell, my overshadowing dread of being disabled by illness before tomorrow morning altogether mastered me. My burning arm throbbed, and my burning head throbbed, and I fancied I was beginning to wander. I counted up to high numbers to make sure of myself, and repeated passages that I knew in prose and verse. It happened sometimes that in the mere escape of a fatigued mind, I dozed for some moments or forgot. Then I would say to myself with a start, Now it has come, and I am turning delirious. They kept me very quiet all day, and kept my arm constantly dressed, and gave me cooling drinks. Whenever I fell asleep, I awoke with the notion I had had in the sluice-house, that a long time had elapsed and the opportunity to save him was gone. About midnight I got out of bed and went to Herbert, with the conviction that I had been asleep for four and twenty hours, and that Wednesday was past. It was the last self-exhausting effort of my fretfulness, for after that I slept soundly. Wednesday morning was dawning when I looked out of window. The winking lights upon the bridges were already pale, the coming sun was like a marsh of fire on the horizon. The river, still dark and mysterious, was spanned by bridges that were turning coldly grey, with here and there at top a warm touch from the burning in the sky. As I looked along the clustered roofs, with church towers and spires shooting into the unusually clear air, the sun rose up, and a veil seemed to be drawn from the river and millions of sparkles burst out upon its waters. 
From me, too, a veil seemed to be drawn, and I felt strong and well. Herbert lay asleep in his bed, and our old fellow-student lay asleep on the sofa. I could not dress myself without help, but I made up the fire, which was still burning, and got some coffee ready for them. In good time they too started up, strong and well, and we admitted the sharp morning air at the windows, and looked at the tide that was still flowing towards us. "'When it turns at nine o'clock,' said Herbert, cheerfully, "'look out for us, and stand ready, you over there at Mill Pond Bank.'" End of chapter Chapter Fifty Four of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter Fifty Four. It was one of those March days when the sun shines hot and the wind blows cold, when it is summer in the light and winter in the shade. We had our pea-coats with us, and I took a bag. Of all my worldly possessions I took no more than the few necessaries that filled the bag. Where I might go, what I might do, or when I might return were questions utterly unknown to me, nor did I vex my mind with them, for it was wholly set on Provis's safety. I only wondered for the passing moment, as I stopped at the door and looked back, under what altered circumstances I should next see those rooms, if ever. We loitered down to the temple stairs, and stood loitering there, as if we were not quite decided to go upon the water at all. Of course I had taken care that the boat should be ready and everything in order. After a little show of indecision— which there were none to see but the two or three amphibious creatures belonging to our temple stairs, we went on board and cast off, Herbert in the bow, I steering. It was then about high water, half-past eight. Our plan was this, the tide beginning to run down at nine, and being with us until three, we intended still to creep on after it had turned, and row against it until dark. We should then be well in those long reaches below Gravesend, between Kent and Essex, where the river is broad and solitary, where the waterside inhabitants are very few, and where lone public houses are scattered here and there, of which we could choose one for a resting place. There we meant to lie by all night. The steamer for Hamburg and the steamer for Rotterdam would start from London at about nine on Thursday morning. We should know at what time to expect them, according to where we were, and would hail the first, so that, if by any accident we were not taken aboard, we should have another chance. We knew the distinguishing marks of each vessel. The relief of being at last engaged in the execution of the purpose was so great to me that I felt it difficult to realize the condition in which I had been a few hours before. The crisp air, the sunlight, the movement on the river, and the moving river itself, the road that ran with us, seeming to sympathize with us, animate us, and encourage us on, freshened me with new hope. I felt mortified to be of so little use in the boat, but there were few better oarsmen than my two friends, and they rowed with a steady stroke that was to last all day. At that time the steam traffic on the Thames was far below its present extent, and the watermen's boats were far more numerous. Of barges, sailing colliers, and coasting traders, there were perhaps as many as now, but of steamships, great and small, not a tithe, or a twentieth part, so many. Early as it was, there were plenty of scullers going here and there that morning, and plenty of barges dropping down with the tide. The navigation of the river between bridges, in an open boat, was a much easier and commoner matter in those days than it is in these, and we went ahead among many skiffs and wherries briskly. Old London Bridge was soon passed, and old Billingsgate Market with its oyster-boats and Dutchmen, and the White Tower, and Trader's Gate, and we were in among the tiers of shipping. 
Here were the Leith, Aberdeen, and Glasgow steamers, loading and unloading goods, and looking immensely high out of the water as we passed alongside. Here were colliers by the score and score, with the coal-whippers plunging off stages on deck, as counterweights to measures of coal swinging up, which were then rattled over the side into barges. Here at her moorings was tomorrow's steamer for Rotterdam, of which we took good notice, and here tomorrow's for Hamburg, under whose bowsprit we crossed. And now I, sitting in the stern, could see, with a faster beating heart, Mill Pond Bank and Mill Pond Stairs. "'Is he there?' said Herbert. "'Not yet.' "'Right. He was not to come down till he saw us. Can you see his signal?' "'Not well from here, but I think I see it. Now I see him. Pull both. Easy, Herbert. Oars!' We touched the stairs lightly for a single moment, and he was on board, and we were off again. He had a boat-cloak with him, and a black canvas bag, and he looked as like a river pilot as my heart could have wished. "'Dear boy,' he said, putting his arm on my shoulder, as he took his seat, "'faithful dear boy, well done. Thank ye, thank ye.' Again among the tiers of shipping, in and out, avoiding rusty chain cables, frayed hempen hawsers and bobbing buoys, sinking for the moment floating broken baskets, scattering floating chips of wood and shaving, cleaving floating scum of coal, in and out, under the figurehead of the John of Sunderland making a speech to the winds, as is done by many Johns, and the Betsy of Yarmouth with a firm formality of bosom and her knobby eyes starting two inches out of her head, in and out, hammers going in shipbuilders' yards, saws going at timber, clashing engines going at things unknown, pumps going in leaky ships, capstans going, ships going out to sea, and unintelligible sea-creatures roaring curses over the bulwarks at respondent lightermen, in and out, out at last upon the clearer river, where the ship's boys might take their fenders in, no longer fishing in troubled waters with them over the side, and where the festooned sails might fly out to the wind. At the stairs where we had taken him aboard, and ever since, I had looked warily for any token of our being suspected. I had seen none. We certainly had not been, and at that time as certainly we were not either attended or followed by any boat. If we had been waited on by any boat, I should have run into shore and have obliged her to go on, or to make her purpose evident. But we held our own without any appearance of molestation. He had his boat-cloak on him, and it looked, as I have said, a natural part of the scene. It was remarkable, but perhaps the wretched life he had led accounted for it, that he was the least anxious of any of us. He was not indifferent, for he told me that he hoped to live to see his gentleman one of the best of gentlemen in a foreign country. He was not disposed to be passive or resigned, as I understood it, but he had no notion of meeting danger half-way. When it came upon him he confronted it, but it must come before he troubled himself. "'If you know, dear boy,' he said to me, "'what it is to sit here a longer my dear boy and have my smoke, arter been day by day betwixt four walls, you'd envy me, but you don't know what it is.' "'I think I know the delights of freedom,' I answered. "'Ah!' said he, shaking his head gravely. "'But you don't know it equal to me. You must have been under lock and key, dear boy, to know it equal to me. But I ain't a-going to be low.' It occurred to me as inconsistent that, for any mastering idea, he should have endangered his freedom, and even his life. But I reflected that perhaps freedom without danger was too much apart from all the habit of his existence to be to him what it would be to another man. I was not far out, since he said, after smoking a little, "'You see, dear boy, when I was over yonder, the other side of the world, I was always a-lookin' to this side, and it come flat to be there, for all I was a-growin' rich.' 
Everybody knowed Magwitch, and Magwitch could come, and Magwitch could go, and nobody's head will be troubled about him. They ain't so easy concerning me here, dear boy. Wouldn't be leastwise if they knowed where I was. If all goes well, said I, you will be perfectly free and safe again within a few hours. Well, he returned, drawing a long breath, I hope so. And think so? He dipped his hand in the water over the boat's gunwale, and said, smiling with that softened air upon him which was not new to me, I, I suppose I think so, dear boy. We'd be puzzled to be more quiet and easy-going than we are at present. But it's a flowin' so soft and pleasant through the water, perhaps, as makes me think it. I was a-thinkin' through my smoke just then, that we can no more see to the bottom of the next few hours than we can see to the bottom of this river what I catches hold of. Nor yet we can't no more hold their tide than I can hold this, and it's run through my fingers and gone, you see, holding up his dripping hand. But for your face I should think you were a little despondent, said I. Not a bit on it, dear boy. It comes a flowin' on so quiet, and of that there ripplin' at the boat's head making a sort of a Sunday tune. Maybe I'm growin' a trifle old, besides. He put his pipe back in his mouth with an undisturbed expression of face, and sat as composed and contented as if we were already out of England. Yet he was as submissive to a word of advice as if he had been in constant terror, for, when we ran ashore to get some bottles of beer into the boat, and he was stepping out, I hinted that I thought he would be safest where he was, and he said, "'Do you, dear boy?' and quietly sat down again. The air felt cold upon the river, but it was a bright day, and the sunshine was very cheering. The tide ran strong. I took care to lose none of it, and our steady stroke carried us on thoroughly well. By imperceptible degrees, as the tide ran out, we lost more and more of the nearer woods and hills, and dropped lower and lower between the muddy banks, but the tide was yet with us when we were off Gravesend. As our charge was wrapped in his cloak, I purposely passed within a boat or two's length of the floating custom-house, and so out to catch the stream, alongside of two emigrant ships, and under the bows of a large transport with troops on the forecastle looking down at us. And soon the tide began to slacken and the craft lying at anchor to swing, and presently they had all swung round, and the ships that were taking advantage of the new tide to get up to the pool began to crowd upon us in a fleet, and we kept under the shore, as much out of the strength of the tide now as we could, standing carefully off from low shallows and mud-banks. Our oarsmen were so fresh, by dint of having occasionally let her drive with the tide for a minute or two, that a quarter of an hour's rest proved full as much as they wanted. We got ashore among some slippery stones while we ate and drank what we had with us, and looked about. It was like my own marsh country, flat and monotonous, and with a dim horizon, while the winding river turned and turned, and the great floating buoys upon it turned and turned and everything else seemed stranded and still. For now the last of the fleet of ships was round the last low point we had headed, and the last green barge, straw-laden, with a brown sail, had followed, and some ballast lighters, shaped like a child's first rude imitation of a boat, lay low in the mud, and a little squat shoal lighthouse on open piles stood crippled in the mud on stilts and crutches, and slimy stakes stuck out of the mud, and slimy stones stuck out of the mud, and red landmarks and tide marks stuck out of the mud, and an old landing stage and an old roofless building slipped into the mud, and all about us was stagnation and mud. We pushed off again and made what way we could. It was much harder work now, but Herbert and Startop persevered, and rode and rode and rode until the sun went down. By that time the river had lifted us a little, so that we could see above the bank. 
There was the red sun, on the low level of the shore, in a purple haze, fast deepening into black, and there was the solitary flat marsh, and far away there were the rising grounds, between which and us there seemed to be no life, save here and there in the foreground a melancholy gull. As the night was fast falling, and as the moon, being past the full, would not rise early, we held a little council, a short one, for clearly our course was to lie by at the first lonely tavern we could find. So they plied their oars once more, and I looked out for anything like a house. Thus we held on, speaking little, for four or five dull miles. It was very cold, and a collier coming by us, with her galley fire smoking and flaring, looked like a comfortable home. The night was as dark by this time as it would be until morning, and what light we had seemed to come more from the river than the sky, as the oars in their dipping struck at a few reflected stars. At this dismal time we were evidently all possessed by the idea that we were followed. As the tide made, it flapped heavily at irregular intervals against the shore, and whenever such a sound came, one or other of us was sure to start and look in that direction. Here and there, the set of the current had worn down the bank into a little creek, and we were all suspicious of such places, and eyed them nervously. Sometimes, "'What was that ripple?' one of us would say in a low voice. Or another, "'Is that a boat yonder?' And afterwards we would fall into a dead silence." and I would sit impatiently, thinking with what an unusual amount of noise the oars worked in the thowels. At length we descried a light and a roof, and presently afterwards ran alongside a little causeway made of stones that had been picked up hard by. Leaving the rest in the boat, I stepped ashore, and found the light to be in the window of a public-house. It was a dirty place enough, and I dare say not unknown to smuggling adventurers, but there was a good fire in the kitchen, and there were eggs and bacon to eat, and various liquors to drink. Also, there were two double-bedded rooms. Such as they were, the landlord said. No other company was in the house than the landlord, his wife, and a grizzled male creature, the Jack of the little causeway, who was as slimy and smeary as if he had been a low-water mark too. With this assistant, I went down to the boat again, and we all came ashore, and brought out the oars, and rudder, and boat-hook, and all else, and hauled her up for the night. We made a very good meal by the kitchen fire, and then apportioned the bedrooms. Herbert and Startop were to occupy one, I and our charge the other. We found the air as carefully excluded from both, as if air were fatal to life and there were more dirty clothes and bandboxes under the beds than I should have thought the family possessed. But we considered ourselves well off, notwithstanding, for a more solitary place we could not have found. While we were comforting ourselves by the fire after our meal, the Jack, who was sitting in a corner and who had a bloated pair of shoes on, which he had exhibited while we were eating our eggs and bacon, as interesting relics that he had taken a few days ago from the feet of a drowned seaman wash ashore, asked me if we had seen a four-oared galley going up with the tide. When I told him no, he said she must have gone down then, and yet she took up, too, when she left there. "'They must have thought better on it for some reason or other,' said the Jack, "'and gone down.' "'A four-oared galley, did you say?' said I. "'A four, said the Jack, "'and two sitters.' "'Did they come ashore here?' "'They put in with a stone two-gallon jar for some beer. "'I'd have been glad to pison the beer myself,' said the Jack, "'or put some rattling physic in it. "'Why?' "'I know why,' said the Jack. He spoke in a slushy voice, as if much mud had washed into his throat. "'He thinks,' said the landlord, a weakly meditative man with a pale eye, who seemed to rely greatly on his jack, "'he thinks they was what they wasn't.' "'I knows what I thinks,' observed the jack. 
"'You thinks customs us, Jack?' said the landlord. "'I do,' said the Jack. "'Then you're wrong, Jack.' "'Am I?' In the infinite meaning of his reply, and his boundless confidence in his views, the Jack took one of his bloated shoes off, looked into it, knocked a few stones out of it on the kitchen floor, and put it on again. He did this with the air of a Jack who was so right that he could afford to do anything. "'Why, what do you make out that they done with their buttons, then, Jack?' asked the landlord, vacillating weakly. "'Done with their buttons?' returned the Jack. "'Chucked em overboard, swallered em, sewed em to come up small salad. Done with their buttons.' "'Don't be cheeky, Jack,' remonstrated the landlord in a melancholy and pathetic way. "'A customus officer knows what to do with his buttons,' said the Jack, repeating the obnoxious word with the greatest contempt. When they comes betwixt him and his own light, a four and two sitters don't go hanging and hovering, up with one tide and down with another, and both with and against another, without there being custom us at the bottom of it. Saying which he went out in disdain, and the landlord, having no one to reply upon, found it impracticable to pursue the subject. The dialogue made us all uneasy, and me very uneasy. The dismal wind was muttering round the house, the tide was flapping at the shore, and I had a feeling that we were caged and threatened. A four-oared galley hovering about in so unusual a way as to attract this notice was an ugly circumstance that I could not get rid of. When I had induced Provis to go up to bed, I went outside with my two companions— Startop by this time knew the state of the case, and held another council. Whether we should remain at the house until near the steamer's time, which would be about one in the afternoon, or whether we should put off early in the morning, was the question we discussed. On the whole we deemed it the better course to lie where we were, until within an hour or so of the steamer's time, and then to get out in our track and drift easily with the tide. Having settled to do this, we returned into the house, and went to bed. I lay down with the greater part of my clothes on, and slept well for a few hours. When I awoke, the wind had risen, and the sign of the house, the ship, was creaking and banging about, with noises that startled me. Rising softly, for my charge lay fast asleep, I looked out of the window. It commanded the causeway where we had hauled up our boat, and as my eyes adapted themselves to the light of the clouded moon, I saw two men looking into her. They passed by under the window, looking at nothing else, and they did not go down to the landing-place which I could discern to be empty, but struck across the marsh in the direction of the Nore. My first impulse was to call up Herbert, and show him the two men going away. But reflecting, before I got into his room, which was at the back of the house and had joined mine, that he and Startop had had a harder day than I, and were fatigued, I forbore. Going back to my window, I could see the two men moving over the marsh. In that light, however, I soon lost them, and feeling very cold, lay down to think of the matter, and fell asleep again. We were up early. As we walked to and fro all four together, before breakfast, I deemed it right to recount what I had seen. Again our charge was the least anxious of the party. It was very likely that the men belonged to the custom-house, he said quietly, and that they had no thought of us. I tried to persuade myself that it was so, as, indeed, it might easily be. However, I proposed that he and I should walk away together to a distant point we could see, and that the boat should take us aboard there or as near there as might prove feasible, at about noon. This being considered a good precaution, soon after breakfast he and I set forth, without saying anything at the tavern. He smoked his pipe as we went along, and sometimes stopped to clap me on the shoulder. One would have supposed that it was I who was in danger, not he, and that he was reassuring me. We spoke very little, 
As we approached the point, I begged him to remain in a sheltered place while I went on to reconnoitre, for it was towards it that the men had passed in the night. He complied, and I went on alone. There was no boat off the point, nor any boat drawn up anywhere near it, nor were there any signs of the men having embarked there. But, to be sure, the tide was high, and there might have been some footprints under water. When he looked out from his shelter in the distance, and saw that I waved my hat to him to come up, he rejoined me, and there we waited, sometimes lying on the bank, wrapped in our coats, and sometimes moving about to warm ourselves, until we saw our boat coming round. We got aboard easily, and rowed out into the track of the steamer. By that time it wanted but ten minutes of one o'clock, and we began to look out for her smoke. But it was half-past one before we saw her smoke, and soon afterwards we saw behind it the smoke of another steamer. As they were coming on at full speed we got the two bags ready, and took that opportunity of saying good-bye to Herbert and Startop. We had all shaken hands cordially, and, neither Herbert's eyes nor mine were quite dry, when I saw a four-oared galley shoot out from under the bank but a little way ahead of us, and row out into the same track. A stretch of shore had been as yet between us and the steamer's smoke, by reason of the bend and wind of the river, but now she was visible, coming head-on. I called to Herbert and Startop to keep before the tide, that she might see us lying by for her, and I adjured Provis to sit quite still, wrapped in his cloak. He answered cheerily, "'Trust to me, dear boy,' and sat like a statue. Meantime the galley, which was very skilfully handled, had crossed us, let us come up with her, and fallen alongside. Leaving just room enough for the play of the oars, she kept alongside, drifting when we drifted, and pulling a stroke or two when we pulled. Of the two sitters, one held the rudder lines and looked at us attentively, as did all the rowers. The other sitter was wrapped up, much as Provis was, and seemed to shrink and whisper some instruction to the steerer as he looked at us. Not a word was spoken in either boat. Startop could make out, after a few minutes, which steamer was first, and gave me the word Hamburg, in a low voice, as we sat face to face. She was nearing us very fast, and the beating of her paddles grew louder and louder. I felt as if her shadow were absolutely upon us, when the galley hailed us. I answered. "'You have a return transport there,' said the man who held the lines. That's the man, wrapped in the cloak. His name is Abel Magwitch, otherwise Provis. I apprehend that man, and call upon him to surrender, and you to assist. At the same moment, without giving any audible direction to his crew, he ran the galley abroad of us. They had pulled one sudden stroke ahead, had got their oars in, had run athwart us, and were holding on to our gunwale before we knew what they were doing. This caused great confusion on board the steamer, and I heard them calling to us, and heard the order given to stop the paddles, and heard them stop, but felt her driving down upon us irresistibly. In the same moment I saw the steersman of the galley lay his hand on his prisoner's shoulder, and saw that both boats were swinging round with the force of the tide, and saw that all hands on board the steamer were running forward quite frantically. Still in the same moment I saw the prisoner start up, lean across his captor, and pull the cloak from the neck of the shrinking sitter in the galley. Still in the same moment I saw that the face disclosed was the face of the other convict of long ago. Still in the same moment I saw the face tilt backward with a white terror on it that I shall never forget, and heard a great cry on board the steamer, and a loud splash in the water, and felt the boat sink from under me. It was but for an instant that I seemed to struggle with a thousand mill-weirs and a thousand flashes of light. That instant passed, I was taken on board the galley. Herbert was there, and Startop was there, but our boat was gone, and the two convicts were gone. What with the cries aboard the steamer, and the furious blowing off of her steam, and her driving on, and our driving on, I could not at first distinguish sky from water, or shore from shore, 
but the crew of the galley righted her with great speed, and pulling certain swift, strong strokes ahead, lay upon their oars, every man looking silently and eagerly at the water astern. Presently a dark object was seen in it, bearing towards us on the tide. No man spoke, but the steersman held up his hand, and all softly backed water, and kept the boat straight and true before it. As it came nearer I saw it to be Magwitch, swimming, but not swimming freely. He was taken on board, and instantly manacled at the wrists and ankles. The galley was kept steady, and the silent, eager lookout at the water was resumed. But the Rotterdam steamer now came up, and apparently not understanding what had happened, came on at speed. By the time she had been hailed and stopped, both steamers were drifting away from us, and we were rising and falling in a troubled wake of water. The lookout was kept long after all was still again, and the two steamers were gone, but everybody knew that it was hopeless now. At length we gave it up, and pulled under the shore towards the tavern we had lately left, where we were received with no little surprise. Here I was able to get some comforts for Magwitch, Provis no longer, who had received some very severe injury in the chest, and a deep cut in the head. He told me that he believed himself to have gone under the keel of the steamer, and to have been struck on the head in rising. The injury to his chest, which rendered his breathing extremely painful, he thought he had received against the side of the galley. He added that he did not pretend to say what he might or might not have done to Compeyson, but that, in the moment of his laying his hand on his cloak to identify him, that villain had staggered up and staggered back, and they had both gone overboard together, when the sudden wrenching of him, Magwitch, out of our boat, and the endeavour of his captor to keep him in it, had capsized us. He told me in a whisper that they had gone down fiercely locked in each other's arms, and that there had been a struggle under water, and that he had disengaged himself, struck out, and swum away. I never had any reason to doubt the exact truth of what he thus told me. The officer who steered the galley gave the same account of their going overboard. When I asked this officer's permission to change the prisoner's wet clothes by purchasing any spare garments I could get at the public-house, he gave it readily, merely observing that he must take charge of everything his prisoner had about him. So the pocket-book, which had once been in my hands, passed into the officer's. He further gave me leave to accompany the prisoner to London, but declined to accord that grace to my two friends. The jack at the ship was instructed where the drowned man had gone down, and undertook to search for the body in the places where it was likeliest to come ashore. His interest in its recovery seemed to me to be much heightened when he heard that it had stockings on. Probably it took about a dozen drowned men to fit him out completely, and that may have been the reason why the different articles of his dress were in various stages of decay. We remained at the public-house until the tide turned, and then Magwitch was carried down to the galley and put on board. Herbert and Startop were to get to London by land as soon as they could, we had a doleful parting, and when I took my place by Magwitch's side, I felt that that was my place henceforth while he lived. For now my repugnance to him had all melted away, and in the hunted, wounded, shackled creature who held my hand in his, I only saw a man who had meant to be my benefactor, and who had felt affectionately, gratefully, and generously towards me with great constancy through a series of years. I only saw in him a much better man than I had been to Joe. His breathing became more difficult and painful as the night drew on, and often he could not repress a groan. I tried to rest him on the arm I could use, in any easy position, but it was dreadful to think that I could not be sorry at heart for his being badly hurt, since it was unquestionably best that he should die. That there were, still living, people enough who were able and willing to identify him, I could not doubt. That he would be leniently treated, I could not hope. He who had been presented in the worst light at his trial, who had since broken prison and been tried again, who had returned from transportation under a life sentence, 
and who had occasioned the death of the man who was the cause of his arrest. As we returned toward the setting sun we had yesterday left behind us, and as the stream of our hopes seemed all running back, I told him how grieved I was to think that he had come home for my sake. "'Dear boy,' he answered, "'I'm quite content to take my chance. I've seen my boy, and he can be a gentleman without me.' No, I had thought about that, while we had been there side by side. No, apart from any inclinations of my own, I understood Wemmick's hint now. I foresaw that, being convicted, his possessions would be forfeited to the crown. "'Looky here, dear boy,' said he. "'It's best as a gentleman should not be knowed to belong to me now.' Only come to see me, as if you come by chance along her Wemmick. Sit where I can see you when I am swore to, for the last of many times, and I don't ask no more. I will never stir from your side, said I, when I am suffered to be near you. Please God, I will be as true to you as you have been to me. I felt his hand tremble as it held mine, and he turned his face away as he lay in the bottom of the boat, and I heard that old sound in his throat, softened now, like all the rest of him. It was a good thing that he had touched this point, for it put into my mind what I might not otherwise have thought of until too late, that he need never know how his hopes of enriching me had perished. End of chapter Chapter Fifty Five of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter Fifty Five. He was taken to the police court next day, and would have been immediately committed for trial, but that it was necessary to send down for an old officer of the prison ship, from which he had once escaped, to speak to his identity. Nobody doubted it, but Compeyson, who had meant to depose to it, was tumbling on the tides, dead, and it happened that there was not at that time any prison officer in London who could give the required evidence. I had gone direct to Mr. Jaggers at his private house, on my arrival overnight, to retain his assistance, and Mr. Jaggers on the prisoner's behalf would admit nothing. It was the sole resource, for he told me that the case must be over in five minutes when the witness was there, and that no power on earth could prevent its going against us. I imparted to Mr. Jaggers my design of keeping him in ignorance of the fate of his wealth. Mr. Jaggers was querulous and angry with me for having let it slip through my fingers, and said we must memorialize by and by, and try at all events for some of it. But he did not conceal from me that, although there might be many cases in which the forfeiture could not be exacted, there were no circumstances in this case to make it one of them. I understood that very well. I was not related to the outlaw, or connected with him by any recognizable tie. He had put his hand to no writing or settlement in my favour before his apprehension, and to do so now would be idle. I had no claim, and I finally resolved, and ever afterwards abided by the resolution, that my heart should never be sickened with the hopeless task of attempting to establish one. There appeared to be reason for supposing that the drowned informer had hoped for a reward out of this forfeiture, and had obtained some accurate knowledge of Magwitch's affairs. When his body was found, many miles from the scene of his death, and so horribly disfigured that he was only recognizable by the contents of his pockets, notes were still legible, folded in a case he carried. Among these were the name of a banking-house in New South Wales, where a sum of money was, and the designation of certain lands of considerable value. Both these heads of information were in a list that Magwitch, while in prison, gave to Mr. Jaggers, of the possessions he supposed I should inherit. 
His ignorance, poor fellow, at last served him. He never mistrusted but that my inheritance was quite safe with Mr. Jagger's aid. After three days' delay, during which the Crown prosecution stood over for the production of the witness from the prison ship, the witness came and completed the easy case. He was committed to take his trial at the next sessions, which would come on in a month. It was at this dark time of my life that Herbert returned home one evening, a good deal cast down, and said, "'My dear Handel, I fear I shall soon have to leave you.' His partner having prepared me for that, I was less surprised than he thought. "'We shall lose a fine opportunity if I put off going to Cairo, and I am very much afraid I must go, Handel, when you most need me. Herbert, I shall always need you, because I shall always love you, but my need is no greater now than at another time. You will be so lonely. I have not leisure to think of that, said I. You know that I am always with him to the full extent of the time allowed, and that I should be with him all day long if I could. And when I come away from him, you know that my thoughts are with him. The dreadful condition to which he was brought was so appalling to both of us that we could not refer to it in plainer words. "'My dear fellow,' said Herbert, "'let the near prospect of our separation, for it is very near, be my justification for troubling you about yourself. Have you thought of your future?' "'No, for I have been afraid to think of any future.' "'But yours cannot be dismissed.' Indeed, my dear, dear Handel, it must not be dismissed. I wish you would enter on it now, as far as a few friendly words go, with me. I will, said I. In this branch house of ours, Handel, we must have a— I saw that his delicacy was avoiding the right words, so I said, A clerk. A clerk. And I hope it is not unlikely that he may expand— as a clerk of your acquaintance has expanded, into a partner. Now, Handel, in short, my dear boy, will you come to me? There was something charmingly cordial and engaging in the manner in which, after saying, Now, Handel, as if it were the grave beginning of a portentous business exordium, he had suddenly given up that tone, stretched out his honest hand, and spoken like a schoolboy. Clara and I have talked about it again and again, Herbert pursued, and the dear little thing begged me only this evening, with tears in her eyes, to say to you that, if you will live with us when we come together, she will do her best to make you happy, and to convince her husband's friend that he is her friend too. We should get on so well, Handel. I thanked her heartily, and I thanked him heartily but said I could not yet make sure of joining him, as he so kindly offered. Firstly, my mind was too preoccupied to be able to take in the subject clearly. Secondly, yes. Secondly, there was a vague something lingering in my thoughts that will come out very near the end of this slight narrative. But if you thought, Herbert, that you could, without doing any injury to your business, leave the question open for a little while— "'For any while,' cried Herbert. "'Six months, a year!' "'Not so long as that,' said I. Two or three months, at most.' Herbert was highly delighted when we shook hands on this arrangement, and said he could now take courage to tell me that he believed he must go away at the end of the week. "'And Clara?' said I. "'The dear little thing,' returned Herbert, holds dutifully to her father as long as he lasts, but he won't last long. Mrs. Wimple confides to me that he is certainly going. "'Not to say an unfeeling thing,' said I. "'He cannot do better than go.' "'I am afraid that must be admitted,' said Herbert. "'And then I shall come back for the dear little thing, and the dear little thing and I will walk quietly into the nearest church. Remember,' The blessed darling comes of no family, my dear Handel, and never looked into the red book, and hasn't a notion about her grandpapa. What a fortune for the son of my mother! 
On the Saturday in that same week I took my leave of Herbert, full of bright hope, but sad and sorry to leave me, as he sat on one of the seaport mail coaches. I went into a coffee-house to write a little note to Clara, telling her he had gone off, sending his love to her over and over again, and then went to my lonely home. If it deserved the name, for it was now no home to me, and I had no home anywhere. On the stairs I encountered Wemmick, who was coming down, after an unsuccessful application of his knuckles to my door. I had not seen him alone since the disastrous issue of the attempted flight, and he had come, in his private and personal capacity, to say a few words of explanation in reference to that failure. "'The late Compison, said Wemmick, had by little and little got at the bottom of half of the regular business now transacted, and it was from the talk of some of his people in trouble, some of his people being always in trouble, that I heard what I did. I kept my ears open, seeming to have them shut, until I heard that he was absent, and I thought that would be the best time for making the attempt. I can only suppose now that it was a part of his policy, as a very clever man, habitually to deceive his own instruments. You don't blame me, I hope, Mr. Pip. I am sure I tried to serve you with all my heart. I am as sure of that, Wemmick, as you can be, and I thank you most earnestly for all your interest and friendship. Thank you, thank you very much. It's a bad job, said Wemmick, scratching his head, and I assure you I haven't been so cut up for a long time. What I look at is the sacrifice of so much portable property. Dear me! What I think of Wemmick is the poor owner of the property. Yes, to be sure, said Wemmick. Of course there can be no objection to your being sorry for him, and I'd put down a five-pound note myself to get him out of it. But what I look at is this, the late Compison having been beforehand with him in intelligence of his return, and being so determined to bring him to book, I do not think he could have been saved, whereas the portable property certainly could have been saved. That's the difference between the property and the owner, don't you see? I invited Wemmick to come upstairs and refresh himself with a glass of grog before walking to Walworth. He accepted the invitation. While he was drinking his moderate allowance, he said, with nothing to lead up to it, and after having appeared rather fidgety, "'What do you think of my meaning to take a holiday on Monday, Mr. Pip?' "'Why, I suppose you have not done such a thing these twelve months.' "'These twelve years, more likely,' said Wemmick. "'Yes, I'm going to take a holiday. More than that, I'm going to take a walk. More than that, I'm going to ask you to take a walk with me.' I was about to excuse myself, as being but a bad companion just then, when Wemmick anticipated me. "'I know your engagements,' said he, "'and I know you were out of sorts, Mr. Pip. But if you could oblige me, I should take it as a kindness. It ain't a long walk, and it's an early one. Say it might occupy you, including breakfast on the walk, from eight to twelve. Couldn't you stretch a point and manage it? He had done so much for me at various times that this was very little to do for him. I said I could manage it, would manage it, and he was so very much pleased by my acquiescence that I was pleased too. At his particular request I appointed to call for him at the castle at half-past eight on Monday morning, and so we parted for the time. Punctual to my appointment, I rang at the castle gate on the Monday morning, and was received by Wemmick himself, who struck me as looking tighter than usual, and having a sleeker hat on. Within, there were two glasses of rum and milk prepared, and two biscuits. The aged must have been stirring with the lark, for, glancing into the perspective of his bedroom, I observed that his bed was empty. When we had fortified ourselves with the rum and milk and biscuits— and were going out for the walk with that training preparation on us, I was considerably surprised to see Wemmick take up a fishing-rod and put it over his shoulder. "'Why, we are not going fishing,' said I. 
No, replied Wemmick, but I like to walk with one. I thought this odd. However, I said nothing, and we set off. We went towards Caberwell Green, and when we were thereabouts, Wemmick said suddenly, Hello, here's a church. There was nothing very surprising in that, but again I was rather surprised when he said, as if he were animated by a brilliant idea, Let's go in. We went in, Wemmick leaving his fishing-rod on the porch, and looked all round. In the meantime, Wemmick was diving into his coat-pockets, and getting something out of paper there. Hello, said he, here's a couple of pair of gloves. Let's put them on. As the gloves were white kid gloves, and as the post-office was widened to its utmost extent, I now began to have my strong suspicions. They were strengthened into certainty when I beheld the aged enter at a side-door, escorting a lady. Hello, said Wemmick, here's Miss Skiffins. Let's have a wedding. That discreet damsel was attired as usual except that she was now engaged in substituting for her green kid gloves a pair of white. The aged was likewise occupied in preparing a similar sacrifice for the altar of Hymen. The old gentleman, however, experienced so much difficulty in getting his gloves on, that Wemmick found it necessary to put him with his back against a pillar, and then to get behind the pillar himself and pull away at them, while I, for my part, held the old gentleman round the waist, that he might present equal and safe resistance. By dint of this ingenious scheme his gloves were got on to perfection. The clerk and clergyman then appearing, we were ranged in order at those fatal rails. True to his notion of seeming to do it all without preparation, I heard Wemmick say to himself, as he took something out of his waistcoat pocket before the service began, "'Hello, here's a ring!' I acted in the capacity of backer, or best man, to the bridegroom, while a little limp pew-opener in a soft bonnet like a baby's made a feint of being the bosom friend of Miss Skiffins. The responsibility of giving the lady away devolved upon the aged, which led to the clergyman's being unintentionally scandalized, and it happened thus. When he said, "'Who giveth this woman to be married to this man?' The old gentleman, not in the least knowing what point of the ceremony we had arrived at, stood most amiably beaming at the Ten Commandments, upon which the clergyman said again, "'Who giveth this woman to be married to this man?' The old gentleman being still in a state of most estimable unconsciousness, the bridegroom cried out in his accustomed voice, "'Now, aged P, you know, who giveth?' To which the aged replied with great briskness, before saying that he gave, "'All right, John, all right, my boy,' and the clergyman came to so gloomy a pause upon it that I had doubts for the moment whether we should get completely married that day. It was completely done, however, and when we were going out of church, Wemmick took the cover off the font, and put his white gloves in it, and put the cover on again. Mrs. Wemmick, more heedful of the future, put her white gloves in her pocket, and assumed her green. "'Now, Mr. Pip,' said Wemmick, triumphantly shouldering the fishing-rod as we came out, "'let me ask you whether anybody would suppose this to be a wedding-party.' Breakfast had been ordered at a pleasant little tavern, a mile or so away upon the rising ground beyond the green, and there was a bagatelle-board in the room, in case we should desire to unbend our minds after the solemnity. It was pleasant to observe that Mrs. Wemmick no longer unwound Wemmick's arm when it adapted itself to her figure, but sat in a high-backed chair against the wall, like a violoncello in its case, and submitted to be embraced as that melodious instrument might have done. We had an excellent breakfast, and when any one declined anything on table, Wemmick said, "'Provided by contract, you know, don't be afraid of it.' I drank to the new couple— drank to the aged, drank to the castle, saluted the bride at parting, and made myself as agreeable as I could. Wemmick came down to the door with me, and I again shook hands with him, and wished him joy. "'Thank ye,' said Wemmick, rubbing his hands. "'She's such a manager of fowls. You have no idea. You shall have some eggs, and judge for yourself. I say, Mr. Pip,' 
calling me back and speaking low. "'This is altogether a Walworth sentiment, please.' "'I understand. Not to be mentioned in Little Britain,' said I. Wemmick nodded. "'After what you let out the other day, Mr. Jaggers may as well not know of it. He might think my brain was softening, or something of the kind.' End of chapter. Chapter fifty six of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens Chapter 56 He lay in prison very ill, during the whole interval between his committal for trial and the coming round of the sessions. He had broken two ribs, they had wounded one of his lungs, and he breathed with great pain and difficulty, which increased daily. It was a consequence of his hurt that he spoke so low as to be scarcely audible, therefore he spoke very little but he was ever ready to listen to me, and it became the first duty of my life to say to him, and read to him, what I knew he ought to hear. Being far too ill to remain in the common prison, he was removed, after the first day or so, into the infirmary. This gave me opportunities of being with him that I could not otherwise have had. And but for his illness, he would have been put in irons, for he was regarded as a determined prison-breaker, and I know not what else. Although I saw him every day, it was for only a short time. Hence, the regularly recurring spaces of our separation were long enough to record on his face any slight changes that occurred in his physical state. I do not recollect that I once saw any change in it for the better. He wasted, and became slowly weaker and worse, day by day, from the day when the prison door closed upon him. The kind of submission or resignation that he showed was that of a man who was tired out. I sometimes derived an impression, from his manner or from a whispered word or two which escaped him, that he pondered over the question whether he might have been a better man under better circumstances. But he never justified himself by a hint tending that way, or tried to bend the past out of its eternal shape. It happened on two or three occasions in my presence that his desperate reputation was alluded to by one or other of the people in attendance on him. A smile crossed his face then, and he turned his eyes on me with a trustful look, as if he were confident that I had seen some small redeeming touch in him, even so long ago as when I was a little child. As to all the rest, he was humble and contrite, and I never knew him complain. When the sessions came round, Mr. Jaggers caused an application to be made for the postponement of his trial until the following sessions. It was obviously made with the assurance that he could not live so long, and was refused. The trial came on at once, and when he was put to the bar, he was seated in a chair. No objection was made to my getting close to the dock, on the outside of it, and holding the hand that he stretched forth to me. The trial was very short and very clear. Such things as could be said for him were said, how he had taken to industrious habits, and had thriven lawfully and reputably. But nothing could unsay the fact that he had returned, and was there in the presence of the judge and jury. It was impossible to try him for that, and do otherwise than find him guilty. At that time it was the custom— as I learnt from my terrible experience of that sessions, to devote a concluding day to the passing of sentences, and to make a finishing effect with the sentence of death. But for the indelible picture that my remembrance now holds before me, I could scarcely believe, even as I write these words, that I saw two and thirty men and women put before the judge to receive that sentence together. Foremost among the two and thirty was he, seated, that he might get breath enough to keep life in him. The whole scene starts out again in the vivid colours of the moment, down to the drops of April rain on the windows of the court, glittering in the rays of April sun. Penned in the dock, 
as I again stood outside it at the corner with his hand in mine, were the two and thirty men and women, some defiant, some stricken with terror, some sobbing and weeping, some covering their faces, some staring gloomily about. There had been shrieks from among the women convicts, but they had been stilled, and a hush had succeeded. The sheriffs with their great chains and nosegays, other civic gewgaws and monsters, criers, ushers, a great gallery full of people, a large theatrical audience, looked on as the two and thirty and the judge were solemnly confronted. Then the judge addressed them. Among the wretched creatures before him, whom he must single out for special address, was one who almost from his infancy had been an offender against the laws, who, after repeated imprisonments and punishments, had been at length sentenced to exile for a term of years, and who, under circumstances of great violence and daring, had made his escape and been resentenced to exile for life. That miserable man would seem for a time to have become convinced of his errors, when far removed from the scenes of his old offences, and to have lived a peaceable and honest life. But in a fatal moment, yielding to those propensities and passions, the indulgence of which had so long rendered him a scourge to society, he had quitted his haven of rest and repentance, and had come back to the country where he was proscribed. Being here presently denounced, he had for a time succeeded in evading the officers of justice, but being at length seized while in the act of flight, he had resisted them, and had, he best knew whether by express design, or in the blindness of his hardihood, caused the death of his denouncer, to whom his whole career was known. The appointed punishment for his return to the land that had cast him out, being death, and his case being this aggravated case, he must prepare himself to die. The sun was striking in at the great windows of the court, through the glittering drops of rain upon the glass, and it made a broad shaft of light between the two and thirty and the judge, linking both together, and perhaps reminding some among the audience how both were passing on, with absolute equality, to the greater judgment that knoweth all things, and cannot err. Rising for a moment, a distinct speck of face in this way of light, the prisoner said, My lord, I have received my sentence of death from the Almighty, but I bow to yours, and sat down again. There was some hushing, and the judge went on with what he had to say to the rest. Then they were all formally doomed, and some of them were supported out, and some of them sauntered out with a haggard look of bravery, and a few nodded to the gallery, and two or three shook hands, and others went out chewing the fragments of herb they had taken from the sweet herbs lying about. He went last of all, because of having to be helped from his chair, and to go very slowly, and he held my hand while all the others were removed, and while the audience got up, putting their dresses right as they might at church or elsewhere, and pointed down at this criminal or at that, and most of all at him and me. I earnestly hoped and prayed that he might die before the recorder's report was made, but in the dread of his lingering on I began that night to write out a petition to the Home Secretary of State, setting forth my knowledge of him, and how it was that he had come back for my sake. I wrote it as fervently and pathetically as I could, and when I had finished it and sent it in, I wrote out other petitions to such men in authority as I hoped were the most merciful, and drew up one to the crown itself. For several days and nights after he was sentenced, I took no rest except when I fell asleep in my chair, and was wholly absorbed in those appeals. And after I had sent them in, I could not keep away from the places where they were, but felt as if they were more hopeful and less desperate when I was near them. In this unreasonable restlessness and pain of mind I would roam the streets of an evening, wandering by those offices and houses where I had left the petitions. To the present hour, the weary western streets of London on a cold, dusty spring night, with their ranges of stern, shut-up mansions and their long rows of lamps, are melancholy to me from this association. The daily visits I could make him were shortened now, 
and he was more strictly kept. Seeing, or fancying, that I was suspected of an intention of carrying poison to him, I asked to be searched before I sat down at his bedside, and told the officer who was always there, that I was willing to do anything that would assure him of the singleness of my designs. Nobody was hard with him or with me. There was duty to be done, and it was done, but not harshly. The officer always gave me the assurance that he was worse, and some other sick prisoners in the room, and some other prisoners who attended on them as sick nurses, malefactors, but not incapable of kindness, God be thanked, always joined in the same report. As the days went on, I noticed more and more that he would lie placidly looking at the white ceiling, with an absence of light in his face until some word of mine brightened it for an instant, and then it would subside again. Sometimes he was almost or quite unable to speak, and then he would answer me with slight pressures on my hand, and I grew to understand his meaning very well. The number of the days had risen to ten, when I saw a greater change in him than I had seen yet. His eyes were turned towards the door, and lighted up as I entered. "'Dear boy,' he said, as I sat down by his bed, "'I thought you was late, but I knowed you couldn't be that.' "'It is just the time,' said I. "'I waited for it at the gate.' "'You always wait, at the gate, don't you, dear boy?' "'Yes, not to lose a moment of the time.' "'Thank ye, dear boy, thank ye. God bless you. You've never deserted me, dear boy.' I pressed his hand in silence, for I could not forget that I had once meant to desert him. "'And what's the best of all?' he said. "'You've been more comfortable a longer me.' since I was under a dark cloud, than when the sun shone. That's best of all. He lay on his back, breathing with great difficulty. Do what he would, and love me though he did, the light left his face ever and again, and a film came over the placid look at the white ceiling. Are you in much pain today? I don't complain of none, dear boy. You never do complain. He had spoken his last words. He smiled, and I understood his touch to mean that he wished to lift my hand and lay it on his breast. I laid it there, and he smiled again, and put both his hands upon it. The allotted time ran out while we were thus, but looking round I found the governor of the prison standing near me, and he whispered, you needn't go yet. I thanked him gratefully, and asked, Might I speak to him, if he can hear me? The governor stepped aside, and beckoned the officer away. The change, though it was made without noise, drew back the film from the placid look at the white ceiling, and he looked most affectionately at me. Dear Magwitch, I must tell you now at last— you understand what I say? A gentle pressure on my hand. You had a child once, whom you loved and lost. A stronger pressure on my hand. She lived, and found powerful friends. She is living now. She is a lady and very beautiful. And I love her. With a last faint effort, which would have been powerless but for my yielding to it and assisting it, he raised my hand to his lips. Then he gently let it sink upon his breast again, with his own hands lying on it. The placid look at the white ceiling came back, and passed away, and his head dropped quietly on his breast. Mindful, then, of what we had read together, I thought of the two men who went up into the temple to pray, and I knew there were no better words that I could say beside his bed than, O oh Lord, be merciful to him, a sinner. End of chapter Chapter 57 of Great Expectations This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit 
LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens Chapter 57 Now that I was left wholly to myself, I gave notice of my intention to quit the chambers in the temple as soon as my tenancy could legally determine, and in the meanwhile to underlet them. At once I put bills up in the windows, for I was in debt, and had scarcely any money, and began to be seriously alarmed by the state of my affairs. I ought rather to write that I should have been alarmed, if I had had energy and concentration enough to help me to the clear perception of any truth beyond the fact that I was falling very ill. The late stress upon me had enabled me to put off illness, but not to put it away. I knew that it was coming on me now, and I knew very little else, and was even careless as to that. For a day or two I lay on the sofa, or on the floor, anywhere, according as I happened to sink down, with a heavy head and aching limbs, and no purpose and no power. Then there came one night which appeared of great duration, and which teemed with anxiety and horror, and when in the morning I tried to sit up in my bed and think of it, I found I could not do so. Whether I really had been down in garden court in the dead of the night, groping about for the boat that I supposed to be there, whether I had two or three times come to myself on the staircase with great terror, not knowing how I had got out of bed, whether I had found myself lighting the lamp, possessed by the idea that he was coming up the stairs, and that the lights were blown out, whether I had been inexpressibly harassed by the distracted talking, laughing, and groaning of some one, and had half suspected those sounds to be of my own making, whether there had been a closed iron furnace in a dark corner of the room, and a voice had called out, over and over again, that Miss Havisham was consuming within it, these were things that I tried to settle with myself, and get into some order, as I lay that morning on my bed. But the vapour of a lime-kiln would come between me and them, disordering them all, and it was through the vapour at last that I saw two men looking at me. "'What do you want?' I asked, starting. "'I don't know you.' "'Well, sir,' returned one of them, bending down and touching me on the shoulder, this is a matter that you'll soon arrange, I dare say, but you're arrested. What is the debt? Hundred and twenty-three pound fifteen, six jeweller's account, I think. What is to be done? You had better come to my house, said the man. I keep a very nice house. I made some attempt to get up and dress myself. When I next attended to them, they were standing a little off from the bed, looking at me. I still lay there. "'You see my state,' said I. "'I would come with you if I could, but, indeed, I am quite unable. If you take me from here, I think I shall die by the way.' Perhaps they replied, or argued the point, or tried to encourage me to believe that I was better than I thought for as much as they hang in my memory by only this one slender thread, I don't know what they did, except that they forbore to remove me. That I had a fever and was avoided, that I suffered greatly, that I often lost my reason, that the time seemed interminable, that I confounded impossible existences with my own identity, that I was a brick in the house wall, and yet entreating to be released from the giddy place where the builders had set me, that I was a steel beam of a vast engine, clashing and whirling over a gulf, and yet that I implored in my own person to have the engine stopped, and my part in it hammered off, that I passed through these phases of disease I know of my own remembrance, and did in some sort know at the time, that I sometimes struggled with real people, in the belief that they were murderers, and that I would all at once comprehend that they meant to do me good, and would then sink exhausted in their arms, and suffer them to lay me down, I also knew at the time. But, above all, I knew that there was a constant tendency in all these people, 
who, when I was very ill, would present all kinds of extraordinary transformations of the human face, and would be much dilated in size, above all, I say, I knew that there was an extraordinary tendency in all these people, sooner or later, to settle down into the likeness of Joe. After I had turned the worst point of my illness, I began to notice that while all its other features changed, this one consistent feature did not change. Whoever came about me still settled down into Joe. I opened my eyes in the night, and I saw, in the great chair at the bedside, Joe. I opened my eyes in the day, and sitting on the window-seat, smoking his pipe in the shaded open window, still I saw Joe. I asked for a cooling drink, and the dear hand that gave it me was Joe's. I sank back on my pillow after drinking, and the face that looked so hopefully and tenderly upon me was the face of Joe. At last one day I took courage and said, Is it Joe? And the dear old home voice answered, Which it are, old chap? Oh, Joe, you break my heart. Don't look angry at me, Joe. Strike me, Joe. Tell me of my ingratitude. Don't be so good to me. For Joe had actually laid his head down on the pillow at my side, and put his arm round my neck in his joy that I knew him. Which, dear old Pip, old chap, said Joe, you and me was ever friends, and when you're well enough to go out for a ride, what larks? After which Joe withdrew to the window, and stood with his back towards me, wiping his eyes. And as my extreme weakness prevented me from getting up and going to him, I lay there, penitently whispering, Oh, God bless him! Oh, God bless this gentle Christian man! Joe's eyes were red when I next found him beside me, but I was holding his hand, and we both felt happy. How long, dear Joe? Which you mean to say, Pip? How long has your illness lasted, dear old chap? Yes, Joe. It's the end of May, Pip. Tomorrow is the first of June. And have you been here all that time, dear Joe? Pretty nigh, old chap. For, as I says to Biddy when the news of your being ill were brought by letter, which it were brought by the post, and being formerly single, he is now married, though underpaid, for a deal of walking and shoe-leather. But wealth were not an object on his part, and marriage were the great wish of his heart. It is so delightful to hear you, Joe. But I interrupt you in what you said to Biddy. Which it were, said Joe, that how you might be amongst strangers, and that how you and me having been ever friends— a visit at such a moment might not prove unacceptable. And Biddy, her word were, go to him without loss of time. That, said Joe, summing up with his judicial air, were the word of Biddy. Go to him, Biddy say, without loss of time. In short, I shouldn't greatly deceive you, Joe added after a little grave reflection, if I represented to you that the word of that young woman were, without a minute's loss of time. There Joe cut himself short, and informed me that I was to be talked to in great moderation, and that I was to take a little nourishment at stated frequent times, whether I felt inclined for it or not, and that I was to submit myself to all his orders. So I kissed his hand and lay quiet, while he proceeded to indict a note to Biddy with my love in it. Evidently Biddy had taught Joe to write. As I lay in bed looking at him, it made me in my weak state cry again with pleasure to see the pride with which he set about his letter. My bedstead, divested of its curtains, had been removed, with me upon it, into the sitting-room, as the airiest and largest, and the carpet had been taken away, and the room kept always fresh and wholesome night and day. At my own writing-table, pushed into a corner and cumbered with little bottles, Joe now sat down to his great work, 
first choosing a pen from the pen tray as if it were a chest of large tools, and tucking up his sleeves as if he were going to wield a crowbar or sledgehammer. It was necessary for Joe to hold on heavily to the table with his left elbow, and to get his right leg well out behind him, before he could begin, and when he did begin he made every downstroke so slowly that it might have been six feet long, while at every upstroke I could hear his pen spluttering extensively. He had a curious idea that the inkstand was on the side of him where it was not, and constantly dipped his pen into space, and seemed quite satisfied with the result. Occasionally he was tripped up by some orthographical stumbling-block, but on the whole he got on very well indeed, and when he had signed his name, and had removed a finishing blot from the paper to the crown of his head with his two forefingers, he got up and hovered about the table, trying the effect of his performance from various points of view, as it lay there, with unbounded satisfaction. Not to make Joe uneasy by talking too much, even if I had been able to talk much, I deferred asking him about Miss Havisham until next day. He shook his head when I then asked him if she had recovered. "'Is she dead, Joe?' "'Why, you see, old chap,' said Joe, in a tone of remonstrance, and by way of getting at it by degrees, "'I wouldn't go so far as to say that, for that's a deal to say, but she ain't—' "'Living, Joe?' "'That's nigher where it is,' said Joe. "'She ain't livin.' Did she linger long, Joe? Arter you was took ill, pretty much about what you might call, if you was put to it, a week, said Joe, still determined on my account to come at everything by degrees. Dear Joe, have you heard what becomes of her property? Well, old chap, said Joe, it do appear that she had settled the most of it, which I mean to say tied it up, a Miss Estella but she had wrote out a codicil in her own hand a day or two afore the accident, leaving a cool four thousand to Mr. Matthew Pocket. And why do you suppose, above all things, Pip, she left that cool four thousand unto him? Because of Pip's account of him, the said Matthew. I am told by Biddy that ere the writing, said Joe, repeating the legal term as if it did him infinite good, account of him the said Matthew, and a cool four thousand, Pip. I never discovered from whom Joe derived the conventional temperature of the four thousand pounds. But it appeared to make the sum of money more to him, and he had a manifest relish in insisting on its being cool. This account gave me great joy, as it perfected the only good thing I had done. I asked Joe whether he had heard if any of the other relations had any legacies. "'Miss Sarah,' said Joe, "'she have twenty-five pound perennium for to buy pills, on account of being bilious. Miss Georgiana, she have twenty pound down. Mrs. Uh, what's the name of them wild beasts with humps, old chap?' "'Camels?' said I, wondering why he could possibly want to know. Joe nodded. Mrs. Camels, by which I presently understood he met Camilla. She have five pound for to buy rush lights to put her in spirits when she wake up in the night. The accuracy of these recitals was sufficiently obvious to me to give me great confidence in Joe's information. And now, said Joe, you ain't that strong yet, old chap, that you can take in more nor one additional shovelful to-day. Old Orlick, he's been a bustin' open a dwellin' house. Who's? said I. Not, I grant you, but what his manners is given to blusterous, said Joe, apologetically. Still, an Englishman's house is his castle, and castles must not be busted, except when done in wartime. And whatsoever the failings on his part, he were a corn and seedsman in his heart, "'Is it Pumblechook's house that has been broken into, then?' "'That's it, Pip,' said Joe. "'And they took his till, and they took his cash-box, "'and they drinked his wine, 
and they partook of his whittles, and they slapped his face, and they pulled his nose, and they tied him up to his bedpost, and they give him a dozen, and they stuffed his mouth full of flowering annuals to prevent his crying out. But he knowed Orlick, and Orlick's in the county jail. By these approaches we arrived at unrestricted conversation. I was slow to gain strength, but I did slowly and surely become less weak, and Joe stayed with me, and I fancied I was little Pip again. For the tenderness of Joe was so beautifully proportioned to my need that I was like a child in his hands. He would sit and talk to me in the old confidence and with the old simplicity, and in the old unassertive protecting way, so that I would half believe that all my life, since the days of the old kitchen, was one of the mental troubles of the fever that was gone. He did everything for me except the household work, for which he had engaged a very decent woman, after paying off the laundress on his first arrival. "'Which I do assure you, Pip,' he would often say, in explanation of that liberty, "'I found her a-tap in the spare bed, like a cask of beer, and drawn off the feathers in a bucket for sale, which she would have tapped your next, and drawed it off with you a-layin' on it, and was then a-carryin' away the coals gradually in the soup tureen and vegetable dishes, and the wine and spirits in your Wellington boots.' We looked forward to the day when I should go out for a ride, as we had once looked forward to the day of my apprenticeship, and when the day came, and an open carriage was got into the lane, Joe wrapped me up, took me in his arms, carried me down to it, and put me in, as if I were still the small helpless creature to whom he had so abundantly given the wealth of his great nature. And Joe got in beside me, and we drove away together into the country, where the rich summer growth was already on the trees and on the grass, and sweet summer scents filled all the air. The day happened to be Sunday, and when I looked on the loveliness around me, and thought how it had grown and changed, and how the little wild flowers had been forming, and the voices of the birds had been strengthening, by day and by night, under the sun and under the stars, while poor I lay burning and tossing on my bed, the mere remembrance of having burned and tossed there came like a check upon my peace. But when I heard the Sunday bells, and looked around a little more upon the outspread beauty, I felt that I was not nearly thankful enough, that I was too weak yet to be even that, and I laid my head on Joe's shoulder, as I had laid it long ago when he had taken me to the fair or where not, and it was too much for my young senses. More composure came to me after a while, and we talked as we used to talk, lying on the grass at the old battery. There was no change whatever in Joe. Exactly what he had been in my eyes then, he was in my eyes still, just as simply faithful, and as simply right. When we got back again, and he lifted me out and carried me, so easily, across the court and up the stairs, I thought of that eventful Christmas day when he had carried me over the marshes. We had not yet made any allusion to my change of fortune, nor did I know how much of my late history he was acquainted with. I was so doubtful of myself now, and put so much trust in him, that I could not satisfy myself whether I ought to refer to it when he did not. "'Have you heard, Joe?' I asked him that evening, upon further consideration, as he smoked his pipe at the window. "'Who my patron was?' "'I heard,' returned Joe. "'As it were not Miss Havisham, old chap.' "'Did you hear who it was, Joe?' "'Well, I heard as it were a person what sent the person, what give you the bank-notes at the Jolly Bargeman, Pip.' "'So it was.' "'Astonishing,' said Joe, in the placidest way. "'Did you hear that he was dead, Joe?' I presently asked, with increasing diffidence. "'Which? Him as sent the bank-notes, Pip?' "'Yes.' "'I think,' said Joe, after meditating a long time, and looking rather evasively at the window-seat, "'as I did hear tell that how he were something or other in a general way in that direction.' 
Did you hear anything of his circumstances, Joe? Not particular, Pip. But if you would like to hear, Joe... I was beginning when Joe got up and came to my sofa. Looky here, old chap, said Joe, bending over me. Ever the best of friends, ain't us, Pip? I was ashamed to answer him. Very good, then, said Joe, as if I had answered. That's all right, that's agreed upon. Then why go into subjects, old chap, which as betwixt two such must be for ever unnecessary? There's subjects enough dis betwixt two such, without unnecessary ones. Lord, to think of your poor sister and her rampages, and don't you remember Tickler? I do indeed, Joe. Looky here, old chap, said Joe. I done what I could to keep you and Tickler in a sunders, but my power was not always fully equal to my inclinations. For when your poor sister had a mind to drop into you, it were not so much, said Joe, in his favourite argumentative way, that she dropped into me too, if I put myself in opposition to her, but that she dropped into you always heavier for it. I noticed that. It ain't a grab at a man's whisker, nor yet a shake or two of a man, to which your sister was quite welcome, that it put a man off from getting a little child out of punishment. But when that little child is dropped into heavier for that grab o' whisker or shaken, then that man naturally up and says to himself, Where is the good as you are a-doin'? I grant you I see the harm, said the man, but I don't see the good. I call upon you, sir, therefore, to point out the good. The man says, I observed, as Joe waited for me to speak. The man says, Joe assented, is he right, that man? Dear Joe, he is always right. Well, old chap, said Joe, then abide by your words. If he's always right, which in general he's more likely wrong, he's right when he says this. Supposing ever you kept any little matter to yourself, when you was a little child, you kept it mostly because you knowed as J. Gargery's power to part you and Tickler in Sunders were not fully equal to his inclinations. Therefore, I think no more of it as betwixt two such, and do not let us pass remarks upon unnecessary subjects. Biddy give herself a deal of trouble with me before I left, for I am almost awful dull, as I should view it in this light, and viewing it in this light, as I should so put it, both of which, said Joe, quite charmed with his logical arrangement, being done, now this to you a true friend, say, namely, you mustn't go a overdoin' on it, but you must have your supper and your wine and water, and you must be put betwixt the sheets. The delicacy with which Joe dismissed this theme, and the sweet tact and kindness with which Biddy, who with her woman's wit had found me out so soon, had prepared him for it, made a deep impression on my mind. But whether Joe knew how poor I was, and how my great expectations had all dissolved, like our own marsh mists before the sun, I could not understand. Another thing in Joe that I could not understand, when it first began to develop itself, but which I soon arrived at, a sorrowful comprehension of, was this. As I became stronger and better, Joe became a little less easy with me. In my weakness and entire dependence on him, the dear fellow had fallen into the old tone, and called me by the old names, the dear old Pip, old chap, that now were music in my ears. I too had fallen into the old ways, only happy and thankful that he let me. But imperceptibly, though I held by them fast, Joe's hold upon them began to slacken, and whereas I wondered at this, at first, I soon began to understand that the cause of it was in me and that the fault of it was all mine. Ah! Had I given Joe no reason to doubt my constancy, and to think that in prosperity I should grow cold to him and cast him off? 
Had I given Joe's innocent heart no cause to feel instinctively that as I got stronger, his hold upon me would be weaker, and that he had better loosen it in time and let me go, before I plucked myself away? It was on the third or fourth occasion of my going out walking in the temple gardens, leading on Joe's arm, that I saw this change in him very plainly. We had been sitting in the bright warm sunlight, looking at the river, and I chanced to say as we got up, "'See, Joe, I can walk quite strongly. Now you shall see me walk back by myself.' "'Which do not overdo it, Pip,' said Joe. "'But I shall be happy for to see you able, sir.' The last word grated on me. But how could I remonstrate? I walked no further than the gate of the gardens, and then pretended to be weaker than I was, and asked Joe for his arm. Joe gave it me, but was thoughtful. I, for my part, was thoughtful, too, for how best to check this growing change in Joe was a great perplexity to my remorseful thoughts. That I was ashamed to tell him exactly how I was placed, and what I had come down to, I do not seek to conceal. But I hope my reluctance was not quite an unworthy one. He would want to help me out of his little savings, I knew, and I knew that he ought not to help me, and that I must not suffer him to do it. It was a thoughtful evening with both of us, but, before we went to bed, I had resolved that I would wait over to-morrow, to-morrow being Sunday, and would begin my new course with the new week. On Monday morning I would speak to Joe about this change, I would lay aside this last vestige of reserve, I would tell him what I had in my thoughts, that secondly, not yet arrived at, and why I had not decided to go out to Herbert, and then the change would be conquered for ever. As I cleared, Joe cleared, and it seemed as though he had sympathetically arrived at a resolution too. We had a quiet day on the Sunday, and we rode out into the country, and then walked in the fields. "'I feel thankful that I have been ill, Joe,' I said. "'Dear old Pip, old chap, you're almost come round, sir.' "'It has been a memorable time for me, Joe.' "'Likewise for myself, sir,' Joe returned. "'We have had a time together, Joe, that I can never forget. There were days once, I know, that I did for a while forget, but I never shall forget these.' "'Pip,' said Joe, appearing a little hurried and troubled, "'there has been larks, and, dear sir, what has been betwixt us, have been.' At night, when I had gone to bed, Joe came into my room, as he had done all through my recovery. He asked me if I felt sure that I was as well as in the morning. "'Yes, dear Joe, quite.' "'And are always a-getting stronger, old chap?' "'Yes, dear Joe, steadily.' Joe patted the coverlet on my shoulder with his great good hand, and said, in what I thought a husky voice, "'Good night.' When I got up in the morning, refreshed and stronger yet, I was full of my resolution to tell Joe all, without delay. I would tell him before breakfast. I would dress at once and go to his room and surprise him, for it was the first day I had been up early. I went to his room, and he was not there. Not only was he not there, but his box was gone. I hurried then to the breakfast-table, and on it found a letter. These were its brief contents. Not wishful to intrude, I have departured for you are well again, dear Pip, and will do better without J.O. P.S. Ever the best of friends. Enclosed in the letter was a receipt for the debt and costs on which I had been arrested. Down to that moment I had vainly supposed that my creditor had withdrawn, or suspended proceedings until I should be quite recovered. I had never dreamed of Joe's having paid the money, but Joe had paid it, and the receipt was in his name. What remained for me now? but to follow him to the dear old forge, and there to have out my disclosure to him, and my penitent remonstrance with him, 
and there to relieve my mind and heart of that reserved secondly, which had begun as a vague something lingering in my thoughts, and had formed into a settled purpose. The purpose was that I would go to Biddy, that I would show her how humbled and repentant I came back, that I would tell her how I had lost all I once hoped for, that I would remind her of our old confidences in my first unhappy time. Then I would say to her, Biddy, I think you once liked me very well, when my errant heart, even while it strayed away from you, was quieter and better with you than it ever has been since. If you can like me only half as well once more, if you can take me with all my faults and disappointments on my head, if you can receive me like a forgiven child, and indeed I am as sorry, Biddy, and have as much need of a hushing voice and a soothing hand, I hope I am a little worthier of you than I was. Not much, but a little. And, Biddy, it shall rest with you to say whether I shall work at the forge with Joe, or whether I shall try for any different occupation down in this country, or whether we shall go away to a distant place where an opportunity awaits me, which I set aside, when it was offered, until I knew your answer. And now, dear Biddy, if you can tell me that you will go through the world with me, you will surely make it a better world for me, and me a better man for it, and I will try hard to make it a better world for you. Such was my purpose. After three days more of recovery, I went down to the old place to put it in execution, and how I sped in it is all I have left to tell. End of chapter Chapter fifty eight of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter fifty eight. The tidings of my high fortunes having had a heavy fall had got down to my native place and its neighborhood before I got there. I found the blue boar in possession of the intelligence, and I found that it made a great change in the boar's demeanor. Whereas the boar had cultivated my good opinion with warm assiduity when I was coming into property, the boar was exceedingly cool on the subject now that I was going out of property. It was evening when I arrived, much fatigued by the journey I had so often made so easily. The boar could not put me into my usual bedroom, which was engaged, probably by someone who had expectations, and could only assign me a very indifferent chamber among the pigeons and post-chaises up the yard. But I had as sound a sleep in that lodging as in the most superior accommodation the boar could have given me and the quality of my dreams was about the same as in the best bedroom. Early in the morning, while my breakfast was getting ready, I strolled round by Satis House. There were printed bills on the gate and on bits of carpet hanging out of the windows, announcing a sale by auction of the household furniture and effects next week. The house itself was to be sold as old building materials and pulled down. Lot 1 was marked in whitewashed knock knee letters on the brew-house, Lot 2 on that part of the main building which had been so long shut up. Other lots were marked off on other parts of the structure, and the ivy had been torn down to make room for the inscriptions, and much of it trailed low in the dust and was withered already. Stepping in for a moment at the open gate, and looking around me with the uncomfortable air of a stranger who had no business there, I saw the auctioneer's clerk walking on the casks and telling them off for the information of a catalogue compiler, pen in hand, who made a temporary desk of the wheeled chair I had so often pushed along to the tune of Old Clem. When I got back to my breakfast in the Boar's coffee-room, I found Mr. Pumblechook conversing with the landlord. Mr. Pumblechook, not improved in appearance by his late nocturnal adventure, was waiting for me, and addressed me in the following terms. "'Young man, 
I am sorry to see you brought low. But what else could be expected? What else could be expected? As he extended his hand with a magnificently forgiving air, and as I was broken by illness and unfit to quarrel, I took it. William, said Mr. Pumblechook to the waiter, put a muffin on table. And has it come to this? Has it come to this? I frowningly sat down to my breakfast. Mr. Pumblechook stood over me and poured out my tea, before I could touch the teapot, with the air of a benefactor who was resolved to be true to the last. William, said Mr. Pumblechook, mournfully, put the salt on. In happier times, addressing me, I think you took sugar? And did you take milk? You did. Sugar and milk. William, bring a watercress. Thank you, said I shortly, but I don't eat watercresses. You don't eat em returned Mr. Pumblechook, sighing and nodding his head several times, as if he might have expected that, and as if abstinence from watercresses were consistent with my downfall. True, the simple fruits of the earth. No, you needn't bring any, William. I went on with my breakfast, and Mr. Pumblechook continued to stand over me, staring fishily and breathing noisily, as he always did. "'Little more than skin and bone,' mused Mr. Pumblechook aloud. "'And yet when he went from here, I may say with my blessing, and I spread afore him my humble store, like the bee, he was as plump as a peach.' This reminded me of the wonderful difference between the servile manner in which he had offered his hand in my new prosperity, saying, "'May I?' and the ostentatious clemency with which he had just now exhibited the same fat five fingers. Ha! he went on, handing me bread and butter. And are you going to Joseph? In heaven's name, said I, firing in spite of myself, what does it matter to you where I'm going? Leave that teapot alone. It was the worst course I could have taken, because it gave Pumblechook the opportunity he wanted. "'Yes, young man,' said he, releasing the handle of the article in question, and retiring a step or two from my table, and speaking for the behoof of the landlord and waiter at the door, "'I will leave that teapot alone. You are right, young man. For once you are right. I forget myself when I take such an interest in your breakfast as to wish your frame exhausted by the debilitating effects of prodigality, to be stimulated by the wholesome nourishment of your forefathers. And yet, said Pumblechook, turning to the landlord and waiter, and pointing me out at arm's length, this is him as I ever sported with in his days of happy infancy. Tell me not, it cannot be. I tell you, this is him." A low murmur from the two replied. The waiter appeared to be particularly affected. "'This is him,' said Pumblechook, "'as I have rode in my shay-cart. This is him as I have seen brought up by hand. This is him unto the sister of which I was uncle by marriage, as her name was Georgiana Miria from her own mother. Let him deny it if he can.' The waiter seemed convinced that I could not deny it, and that it gave the case a black look. "'Young man,' said Pumblechook, screwing his head at me in the old fashion, "'you are a-going to Joseph. What does it matter to me, you ask me, where you are a-going? I say to you, sir, you are a-going to Joseph.' The waiter coughed, as if he modestly invited me to get over that. "'No,' said Pumblechook, and all this with a most exasperating air of saying in the cause of virtue what was perfectly convincing and conclusive, "'I will tell you what to say to Joseph. Here is squires of the boar present, known and respected in this town, and here is William, 
which his father's name was Potkins, if I do not deceive myself. You do not, sir, said William. In their presence, pursued Pumblechook, I will tell you, young man, what to say to Joseph. Says you, Joseph, I have this day seen my earliest benefactor, and the founder of my fortune. I will name no names, Joseph, but so they are pleased to call him uptown, and I have seen that man. I swear I don't see him here, said I. Say that likewise, retorted Pumblechook. Say you said that, and even Joseph will probably betray surprise. There you quite mistake him, said I. I know better. Says you, Pumblechook went on, Joseph, I have seen that man, and that man bears you no malice, and bears me no malice. He knows your character, Joseph, and is well acquainted with your pig-headedness and ignorance, and he knows my character, Joseph, and he knows my want of gratitude. "'Yes, Joseph,' says you, here Pumblechook shook his head and hand at me, "'he knows my total deficiency of common human gratitude. "'He knows it, Joseph, as none can. "'You do not know it, Joseph, having no call to know it, but that man do.' "'Windy donkey as he was, it really amazed me that he could have the face to talk thus to mine says you, Joseph, he gave me a little message, which I will now repeat. It was that, in my being brought low, he saw the finger of providence. He knowed that finger when he saw Joseph, and he saw it plain. It pointed out this writing, Joseph, reward of ingratitude to his earliest benefactor and founder of fortune. But that man said he did not repent of what he had done, Joseph. Not at all. It was right to do it. It was kind to do it. It was benevolent to do it. And he would do it again. It's a pity, said I scornfully, as I finished my interrupted breakfast, that the man did not say what he had done and would do again. Squires of the Boar! Pumblechook was now addressing the landlord. "'And, William, I have no objections to your mentioning, either uptown or downtown, if such should be your wishes, that it was right to do it, kind to do it, benevolent to do it, and that I would do it again.' With these words the impostor shook them both by the hand, with an air— and left the house, leaving me much more astonished than delighted by the virtues of that same indefinite it. I was not long after him in leaving the house, too, and when I went down the high street I saw him holding forth, no doubt to the same effect, at his shop-door to a select group, who honoured me with very unfavourable glances as I passed on the opposite side of the way but it was only the pleasanter to turn to Biddy and to Joe, whose great forbearance shone more brightly than before, if that could be, contrasted with this brazen pretender. I went towards them slowly, for my limbs were weak, but with a sense of increasing relief as I drew nearer to them, and a sense of leaving arrogance and untruthfulness further and further behind. The June weather was delicious. The sky was blue. The larks were soaring high over the green corn. I thought all that countryside more beautiful and peaceful by far than I had ever known it to be yet. Many pleasant pictures of the life that I would lead there, and the change for the better that would come over my character when I had a guiding spirit at my side, whose simple faith and clear home wisdom I had proved, beguiled my way. They awakened a tender emotion in me, for my heart was softened by my return, and such a change had come to pass 
that I felt like one who was toiling home barefoot from distant travel, and whose wanderings had lasted many years. The schoolhouse where Biddy was mistress I had never seen, but the little roundabout lane by which I entered the village, for quietness's sake, took me past it. I was disappointed to find that the day was a holiday. No children were there, and Biddy's house was closed. Some hopeful notion of seeing her, busily engaged in her daily duties, before she saw me, had been in my mind and was defeated. But the forge was a very short distance off, and I went towards it under the sweet green limes, listening for the clink of Joe's hammer. Long after I ought to have heard it, and long after I had fancied I'd heard it, and found it but a fancy, all was still. The limes were there, and the white thorns were there, and the chestnut trees were there, and their leaves rustled harmoniously when I stopped to listen. But the clink of Joe's hammer was not in the midsummer wind. Almost fearing, without knowing why, to come in view of the forge, I saw it at last, and saw that it was closed. No gleam of fire, no glittering shower of sparks, no roar of bellows, all shut up and still. But the house was not deserted, and the best parlour seemed to be in use, for there were white curtains fluttering in its window, and the window was open and gay with flowers. I went softly towards it, meaning to peep over the flowers, when Joe and Biddy stood before me, arm in arm. At first Biddy gave a cry, as if she thought it was my apparition, but in another moment she was in my embrace. I wept to see her, and she wept to see me. I, because she looked so fresh and pleasant, she, because I looked so worn and white. "'But, dear Biddy, how smart you are!' "'Yes, dear Pip.' "'And, Joe, how smart you are!' "'Yes, dear old Pip, old chap.' I looked at both of them, from one to the other, and then— "'It's my wedding day!' cried Biddy, in a burst of happiness. "'And I am married to Joe!' They had taken me into the kitchen, and I had laid my head down on the old deal table. Biddy held one of my hands to her lips, and Joe's restoring touch was on my shoulder. "'Which you weren't strong enough, my dear, for to be surprised,' said Joe. And Biddy said, "'I ought to have thought of it, dear Joe, but I was too happy.' They were both so overjoyed to see me, so proud to see me, so touched by my coming to them, so delighted that I should have come by accident to make their day complete. My first thought was one of great thankfulness that I have never breathed this last baffled hope to Joe. How often, while he was with me in my illness, had it risen to my lips! How irrevocable would have been his knowledge of it, if he had remained with me but another hour! "'Dear Biddy,' said I, you have the best husband in the whole world, and if you could have seen him by my bed, you would have— But no, you couldn't love him better than you do. No, I couldn't indeed, said Biddy. And, dear Joe, you have the best wife in the whole world, and she will make you as happy as even you deserve to be, you dear, good, noble Joe. Joe looked at me with a quivering lip, and fairly put his sleeve before his eyes. "'And Joe and Biddy both, as you have been to church to-day, and are in charity and love with all mankind, receive my humble thanks for all you have done for me, and all I have so ill repaid. And when I say that I am going away within the hour, for I am soon going abroad, and that I shall never rest until I have worked for the money— with which you have kept me out of prison, and have sent it to you, don't think, dear Joe and Biddy, that if I could repay it a thousand times over, I suppose I could cancel a farthing of the debt I owe you, or that I would do so if I could. They were both melted by these words, and both entreated me to say no more. But I must say more. Dear Joe, I hope you will have children to love, 
and that some little fellow will sit in this chimney-corner of a winter night, who may remind you of another little fellow, gone out of it forever. Don't tell him, Joe, that I was thankless. Don't tell him, Biddy, that I was ungenerous and unjust. Only tell him that I honoured you both, because you were both so good and true, and that, as your child, I said it would be natural to him to grow up a much better man than I did. I ain't a-goin', said Joe, from behind his sleeve, to tell him nothink of that nature, Pip. Nor Biddy ain't, nor yet no one ain't. And now, though I know you have already done it in your own kind hearts, pray tell me, both, that you forgive me. Pray let me hear you say the words, that I may carry the sound of them away with me, and that I shall be able to believe that you can trust me and think better of me in the time to come. Oh, dear old Pip, old chap, said Joe, God knows as I forgive you, if I have anything to forgive. Amen, and God knows I do, echoed Biddy. Now let me go up and look at my old little room, and rest there a few minutes by myself, and then when I have eaten and drunk with you, Go with me as far as the finger-post, dear Joe and Biddy, before we say good-bye. I sold all I had, and put aside as much as I could, for a composition with my creditors, who gave me ample time to pay them in full, and I went out and joined Herbert. Within a month I had quitted England, and within two months I was clerk to Clariker and Company and within four months I assumed my first undivided responsibility. For the beam across the parlour ceiling at Mill Pond Bank had then ceased to tremble under old Bill Barley's growls and was at peace, and Herbert had gone away to marry Clara, and I was left in sole charge of the eastern branch until he brought her back. Many a year went round before I was a partner in the house, but I lived happily with Herbert and his wife, and lived frugally, and paid my debts, and maintained a constant correspondence with Biddy and Joe. It was not until I became third in the firm that Clariker betrayed me to Herbert, but he then declared that the secret of Herbert's partnership had been long enough upon his conscience, and he must tell it. So he told it, and Herbert was as much moved as amazed and the dear fellow and I were not the worst friends for the long concealment. I must not leave it to be supposed that we were ever a great house, or that we made mints of money. We were not in a grand way of business, but we had a good name, and worked for our profits, and did very well. We owed so much to Herbert's ever-cheerful industry and readiness, that I often wondered how I had conceived that old idea of his inaptitude, until I was one day enlightened by the reflection that perhaps the inaptitude had never been in him at all, but had been in me. End of chapter Chapter 59 of Great Expectations This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens Chapter 59 The Final Chapter For eleven years I have not seen Joe nor Biddy with my bodily eyes, though they had both been often before my fancy in the east, when, upon an evening in December, an hour or two after dark, I laid my hand softly on the latch of the old kitchen door. I touched it so softly that I was not heard, and looked in unseen. There, smoking his pipe in the old place by the kitchen firelight, as hale and as strong as ever, though a little grey, sat Joe, and there, fenced into the corner with Joe's leg, and sitting on my own little stool looking at the fire, was 
I again. "'We give him the name of Pip for your sake, dear old chap,' said Joe, delighted, when I took another stool by the child's side, but I did not rumple his hair. "'And we hoped he might grow a little bit like you, and we think he do.' I thought so, too, and I took him out for a walk next morning, and we talked immensely, understanding one another to perfection. And I took him down to the churchyard, and set him on a certain tombstone there, and he showed me from that elevation which stone was sacred to the memory of Philip Pirrup, late of this parish, and also Georgiana, wife of the above. Biddy, said I, when I talked with her after dinner, as her little girl lay sleeping in her lap, you must give Pip to me one of these days, or lend him at all events. No, no, said Biddy gently. You must marry. So Herbert and Clara say, but I don't think I shall, Biddy. I have so settled down in their home that it's not at all likely. I'm already quite an old bachelor. Biddy looked down at her child and put its little hand to her lips, and then put the good matronly hand with which she had touched it into mine. There was something in the action, and in the light pressure of Biddy's wedding ring, that had a very pretty eloquence in it. "'Dear Pip,' said Biddy, "'you are sure you don't fret for her?' "'Oh, no, I think not, Biddy.' "'Tell me, as an old, old friend, have you quite forgotten her?' "'My dear Biddy, I have forgotten nothing in my life that ever had a foremost place there, and little that ever had any place there. But that poor dream, as I once used to call it, has all gone by, Biddy, all gone by. Nevertheless, I knew, while I said those words, that I secretly intended to revisit the site of the old house that evening, alone, for her sake. Yes, even so, for... Estella's sake. I had heard of her as leading a most unhappy life, and as being separated from her husband, who had used her with great cruelty, and who had become quite renowned as a compound of pride, avarice, brutality, and meanness. And I had heard of the death of her husband, from an accident consequent on his ill-treatment of a horse. This release had befallen her some two years before, for anything I knew, she was married again. The early dinner hour at Joe's left me in abundance of time, without hurrying my talk with Biddy, to walk over to the old spot before dark. But, what with loitering on the way to look at old objects, and to think of old times, the day had quite declined when I came to the place. There was no house now, no brewery, no building whatever left, but the wall of the old garden. The cleared space had been enclosed with a rough fence, and looking over it, I saw that some of the old ivy had struck root anew, and was growing green on low, quiet mounds of ruin. A gate in the fence, standing ajar, I pushed it open and went in. A cold silvery mist had veiled the afternoon, and the moon was not yet up to scatter it. But the stars were shining beyond the mist, and the moon was coming and the evening was not dark. I could trace out where every part of the old house had been, and where the brewery had been, and where the gates, and where the casks. I had done so, and was looking along the desolate garden walk, when I beheld a solitary figure in it. The figure showed itself aware of me as I advanced. It had been moving towards me, but it stood still. As I drew nearer, I saw it to be the figure of a woman. As I drew nearer yet, it was about to turn away, when it stopped and let me come up with it. Then it faltered, as if much surprised, and uttered my name, and I cried out, Estella! I am greatly changed. I wonder you knew me. The freshness of her beauty was indeed gone but its indescribable majesty and its indescribable charm remained. 
those attractions in it I had seen before. What I had never seen before was the saddened, softened light of the once proud eyes. What I had never felt before was the friendly touch of the once insensible hand. We sat down on a bench that was near, and I said, "'After so many years it is strange that we should thus meet again, Estella, here where our first meeting was. Do you often come back?' I have never been here since. Nor I. The moon began to rise, and I thought of the placid look at the white ceiling, which had passed away. The moon began to rise, and I thought of the pressure on my hand when I had spoken the last words he had heard on earth. Estella was the next to break the silence that ensued between us. I have very often hoped and intended to come back, but have been prevented by many circumstances. Poor, poor old place. The silvery mist was touched with the first rays of the moonlight, and the same rays touched the tears that dropped from her eyes. Not knowing that I saw them, and setting herself to get the better of them, she said quietly, Were you wondering, as you walked along, how it came to be left in this condition? Yes, Estella. The ground belongs to me. It is the only possession I have not relinquished. Everything else has gone from me, little by little. But I have kept this. It was the subject of the only determined resistance I made in all the wretched years. Is it to be built on? At last it is. I came here to take leave of it before its change. And you, she said in a voice of touching interest to a wanderer, you live abroad still? Still. And do well, I am sure? I work pretty hard for a sufficient living, and therefore, yes, I do well. I have often thought of you, said Estella. Have you? Of late, very often. There was a long, hard time when I kept far from me the remembrance of what I had thrown away when I was quite ignorant of its worth. But since my duty has not been incompatible with the admission of that remembrance, I have given it a place in my heart. You have always held your place in my heart, I answered. And we were silent again until she spoke. I little thought, said Estella, that I should take leave of you in taking leave of this spot. I am very glad to do so. Glad to part again, Estella? To me, parting is a painful thing. To me, the remembrance of our last parting has been ever mournful and painful. But you said to me, returned Estella very earnestly, God bless you, God forgive you. And if you could say that to me then, you will not hesitate to say that to me now. Now, when suffering has been stronger than all other teaching, and has taught me to understand what your heart used to be. I have been bent and broken, but, I hope, into a better shape. Be as considerate and good to me as you were, and tell me we are friends. We are friends, said I, rising and bending over her as she rose from the bench. And we'll continue friends apart, said Estella. I took her hand in mine, and we went out of the ruined place, and as the morning mists had risen long ago when I first left the forge, so the evening mists were rising now, and in all the broad expanse of tranquil light they showed to me I saw no shadow of another parting from her. End of chapter. End of book. Thank you for listening.